my journey and we also have a galaxy of vips president of indian orthopedic association dr b shivashankar president of uh, oasis dr raghavadath president elect tamil nadu orthopedic association dr vanasegar president madras orthopedic society dr novelady shankar Pre secretary general oasis professor aninian kutti who will be joining us during the inauguration and uh, you know the entire program has been organized by our co-chairman dr clement joseph and we have uh, faculty from entire uh, tamil nadu and we have dr bupesh karthik dr billy paul wilson dr clement joseph dr kanniraj dr prajwal kanesh dr ram chidambaram dr j srinivasan dr k n subramanian dr s r sundar rajan dr yugal varandani who are all expert in uh, arthroscopic surgery they will be sharing their uh, views during this uh, program and uh, i am glad to inform you all that this uh, cme has been recognized by tamil nadu medical council and we have got uh, one credit tower thanks to the president of tamil nadu medical council who sanctioned this uh, points i also thank tnoa for uh, uh, making this happen and you know this program is uh, being done under the conducted under the auspices of uh, subrahim parimala educational trust tamil nadu orthopedic association indian orthopedic association oasis as well as madras orthopedic society i welcome every one of you for this program and i request uh, the organizing secretary dr siddharth ramesh babu to introduce the course to the delegates thank you good morning one and all i am dr siddharth ramesh babu consultant orthopedic surgeon at spot hospital so i welcome everyone to our 17th cme on orthoscopic surgery clinical and surgical correlation diagnosis must be centered on proper history and physical examination but these days there seems to be a higher reliance on higher investigations like mri and ct especially by young orthopedic surgeons like myself which sometimes can exaggerate the findings and can lead to unwarranted procedures with this in mind today cme is being conducted common ortho arthroscopic procedures of the knee shoulder elbow and foot and ankle with the relevant examination and findings and their importance in decision making in management will be discussed by our renowned faculty members we also have as mentioned by dr ramesh babu we have the third late dr d subrahman oration which will be given by dr david rajan who will be giving a talk on meniscal repair my journey i am sure we are all in for an academic feast without any further ado i would like to hand over the floor to dr clement joseph uh, and dr j srinivasan to chair the first session thank you all thanks siddharth and uh, thank you sir for your uh, uh, efforts in organizing this cme and dr ramesh babu sir is my teacher and my mentor and has been a guide in every step of my career and uh, his energy is an inspiration for us so thank you very much sir with this uh, dr shini was in uh, you're there shini shini was in is there but he is uh, mike is okay so uh, with this i think we will go to the academic session and i invite our first speaker dr prajwal ganesh swaminathan to deliver his talk on the relevance of clinical examination in arthroscopic practice over to you dr prajwal thank, thank you sir i am uh, very blessed to be a part of this uh, academic feast uh, with no delay i'll go to my topic prajwal just a minute please we want to introduce to the audience we want to tell about your uh, credentials so it is my privilege to uh, introduce dr prajwal ganesh uh, he is a consultant arthroscopic surgeon at rajam nursing home Thir uh, tirunamalai he has finished his arthroscopy and sports medicine fellowship in the uk and uh, in madurai under dr k n subramaniam sir he has also done a fellowship in shoulder and upper limb surgery uh, under dr pratap kumar sir he was also the ms orthopedic gold medalist at uh, sri manakula vinayagar medical college and hospital over to you dr prajwal thank you for 
Thank you, Dr. Siddharth. Uh, Uh, my topic is the relevance of uh, clinical examination and all us, all of us surgeons, young surgeons, mainly we should rely more on our examination part. We should have the eyes of a hawk and the sense of a zen. As soon as the patient enters our consultation, uh, we should notice his gait and then go into the further examination part. So uh, let us talk about some of the... Uh, physical examinations related to knee. Uh, let us start with uh, valgus stress test that is for the MCL. This is done in knee full extension. One hand as a fulcrum at the lateral aspect of the knee, the other at the ankle and abduction force is applied on the joint. If it is normal in uh, a full extension, then we have to repeat it in 20 to 30 degrees of flexion. Varus stress test for the LCL. Similarly, an adduction force is applied to open out the joint According to Marshall et al., the test is positive only in flexion. That means the LCL is torn. The test is positive in extension, then LCL cruciates and the popliteus is torn. McMurray's, uh, the knee is actively flexed, palp pal palpate the posteromedial margin of the knee and external rotate and extend. The click is heard, that means the medial meniscus is torn. Palpate the posterolateral margin, internal rotate and extend, then the click implies the lateral meniscus tear. McMurray is negative, does not rule out any meniscal injury. Latchman's is one of, is a gold standard for ACL. It's done in uh, 15 to 20 degrees of knee flexion. More than uh, 30 degrees of anterior trans translation comparative to the other knee, positive, or more than 10 mm total displacement with a soft endpoint uh, ACL tear is um, confirmed. Anterior drawers, it is done uh, with the patient in supine and uh, hip in 45 degrees of uh, flexion, knee in 90 degrees of flexion, examiner holding the, uh, stabilizing the foot and uh, thumbs on the tibial tubercle, check the ha hamstrings should be relaxed and a soft jerk is applied. A soft endpoint with a displacement of 6 to 8 mm anteriorly implies ACL tear. False positive test will apply will be there when there is a PCL tear and uh, when the sac sign is positive. Pivot shift test, it is uh, usually very painful. So we uh, do it in anesthesia. The patient is supine and relaxed, hip in 30 degrees of abduction, knee in internal rotation and valgus stress is applied. The knee subluxate. And when we gradually flex the knee, the reduction of the lateral femoral condyle uh, suggests uh, ACL tear. This is specific for ACL, but because it is painful, we uh, don't do it on OPD basis. And the SAC sign is for the PCL. When the knee is in 90 degrees of flexion, uh, posterior sag of the proximal tibia implies PCL tear. Posterior drawer, similarly, knee in 90 degrees uh, with no hard endpoint, suggests a PCL tear. Petalofemoral instability, it is basically an apprehension test, uh, pressing the petala laterally with the thumb while knee is flexed induces an anxiety and the patient resists this then the test is positive dial test for the posterolateral corner injuries usually it is done in prone position and knee is examined in both 30 and 90 degrees of flexion the foot is externally rotated and the degree of external rotation is measured in respect to the femoral axis a 10 degree difference implies a positive test the positive at if the test is positive at 30 degrees, then the postlateral corner injury is suspected. If it is positive both at 30 and 90 degrees, both PCL and the postlateral complex is torn. Performing the dial test can be done in supine also in the in the op OR. Uh, this shows a positive test. And uh, post surgery, this is my chief in Madurai. The uh, post-surgery of uh, ACL, PCL, and PLC, the SAC sign is also corrected. Laplace test, uh, the grinder test is implying meniscal damage, and Laplace distraction test is for uh, ligament, uh, the lateral and uh, collateral ligament damage. Coming to the uh, investigation part, after the physical examination is done, any surgeon should do an investigation to confirm. So you, 
uh, T2 weighted uh, coronal view of the MRI shows uh, vastus medialis, the femur, the vastus lateralis, the PCL, the ACL, and the uh, medial and lateral meniscus, the tibia, the uh, medial collateral, and the lateral collateral ligaments. And uh, sagittal view shows uh, the vastus medialis, uh, the femur, the medial meniscus anterior horn, the posterior horn of the medial meniscus, the tibia, the uh, gastrocnemius, and the semitendinosis and uh, semimembranosis. Uh, another uh, cut showing the ACL and the PCL, the petalar tendon and the quadriceps tendon. Literature supporting the uh, supporting aspects of uh, clinical examination. This is a literature from uh, Brazil where uh, the study has uh, been conducted on 72 knees and physical examination is more conclusive for ACL and uh, then comes the specificity and accuracy for ACL during physical examination is more and MRI imaging is more conclusive for lateral meniscus and medial meniscus. In uh, 2009, Ryan et al. Uh, also came with the conclusion that uh, physical examination performed carefully could provide the same or even better results in diagnosing meniscal and ligamentous injury. In 2012, Ershin et al. also suggested that uh, the experience of the surgeon and the experience of the person who reports the MRI makes a huge difference in confirming the diagnosis. Combined, uh, combining both physical examination and imaging is capable of diminishing the negative orthoscopic procedures by 5% as demonstrated by Monk et al. This is another uh, paper from Iran. This also suggests the same um, that meniscal injuries uh, or the ligamentous injuries, the interpretation depends on the personnel involved in MRI reporting and uh, arthroscopy, I mean, and uh, physical examination. This is another uh, paper by Indians uh, in UK. They have also suggested that uh, the sensitivity and uh, specificity for ACL in physical examination is better than uh, meniscus. But uh, when, when coming to meniscus, uh, the MRI has a better diagnostic value. Not always normal MRIs in arthritic knee does, uh, they doesn't deny arthroscopy. MRI supplementation is highly individualized. Performing rigorous physical examination in, by an examined examiner, an experienced examiner has a diagnostic power equal to that of an MRI or even better. Uh, all all uh, junior uh, beginners should follow step-by-step -step procedure. We should start from the suprapatellar pouch um, uh, where we will find uh, loose bodies and fly cae, then go to the medial or the lateral gutter, whichever is convenient for the uh, uh, beginner. Usually, most of us do the medial gutter first to find any loose bodies, femoral ostifides, tibial ostifides, uh, any damage in the chondral surface of femur and tibia. Then go to the medial department where uh, the meniscus is examined, then the intercondylar notch, then do a figure of four pattern for the uh, lateral meniscus. Most commonly, the complex part for a beginner is the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus, which cannot be identified. Uh, and uh, the popularity is tender. That is also difficult to visualize for the beginners. Uh, the anteromedial portal is the main portal for uh, instrumentation, and the counterpart, it is the counterpart of the anterolateral portal. Uh, we should always use a blunt trocar to avoid any cartilage or ACL injury and always aim towards the intercondylar notch. The hook is the extension of the surgeon's hand, and it is more important uh, to know the triangulation skill in this. And, uh, as it has a high a steep learning curve, it is better to learn the triangulation than uh, then do a procedure on the human. Uh, better to go for cadaveric courses and then uh, practice on uh, or start practicing on uh, people. Most common complications by beginner are hydrogenic cartilage damage, uh, which will lead to over or under diagnosis, hematrosis, injury to the meniscus, most commonly, when the portal is placed too low uh, for the anterolateral portal, the, directly the scope will go into the meniscus and uh, it will cause a uh, disturbed division. Yeah, neurovascular injury is more common on the posterior medial and posterior lateral uh, portals. 
trouble trouble in uh, portal placement too high portal is difficult to visualize the posterior horn of medial meniscus too low portal is difficult to may injure the meniscus and may cause a face stuck view and appropriate portal and portal placement also varies uh, some surgeons use uh, vertical incision some surgeons use horizontal incision vertical incision has an advantage in this this part where uh, you the portal height can be changed uh, always learn the triangulation and the beginner should always take time to clear the fat, fat pad that is the most co most uh, common mistake they do they struggle with the vision take few minutes as taught by my uh, orthoscopic gurus take time to clear the fat pad now coming to uh, i would like to talk in tamil for this part so uh, arthroscopy in peripheries as now uh, most more uh, arthroscopic surgeons are uh, budding arthroscopic surgeons are practicing in the peripheries there is a big nightmare because all the armamentarium will not be available always we have to check our instruments or uh, drills or sleeves not pushers everything before surgery so there are uh, times when uh, we place an anchor for the bank cards and finally find there is no not pusher because uh, the company person who we take loaner instruments from the companies and they forget it uh, it becomes a nightmare so and uh, many times the uh, scopy practice at periphery is funny there are patients who come and ask sir jabbu ku la operation pandringla naatu kattu potta seri aayirum jabbu ku operation pandrathu na kelvi pottade illa adin appo yaro refer panna matanga nena nee vandu trauma um pannitirupa unakku hospital irukum scopy pannina enak trauma amichiru na pannikiren nee ella scopy unakku anupra adinra appo It, but still it is a service and achievement for the uh, periphery we, uh, we do it at a lower cost uh, and i would uh, thank the whole uh, faculty team and i would like to uh, um, introduce our uh, scopy center dr subrayan center for arthroscopy and laparoscopy which has been established in 2019 at thiruvannamalai we are practicing all keyhole surgeries at this center um these are some of my uh, uh this is a one year post op multi ligament knee done at uh, rajam nursing home he is uh, comfortable with his knee global knee actually i would like to thank my arthroscopy gurus dr k n subramaniam sir and dr prakash sir for uh, pratap sir for uh, giving me this wonderful opportunity in life uh, and for helping me and guiding me in all my uh, cases most of the time whenever i find a trouble i would call uh, dr k n subramaniam sir or pratap sir even though it is midnight or 12 o'clock morning 4 o'clock they are very helpful they attend the phone call and give me uh, tips on how to deal with it i would like to thank dr angus robertson for giving me an opportunity to do the fellowship him at uh, cardiff university and thank you thanks sir dr prajwal and uh, you rightly emphasize the role of clinical examination and also you highlighted the, the struggles of being an arthroscopic surgeon in periphery we all all done that i have done surgeries in periphery at night 12 o'clock but uh, as you rightly said you has to be prepared or not only in clinical diagnosis as well as in the implant uh, management instrument management so it is a 360 degree awareness one should have you should know what your resident is doing what instruments are there and also what is the diagnosis and any questions uh, or any points from the faculty panel like to ask dr prajwal the delegates also can put their question in the chat box and we will find out and uh, put it forward so as of now no questions in the ortho tv link Dr. Prajwal, you have mentioned that uh, uh, you do it at a very economical uh, cost. Accident policy owner. For ACL re reconstruction, uh, what is the price or uh, uh, amount they have to shell out? It will be around forty uh, thousand plus implant. Totally, that it includes the medicines also. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's really great. I appreciate you. Here in Chennai, it costs uh, three times more. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, uh, basic. 
part of it uh, goes to the anesthetists basically they are uh, like uh, we can't uh, say that uh, budget patient nothing like that we have to give them so uh, for uh, shoulder arthroscopy the anesthetists charge around uh, 78000 7 to 8 <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, uh, Dr. Raghavadat, President uh, Oasis. Welcome, sir. Welcome our other faculty members, Sundar Rajan, and our past president of MOS, Dr. Ravi Kumar, and other uh, senior members. I think uh, Dr. Pandian is there from Kadalur, Dr. Bala from uh, Coimbatore. Good Welcome morning, Dr. Ramesh. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Clement, we can Good move on. Good morning. Yes, sir. Good morning. No more questions. Uh, Dr. Dr. Prajwal kindly accept our virtual felicitations. And uh, Dr. Ramesh Babu has been kind enough to send us all memento. Uh, has been so sincere and dedicated. Thank you, sir. And uh, let's move on to the next uh, talk, which is fr from me. Uh, can you stop screening your screen, uh, Prajwal? Before Clement starts, can we have a look at uh, Prajwal's memento? Can you ask your Samira to honor you? We can't see Samira's face. I think Dr. Sendil Nagan is there. Yes, yes. His father. Thank you. Prajwal, thank you for the, by Nebu also. Thank you. Thank you, Sandil Nathan. Thank you, Prajwal. Thank you. Thank I you. Now I request uh, Dr. Siddharth to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Clement Joseph. Uh, so, Dr. Clement Joseph is the organizing chairman of uh, today's. Uh, uh, CME program. The uh, depth, uh, the uh, program was uh, 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 conceptualized by him. So uh, he is the head of the department of arthroscopy and sports medicine at Sims Hospital uh, Chennai. Without any further ado, sir, I hand over the floor to you. Uh, thanks, Siddharth. And uh, I have taken up this topic because of uh, this has been of uh, very in great interest to me. And nowhere in the knee surgery or anywhere else in uh, the uh, orthopedics, clinically important space, such an important role as in patellofemoral joint pathology. It has been called as a black hole of orthopedics because uh, the diagnosis is difficult, the rehabilitation is difficult, as well as uh, the treatment can be unpredictable. So you have to be very, very good in your clinical acumen to deal with these problems. And surprisingly, the amount of knee pain and in stability produced by patella and when compared to the amount it is diagnosed and treated is very minuscule. I think we are being in the center of the knee, always staring in front of you. We are forgetting to examine the patellofemoral joint in a proper methodical way. So many times I've seen the patients coming referred to me for tears in medial meniscus or uh, uh, Baker's cyst or some MRI findings. But when you examine clinically, the main pain would have come from patellofemoral joint. Sometimes I just do a taping They'll come in wheelchair with a simple offloading petal taping. They become all right and they're able to walk. So this is why I tell, you know, the petal of joint is easily accessible to us. Only thing you have to have a mentality and awareness to examine this joint in our clinical. To, in this talk, I will summarize uh, my approach to the petal femoral problems and two broad spheres we'll cover. One is petal femoral pain and then petal femoral instability. And I will also highlight uh, for the interest of surgeons, what are the surgical procedures we can do in these kind of scenarios and what are the indications? So these are the two main groups of patellofemoral pathology. And let's focus on patellofemoral pain. And from the causative point of view, there are two major causes for patellofemoral pain. One is traumatic. It could be an acute injury, an overload type of injury where the patient goes for exercise program, running, jogging, skipping, he comes with a severe pain, usually a few days after the exertion. And typically, overuse injury, people who have been climbing up and down the stairs or uh, gymming, running, they present with an overuse kind of a petrofemoral pain. The second group is a structural lesion or an anatomical variation in the 
petals metal joint producing pain either because of increased pressure in the petals metal joint either because of uh, increased lateral tracking or instability and there is a third group where you cannot demonstrate instability there are cases of subtle petals metal instability where you can see increased mediolateral laxity increased translation subluxatable petal they can also present as petals metal pain syndrome the typical features of petal of metal pain is a dull aching pain which gets aggravated on squatting and climbing stairs and people usually cannot sit with their knees folded for a long period of time and they can also have symptoms like catching repeated effusions and instability due to pain mediated quadriceps inhibitions so they feel like buckling down in certain instances this is not a typical acl injury it is a petal of metal pain mediated quadriceps inhibition so coming to the assessment of pain most of the petal of metal pain comes from the lateral aspect of the petal we call it as a lateral sided petal of metal pain the typical features would be pain on lateral facet compression a patellar tilt can be observable patients can also demonstrate lateral tracking of the patella if you see the q angle it may be increased they can also demonstrate crepitus coming from the lateral patellofemoral joint when i when you do a patellar taping to shift the patella medially it typically relieves the pain so this is a very important thing that every surgeon should learn this taping i will be showing a video which you can do it in your clinical practice i always keep the patellar taping under my clinical examination table the moment i find the symptoms I immediately observe the, apply the taping as the patient go up and down the stairs they report immediate improvement in this broad category of lateral sided petal of femoral pain and coming to the medial side one of the main reasons where you can have pain apart from medial joint line is uh, medial plica syndrome and one should also not forget to palpate the inferior and superior poles of patella where you can have features of quadriceps tendinitis and infra patellar tendinitis lateral sided petal pain is usually called as excessive lateral pressure syndrome it can also present in elderly as a lateral sided petal of femoral osteoarthritis and one more condition which we often miss is a uh, inflammation of the peripetellar soft tissue called as peripetellar synovitis so what are the features you find in lateral uh, maltracking the lateral maltracking of Or lateral hyperpressure can be produced by a tight lateral structures like IT band lateral retinaculum or a lateralized tibial tubercle or a genu valgum. The tight muscles like hamstrings and quadriceps can increase the petal of metal contact pressure, and weak medial structures like weak abductors, gluteus maximus especially, and weak hip flexor rotators can produce what is known as a dynamic internal rotation of the femur. Here, the petal lies central because of weak musculature. Femur tends to rotate internally and then starts rubbing the lateral facet of the petal. So it's very essential that you should observe for this weakness and the tightness patterns of the muscle. Address them before you advise surgery in these patients. So this is how you do a petal taping. Normally, we take a 10 centimeter length of a rigid tape like Fixomel or Mifix, which is available for from the BSN company. The first third of the tape is stuck to the lateral aspect of the petal, starting from the lateral part of the petal, and then the petal is pushed medially. here and then the middle third of the tape is stuck to the medial aspect of the thigh and the final third of the tape is stuck around the thigh without any tension a second strip of the tape is uh, similarly applied so this particular procedure relieves the load on the lateral facet of the pressure it gives immediate improvement in pain people who are not able to sit in the chair and get up who are not able to squat will be immediately able to so they will report at least 40 to 50% of pain improvement which comes con confirms your diagnosis of lateral pressure syndrome so this is a important clinical test to uh, not only to diagnose your lateral pressure syndrome it is also important test to, to treat it because once you relieve the pain the pain improves the quadriceps function starts uh, functioning better and they have very good uh, pain people who are resistant to this taping who have typical lateral tilt and lateral retinocular tightness you can do an arthroscopic lateral release so this is a knee you can see the proximal portion left side you are using a radio frequency probe to uh, release the retinaculum lateral retinaculum so it has to be released very carefully up to the level of subcutaneous fat as you can see here and it starts from the superior pole of the patella and goes all the way down to your anterolateral portal as seen here so this is a useful arthroscopic technique in select cases with lateral hyperpressure syndrome in many patients especially elderly i tend to lengthen the lateral retinaculum retinaculum this procedure is uh, my opinion slightly better than arthroscopic release because it reestablishes a balance only thing is you have to do it meticulously you have to coronal plane you have to divide the retinaculum into two layers 
and uh, flex the knee to 80 to 90 degree and then suture. Here you can see the red retinoculum. We are separating the superior oblique layer from the deep transverse uh, layers. So this, this uh, deletion, delineation of the plane has to be done carefully. So once you develop the superior layer, the superior layer is reflected off the deep layer laterally. And to a length of uh, two centimeters from the lateral border of the patella, the deep layer is divided. And the joint orthotomy can be done to remove the inflamed synovium. You can also trim the osteophytes using this orthotomy. Then you can see the knee is flexed 80 to 90 degree. And then you can see how much of lengthening we achieved in the lateral retinaculum, the tone, the divided edges are so here now you can see the patella tilt has been corrected and a good medial lateral mobility has been established. In elderly patients can often present with this type of uh, picture in a skyline view. This is called a overhanging lateral facet. They have terrible pain. You can also see there is a significant amount of tilt here indicating lateral retinacular tightness. In addition to the lateral retinacular uh, lengthening here, we can also uh, release the uh, you can also uh, remove a lateral 10 centimeter of uh, the lateral facet here. As you can see here, the lateral uh, overhanging edge of the patella is exposed. And using a saw, we are removing 10 centimeter of the lateral facet of the patella. So this relieves the rubbing and the lateral retinacular lengthening improves the tracking of the patella. This has been a very useful of surgery. I've done in many patients, elderly patients, as an isolated procedure with very good improvement in pain. And next, we go for the patella cartilage lesions. So before you treat them, we have to see whether the lesion is produced by some other anatomical abnormality or is a primary traumatic injury. Here you can see uh, in this MRI, there is a full thickness cartilage defect here. And these are the arthroscopic images. Normally, you'll find a fluffy tissue here, which has to be liberated to expose the defect. The base of the defect has to be prepared by using burr and shavers, and the margins are stabilized by a radio frequency probe. And this is the resultant defect you are getting. Now, the saline is drawn out of the joint, and the joint is distended with air arthroscopy. Then here, we are doing a cartilage repair using a bone marrow aspirate concentrate mixed with fibrin thrombin glue here. So it is injected in such a way the clot forms immediately, it comes here, and it is done against the gravity using this particular technique. So this has been uh, very helpful in many of our patients. Next, we come to the uh, category of patella instability. What you should know is, uh, in all cases, the medial petal of middle ligament is torn. So it is called essential lesion. It has to be done in all patients. And then we have to look for trochlear dysplasia and tibial tuberosity transfer and petal alta. So this is a J sign. This is very important. You should examine for this uh, sign. Ask the patient to sit down and extend the knee. On the left knee, you can see the patella is going outwards as the knee is coming near extension. So this particular sign indicates the MPFL is deficient in these patients. And the next sign you should look for is an apprehension test in which the knee is flexed to 30 degree and the examiner forces the petal out. You are asked to look for this reflex quartus of inhibition. So it is, uh, one should not look for pain because pain can be present in lateral pressure syndrome. You have to typically look for the contraction of the cordyceps producing guarding. And this particular test has to be tested in multiple angles. So normally in 30 degree, the petala engages the trochlear groove. In cases where the length of the petala tendon is more, the engagement takes a bit later. And also in cases where the trochlear groove, groove is shallow, even in 40, 50 degree deep flexion angles, you can exhibit uh, apprehension and instability. So this mid flexion instability is a very important clinical finding when you're dealing with uh, petal dislocation cases. So in, when you see this one, this patient usually need a secondary procedure in addition to MP4 reconstruction here. And this is a short video of um, animation of my MPFL. So I do an implantless technique on the femur. We make two uh, patella tunnels, a short tunnel of 10 millimeter length, uh, which is a blind tunnel. And these tunnels are uh, connected to the anterior surface using two 2.4 mm drill bits. And then we identify the uh, MPFL femoral attachment point here, which is uh, exactly between the adductor tubercle and the uh, medial epicondyle. An oblique uh, trajectory is used and a uh, six millimeter drill bit is used to drill up to a depth of four to five centimeter here. And the graft will be passed in the socket and fixed with bioscrew here. So this is how uh, MPFL works. The two ends of the semi-T or hand restless grafts are docked into the blind tunnels and the switches are retrieved anteriorly and tied above the patella anterior surface. 
and then the graft ends are passed into the femoral uh, tunnel and fixed with bio screw. Here we have a short video here. So normally I take a grass list if it is of a reasonable diameter and 18 centimeter graft is made. And this is an incision on the medial border of petala between second and third layer, just below the retinaculum. You can see two guideways are inserted into the medial aspect of petala. They are overringed with 4.5 mm remus for a depth of 10 millimeter. And then from the anterior uh, surface of the petala, 2.4 mm guideways are used to connect the drills. Now you can see a suture is being passed from the anterior holes to the tunnel. These sutures will be used to take the graft inside these docking tunnels. So now you develop a plane under the retinaculum, which goes all the way to the femoral insertion point around the medial epicondyle. The medial epicondyle is placed and incision is made. Digitally, you palpate the sulcus between the adductor tubercle and the medial epicondyle. Then you pass your guide wire, which is reamed with the 6 mm reamer. Now you can see the ends of the grafts are passed into the femoral docking tunnels. And the sutures are brought out of the anterior surface and fixed on the anterior surface of the petala without any need for any implant. Now the loop end is taken out through the soft tissue plane. A guide wire is passed for screw insertion later. And the graft is being pulled inside the femoral tunnel. Now the knee is flexed around 30 degree and uh, the graft is tensioned. It's very important, unlike ACL, you should not over tighten the graft. After you fix the graft uh, temporarily with the uh, artery forceps, you should have eight to nine millimeter of medial lateral mobility in full extension. So the graft should not be very tight. After you pass the graft, the medial retinaculum is prepared along with the graft to the medial aspect of the petala. And this is another example of a patient who exhibited uh, instability uh, in mid flexion, you can see this is a view from the superior lateral portal. You can see that petala is not at all engaging the trochlea, it is uh, articulating only on the lateral facet of the uh, lateral uh, femoral condyle. So, this patient uh, kind of patients may need uh, corrective procedures like a tibial tubercle osteotomy, uh, as is being done here. So, this uh, osteotomy will uh, shift the tibial tuberosity medially and anteriorly to re-establish the normal tracking position. This is a, how much of function you can get after a tibial tuberosity osteotomy. And uh, in cases where you have a, a shallow trochlea, a trochleoplasty procedure will be helpful. Here, we once again lengthen the lateral retinaculum as uh, described before. Now, the cartilage bone margin is um, marked and uh, the shallow trochlea and the intended new trochlear line is marked. So this is a device which used for uh, trochleoplasty. The, the chondral flap of five millimeter depth is raised. The entire articular surface along with five millimeter of bone is elevated of the femur. And the central portion of the uh, flap is thin with a th three millimeter bar so that we can fold it and make a new groove. So this is a formation of the new groove. Once we flatten the lateral condyle and create a new groove, the new groove is fixed with uh, three suture angles, one at the top of the intercondylar notch using three vehicle tapes. And uh, the other end of vehicle tapes are fixed on top here like this. And sutures from both the suture angles are once again loaded and fixed laterally. So this is a new groove. You can see the mid flexion instability is already tackled. Now the knee is flexed at uh, 80 degree. The retinaculum is closed. And then subsequent MPFL reconstruction is uh, done with the double bracelet graft. So to conclude, so there are a lot of options for a petalofemoral interventions, but the sad part is most of the time the diagnosis are still missed. Clinical correlation is most relevant as radiology in this lesions can be misleading. Rehabilitation and in select cases, surgeries can resolve the issues. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Clement, for highlighting the various uh, problems in the petalofemoral joint. It was very practical and uh, very useful. And there are a few questions from the delegates. I request Dr. Siddharth to question on behalf of the delegates. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Mozimul Siddiqui. Uh, he asks, uh, what happens to the lateral genicular artery if you release all the three layers in lateral ret retinacular release? Uh... Normally, we will not cross the superior border of the petala when you're doing a lateral retinacular lengthening. But uh, if you think uh, you intrude the artery, you can uh, cauterize it. Nothing happens, usually. 
we have done it in few times when you release the tunic you will be able to find bleeding then you have to cauterize it yeah uh, there are no other questions from the uh, from the audience so sir uh, odivel has got question singar yeah. odivel singar odivel sir. sir yeah sir good morning sir please yeah shoot your sir. question <laughs> Clement, that was a very beautiful talk and very, very relevant and very common problem which we all face and not treated adequately. So, the about the taping, you efficiently showed how the taping is done. How long do you keep it, and uh, how often do you change it? The taping. Yes, sir. If the patient has clinical improvement, I leave it for three days, sir. Many times, surprisingly, when they come for review after three, four days, they are very much improved. because it is a vicious cycle of pain pain related quadriceps inhibition vmo weakness then uh, vlo lateral uh, hyperactivity so once you break the cycle by relieving the pain the vmo firing improves these are the electrophysiological studies so usually they become all right with two sessions of taping sir they i'll ask them to leave the taping for two to, th two to three days the second time we'll give a, uh, a break for uh, one uh, one day so that the skin irritation will come down then i reapply the taping and i teach the taping to this uh, people so that they can go and do it for themselves in mild to moderate cases it results in uh, a week or two weeks time sir thank you so is this uh, the patellar issue is this a prop in do you see patients post tkr for example so do you see a lot of patients uh, with uh, patellar side pain and uh, have you uh, done such uh, procedures and have you seen improvement in those who are unhappy after tkr yeah yes that one of the main reasons of unhappy tkr is a patellofemoral problems i am not uh, i am not getting the those patients to see me because we have a orthoplastic team that deals with them but i get a referral once where they were, they have done a patella resurfacing tick here when the patella component became loose and the patient came with terrible pain she won't be able to lift uh, i mean extend beyond 30 degree then he was stuck between 30 to 50 degree of moment at all she was wheelchair bound and uh, i assessed her with taping so with, when you do the taping and shift the patella medially she was able to extend so with uh, doubts i have taken her for surgery so we did the same thing uh, retinacular lengthening and i also did a vmo advancement over the uh, patella to re establish some medial pull and she became all right she is now going going back to work yeah true it is true Uh, patellar mal positioning and uh, especially lateral retinacular tightening can be a cause of uh, post TKR pain syndrome. When I was doing TKR, I routinely used to do a partial lateral pastectomy in most of the patients. Before TKR, I assess my uh, uh, lateral patellar femoral symptoms. If we see uh, lateral uh, overhanging patella or the patient exhibits significant lateral facet symptoms, when you prepare the patella, you can take out the lateral 10 millimeter of the uh, lateral facet. So that unloads the patella. Uh, this was what I was. Was doing when uh, sometimes I have to do totally replacements in uh, certain scenarios. I've done that. Uh, that is a helpful trick. So I think it's a very relevant question you ask. Uh, my answer would be: you look for patellofemoral problems in patients who are undergoing TKR. If you find a lateral forehang, lateral tilt, or lateral side tilt symptoms, a solution would be to add partial lateral facetectomy to your TKRs. Thank you, Dr. Clement. We Thank you, sir. We move on to the next talk. I request. madam to honor you clement momento sir momento <laughs> on our behalf yes, she's madam is there waiting for you yes sir yes sir send her yeah yeah please thank yes sir you, thank you very much sir thank you sir and this is your uh, momento sir thank you thank you clement thank you very much mrs clement for doing the honors on our behalf thank you sir thank you for having me here thank you now we are move on to the next talk i request uh, dr siddharth to introduce our next yes. faculty dr j srinivasan who has been uh, with us ever since our hospital inception over to siddharth uh 
Thank you. So uh, my, uh, I'm introducing Dr. J. Srinivasan, who he has done his uh, arthroscopy fellowship at uh, Ramachandra and at uh, Netherlands. He's currently the arthroscopy consultant uh, at uh, Srinivas uh, Priya Hospital. He's been awarded the Best Paper Award in TNOA-CON in 2008 and the Best Paper Award at Madras Orthopedic Society in 2009. He's been a faculty at, at Indian Arthroscopy uh, in Indian Arthroscopy Society and various cadaver training and courses across India. So I invite uh, Dr. J. Srinivasan to deliver his next talk on clinical decision making in MCL injuries. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Siddharth. Uh, can you hear me? Because there was a problem with my mic before. We can hear you, Srinivas. Yep. Just a moment. Good morning, one and all. I thank Dr. Ramesh Babu, Dr. Siddharth, and uh, Dr. Clement for having me here. It's been a great journey with Dr. Ramesh Babu. He was the first one to help me out, improve my career in arthroscopy. I'm very grateful for that. Thank you, sir. With this, I would like to start today's talk. It's a clinical decision making on MCL injuries. Before we go on to MCL injuries, I would like to briefly give an introduction to the anatomy on the medial side of the knee. As we all know, this is the most common knee injury in sports. These injuries are very common in males compared to females. Majority of the medial knee injuries are isolated and they involve other medial stabilizers of the knee also in addition to medial collateral ligament. And basically we need to know about three bony prominences on the medial aspect of the knee. They are adductor tubercle, the medial epicondyle and the gastrocnemius tubercle. The adductor tubercle is the most proximal landmark. The medial epicondyle is the most distal and the anterior landmark. The gastrocnemius tubercle is the most posterior prominence and it is the most prominent of the, all the three bony prominences. So, this is the, these are the bony landmarks, which with various attachments on the medial aspect. This is the medial epicondyle. The medial collateral ligament originates both superior as well as distal to the medial epicondyle rather than from the medial epicondyle. And posterior to the medial epicondyle, we have the posterior oblique ligament which is better shown here. The posterior oblique ligament is more of a thickening of the capsule. It has multiple arms out of which the central arm is very important, which is an extension from the superior border of the semimembranosus tendon towards the tubercle. And the major neurovascular structures on the medial aspect of the knee are no major artery is there. Except for the long saphenous vein, we don't have any vascular component. And the main important thing is the saphenous nerve, which exits between the sartorius and the gracilis muscle. And it gives the infrapetal branch of at the level of the sartorius and the semi uh, gracilis junction. It is a very important nerve for the cutaneous innervation of skin below the knee and the leg. And basically, in biomechanics, we need to know certain facts. The main primary stabilizer is the superficial medial collateral ligament. And the secondary stabilizers are the deep medial collateral ligament and the posterior oblique ligament. The superficial medial collateral ligament has two components. One is a proximal component, which attaches one centimeter distal to the tibial joint line and the distal component which attaches about 6 cm below the joint line on the posterior medial crest of the proximal tibia. And uh, the superficial medial collateral ligament plays an important role in valgus as well as 
external rotational stability of the knee. The posterior oblique ligament is important in all knee flexion angles for internal rotational stability. So, it is essential that we recreate the anatomy while we reconstruct the medial aspect so that we don't result in over constraint. The common mode of injury of a medial uh, knee is a valgus stress. It can be either a contact or a non-contact valgus stress. Other modes of injuries are tibial external rotational injury, a combined valgus and an external rotational injury. So basically to we go to diagnosis by physical examination. Before physical examination, a brief history of the mode of injury will help us derive which aspect of the knee we have to concentrate more on. And a localized ecchymosis with a painful swelling over the medial joint line. And special test is the valgus stress test, which is performed at zero as well as 20 to 30 degree of knee flexion. This would give an idea of whether only the superficial medial collateral ligament is torn or all the medial structures are torn. Based on the valgus test, there's a classification suggested by Fito and Marshall. The grade 1 is no valgus instability noted. Grade 2 is valgus laxity noted at 30 degrees of flexion, which indicates a superficial medial collateral ligament tear. A grade 3 valgus instability at 0 and 30 degree flexion indicates a su superficial medial collateral ligament tear as well as deep medial collateral ligament tear and a posterior oblique ligament tear. Now, other gradings are also available for MCL based on uh, openings and uh, this is one is based on the physical examination. At localized tenderness with no instability is grade 1. A grade 2 is broad tenderness in the medial aspect with partially toned medial structures and a definitive end point to the applied valgus stress. Grade 3 is there is no definitive end point at 20 degree of knee flexion. And after that, we need to confirm our diagnosis with the imaging studies. A stress radiograph is helpful in delineating whether it is a medial uh, injury or a posterolateral injury, which can also mimic a external rotation dial test. In isolated uh, medial collateral ligament tears, the opening is more than 1.7 at 0 degree and more than 3.2 at 20 degree of flexion. A complete tear of medial structure is uh, the opening is more than 6.5 millimeter at 0 degrees and more than 9.8 millimeter at 20 degree of knee flexion. When the opening is more than 26, then the medial collateral plus the anterior cruciate ligament is possibly torn. In MRI, we have to it is useful in confirming our clinical diagnosis as well as it is useful in evaluating the location of the tear, whether it is proximal, mid substance, or distal tear. As well as we can identify the accompanying lesions, like whether the, there's a tear in the medial meniscus or an anterior cruciate ligament tear. The MRI grading is grade one. The medial collateral is intact with periligamentous edema. Grade two, there's a partial tear with surrounding edema and grade 3 is a complete tear. Apart from that, the waving of uh, superficial medial collateral ligament can be shown as a wave sign in which the medial collateral appears like a wave on the tibial side. And we also need to note for any calcification on the femoral side in case of a chronic tear and we also need to note whether the uh, tibial side of the medial collateral is over or underneath the pes anserinus pressa, a stennous type of lesion. In arthroscopy, normally there is not much of space in the medial compartment. When there is a grade 3 tear, there is a sign called the drive-through sign in which the joint line opens more than one centimeter between the medial femoral condyle and the medial tibial plateau. There are various options of treating a medial collateral ligament. 
generally non surgical treatment is the suggested one in grade 1 and grade 2 tests as well as in grade 3 isolated tears without valgus malalignment the main focus of non surgical treatment is controlling the knee edema or ideas to restore the quadriceps function and improve the range of motion of knee at the earliest the hinged knee brace is selectively used for patients with meniscotibial injuries and with valgus malalignment and the aim of the treatment would be to return to sport by 8 to 12 weeks for elite athletes the surgical treatment can be uh, either a primary repair or augmentation or a reconstruction it is based on whether the tear is acute that is less than 3 weeks or whether the tear is chronic that is more than 6 weeks or whether there are any isolated bony avulsions as well as malalignment on the tibial side mcl injuries generally with entrapment of ligament they are addressed by surgical methodology the primary repair is indicated in isolated grade 3 tears with valgus malalignment and mcl entrapment over the pessensorinus persa a bony avulsion either from the femoral side or from the tibial side and it is usually performed 7 to 10 days of injury it can be either a suturing alone or it can be sutured with the help of suture anchors or it can be repaired with suture anchors staples or a screw and a washer it is always uh, ideal to reduce the amount of implants used because the femoral side avulsions can result in more of post operative stiffness compared to the tibial side the augmentation repair is uh, indicated when the quality of the native ligament impedes a primary repair there are three techniques basically it involves the semi tendinosis it is either released at the musculo tendinous attachment or the semi tendinosis is freed and looped around the anterior arm of the semi membranous tendon or it can be stitched to the intact semi membranosus and reconstruction in this uh, our idea is to reconstruct it anatomically and it is indicated when the mcl fails to heal in a neutral or a varus alignment and it's also indicated when we have a associated uh, anterior cruciate ligament it can be a single bundle reconstruction or a double bundle anatomical or a double bundle non anatomical using a crestless or a semi tendinosus graft so basically acute scenario the grade 1 and the grade 2 tears are managed conservatively and grade, grade 3 isolated they are conservative unless uh, they are valgusly malaligned in a combined mcl and a anterior cruciate ligament tear there are various options either we conservatively treat the mcl with a delayed acl reconstruction or we do a early acl with a mcl conservative or a acl with the mcl repair in all these scenarios there is a high chance of post operative stiffness so the rehab should be programmed accordingly in chronic scenario in isolated valgus instability a distal femoral osteotomy is indicated and is performed well followed by the reconstruction in a isolated scenario where the alignment is normal or in a varus augmentation or reconstruction is indicated a valgus plus an anterior cruciate ligament tear or anterior instability more than 4 mm augmentation or a reconstruction should be considered so to conclude non surgical treatment is the method of choice failure can lead to debilitate debilitating medial persistent instability a secondary acl weakness or a osteoarthritis also so acute repair is primarily done between 7 to 10 days the augmentation repair is done wherever the primary repair is not possible an augmentation can also be done with an internal bracing using a fiber tape or a tiger tape a reconstruction is indicated when the mcl fails to heal in neutral or varus alignment 
A chronic with a valgus malalignment needs to be done in a two stage. The distal femoral osteotomy is done first, followed by the reconstruction. Thank you. Thank you for the patient listening. Thank you, Dr. Srinivasan. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have a question actually for Dr. Clement. Uh, so the question is, it is difficult to measure the TTTG distance in type 3 and type 4 tro trochlear dysplasia. What are your tips and tricks? Yeah, one has to uh, take the junction of the hypoplastic medial femoral condyle with the, with the lateral femoral condyle bump at the level of medial epicondyle. So that gives you the level of the trochlear group. But what is important is, if you are doing a trochloplasty, we are creating a new groove, which is slightly lateral. So that itself can correct your TTTG distance by around 10 mm. So the most important thing is, if you are doing a trochloplasty, you don't have to worry too much about uh, the TTTG distance correction by doing a tibial tubercle osteotomy. So this is what I wanted to convey. It can be measured, but this is the way I, I put it in the chat box also. So at the level of medial epicondyles, you have to mark the junction of the dysplastic medial femoral condyle to the origin of the bump. I hope it answers uh, the question. Thank you, Dr. Clement. Are there any questions for Dr. Srinivasan on uh, decision making in the MCL injuries? I think if there are no further questions, uh, we will move on to the next talk by Dr. S.R. Sundar Rajan. Uh, I mean, before that, I request uh, uh, Madam to give the memento and shawl to Srinivasan. I think we missed that. Madam, yes, can sir. you do again? Uh, madam is not available here. I am doing it on my own myself. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for Thank you, sir, hosting me. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. You could have asked your daughter. Uh, they are all studying for exams. Sir. Sorry. Sir. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, I am now introducing our next speaker, Dr. S.R. Sundarajan, sir, the head of Department of Arthroscopy and Sports Medicine at Ganga Hospital, Coimbatore. So, sir has held a lot of organizational posts at the Indo-US and Foot and Ankle Course 2011, the annual meeting of Indian Arth Association of Sports Medicine 2013, Ganga, Ganga Arthroscopy Course in 2015, 17 and 19, IFAS Con 2017 and ISCA Ganga Course in 2015. Sir has 35 papers to his name and uh, 10 uh, textbook chapters uh, with uh, 460 podium presentations and lectures at national and international con conferences. He also has numerous awards, best publication awards at IAS, IAS Con three times, best paper awards at IAS in 2008 and 13, two-time recipient of the Professor Ramnathan Consultant Gold, Gold Medal for, in TNOA and the Foot and Ankle Gold Medal in TNOA 2017. Sir, I hand over the floor to you for your uh, talk on clinical correlation in ACL surgery. Dr. Sundar Rajan, sir. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, good morning, uh, Ramesh Babu, sir, uh, Siddharth and Clement for having me and for the opportunity. So today, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, clinical correlation in ACL surgery. Uh, here, I'm not going to talk about uh, anatomy or the surgical techniques about ACL reconstruction. This, this topic is on more of clinical correlation of uh, ACL surgery. I can go ahead with some few case examples so that we can make some clinical relevance uh, for that particular cases. Siddharth, can you hear me? Yes, sir. We are yes, able to sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So when do you suspect an ACL injury? So whenever you have a non-contact deceleration or a jumping or when the knee being hyperextended, usually the patient also feels that pop, hurt or felt and the patient will not be able to stand or walk immediately. And these patients sometimes can have an hematrosis in few hours. Then you could suspect this patient might be having anterior cruciate ligament injuries. 
I think one of the uh, important tests is the Lachman's test. I think by doing the hamstring laxation, just doing the translation gives you more sensitive test when the patient has whether the patient has got ACL injury or not. Another important test is the lateral pivot shift test. Even though clinically we may not do nowadays because of uh, it because it's, we think it's more cruel and because it causes a lot of pain to the patient, we do in the theater. However, the pivot shift is positive, then the management wise we can make some more decision uh, about the management of ACL reconstruction. So this indicates also there's a more anterolateral instability uh, uh, in these cases. So the clinical correlation is very, very important because all ACL tests in MRI may not need surgery. However, whenever a patient comes with isolated ACL tests, usually these patients will have a bone bruises, they can have a capsular injuries, along with ACL tear, it may be another finding in the MRI. When, if you see these kind of cases, who requires ACL reconstruction acute situation is the most important question in most of the mind. What happens if the patient comes with only pain, but there is no instability, then that patient may not be an ideal candidate to do on a reconstruction in a, that particular case. But whenever this patient has got a developed an instability, even the one-time instability that indicates that this patient may uh, uh, need an ACL reconstruction. So the pain, only pain, but no instability, then you have to be very careful in deciding ACL reconstruction in this case. In MRI, in diagnosing ACL, uh, because we know that it's because it's very high sensitivity and specificity for ACL injury. Because of its non-invasive and availability, I think all the patients comes to us with the ACL tear in the MRI. And because the negative factors in ACL is always because it's overdiagnosed. And if you don't do a failed uh, proper clinical examination to correlate with the MRI, then you may do some mistakes. Of course, some patients, because of the insurance, they may ask you to do an ACL reconstruction, but which have, we have to be very careful whether that particular patient needs that particular surgery or not. So they come to the MRI interpretation, we have to be very, very critical. So this is a case of 39 year old female presented with the pain and instability for four months duration. And if you see that MRI, you can see this MRI can show that this, this was reported as ACL tear mid substance with involvement of femoral attachment of the PCL. We know that this is not the true because you know that you have to do a read, you have to read MRI by yourself because we had to, uh, to differentiate this MECA degeneration of the ACL with an acute ACL tear, because these patients also sometimes complains instability, doesn't mean that they're having ACL tear, because the treatment sometimes very different for these cases, just do a notch plus G and decompression, they do very well. Then why you had to do an ACL reconstruction? We know that uh, one other thing is which people think that in osteoarthritis is maybe, uh, maybe the cause uh, future, they may develop osteoarthritis. Again, it's in a very controversy because we are seeing patients even after 20 years of ACL deficiency, they may not develop arthritis. Then why should we do an ACL reconstruction? The only question which we have is in younger patients, these patients comes to the recurrent instability, which can cause meniscal and cartilage damage that can lead to again osteoarthritis. So this we have to keep it, keep it in mind. So this is a patient, 23 years old male patient, had a fall from bike one year back. He's not, he's not a sports person, but he was diagnosed with ACL, but not operated. But he had an instability and fall again and came with pain and this patient has got now locking. So he had to be very careful in these cases. You can see this case, the MRI, so, uh, sorry, uh, arthroscopic picture, the, the complete absence of the ACL. But if you see the MCL, uh, the <clears throat> meniscus tear, it's very acute tear, it's very periphery tear. You can see the, all the red uh, signs over there. That means this is acute uh, meniscal tear. But you see the notch. There is some, uh, you can see there is an osteophyte that indicates the complete absence of the ACL, indicates the chronic ACL. The chronic ACL patient developed an instability now and got an acute uh, meniscal tear. Luckily, this patient was diagnosed now. We can we could see that peripheral tear. We know that it's an acute. We can save the meniscus. So this patient, if you had an operated ACL on first, uh, first attempt after once he developed the instability, these patients might have been escaped of having this kind of periphery meniscal tear and uh, uh, resulting in a uh, ACL reconstruction with the meniscus repair, like in this case, where we do an ACL reconstruction and the repair of complete medial meniscus. What happens with the ACL associated with meniscal tear? Sometimes the clinical correlation may not be really relevant, especially these meniscal injuries. Because in acute cases, it's very difficult to diagnose meniscal tear by clinically because these are very painful. We cannot do all the meniscus examination. In this case, this patient had a pain and instability. Lateral joint line tenderness was there. And uh, his MRI also showed that the lateral meniscal tear. 
So sometimes these patients may not have a tenderness because they have a pain all over the knee because of the bone bruises of acute injury. You may not be able to diagnose clinical. Naturally, definitely it is an MRI and your arthroscopic correlation. See this case, it is in a complex radial tear of the lateral meniscus, very common associated with the ACL. If you don't see an acute situation, then you miss the bus. They will, we can see the complete gap between these two fragments. If you don't repair the, these cases, then these patients have a problem. So this case had a side-to-side -side repair to have a stability. And along with that side-to-side -side repair, this was added an all inside stitch. Again, sometimes that may not be sufficient then we may need to do a two, at least side to side repair to give a, a more stability because these both fragments are completely separated. So he had an, a two side to side repair along with an all inside technique. And that was the last picture where you do an ACL reconstruction. Then along with that, you can see that that lateral meniscal tear was completely stabilized with the, all these three stitches. So they will have a good healing of the lateral meniscus. So clinical correlation is not possible in all the meniscus and cartilage tear. You can see there's another patient is a cricket player, 28 years old male patient presented with the pain and instability. You can see the bone bruises. This is a medial sagittal view. You can, the bone bruises indicates that even though meniscus looks normal here, these bone bruises indicates that this patient might be having a ramp tear. So this may not be possible to diagnose clinically. Sometimes even under MRI is very difficult. So routine arthroscopic examination only can find this kind of unstable ramp tear because we know that nowadays if by mechanical studies, the ramp tears we should treat, otherwise it may not, it can cause an, a more anterior translation resulting in an elongation of the ACL and the ACL can fade. So this patient, we had to treat that the ramp has to be treated and you can see that we are through the posteromedial portal by seeing through the anterolateral portal, we make a multiple stitches like this and do the complete repair of your ramp. That is the anterolateral view. And this is your posteromedial view. You can see that the height of the posterior meniscus is completely maintained. The instability of the meniscus achieved. So that gives you safety for your ACL reconstruction. So this is another case of 48, 40 years old male, pain, swelling, instability for six weeks duration. You can see that patient has got anterior dryer and Lachman's positive. Of course, sagittal view shows that ACL tear, but we can also see carefully this patient has got some cartilage damage. You can see the depression in that uh, sagittal view. And also you see the coronal view. You can see the depression over there. That means some there is some cartilage damage like this. So this is very difficult to diagnose clinically in acute situations. So this you have to get, you have to be uh, equipped with your equipment instruments that you have to be ready to deal with these cases, do a mosaic plasty or a micro fracture or uh, any other cartilage repair procedures. So this meniscus repair and cartilage may not have all the time clinical correlation, but you should be equipped or ready to do and uh, address the meniscus and cartilage damage. What happened to ACL with the collateral ligament injury? Just now we had heard uh, all the talk from senior person, but many times collateral ligament injuries can be treated conservatively. We know that they can heal very well. But this is a case of 31 years patient, 13 years male. Is a, he's not a sports person, but, but not a sports person. But still, this patient had a broad, uh, gross uh, opening on the medial side. You can see it's a more than grade three opening. Sometimes in a younger patient with the ACL, with the MCL, they'll have a gross instability. So in this, is, in this case, you see the arthroscopic view. This is more than 10 mm. It's almost like a grade four MCL injuries. So in these cases, ACL has to be addressed so that itself will stabilize the medial side. This is the ACL reconstruction. Once you do an ACL reconstruction, reconstruction, you can see that how much gap has been reduced. At the same time, this patient underwent a collateral ligament repair with an augmentation that resulting in the closure of your medial side. So you have to judge clinically in some cases where you have to do a collateral ligament has to be addressed along with the ACL tear. So whenever you have an isolated ACL tear, you have to be very, very careful. Clinically, you have to examine or put a leading cushion to rule out petlar instability or some patients can have an ACL tear in MRI, but they can have a quadriceps weakness. They may not have a rotatory instability. So in this patient, in these patients, you have to first strengthen the quadriceps, make sure that patient has got a, a good stability of the quadriceps. Then he develops rotatory instability, we can do an ACL reconstruction. Uh, he has already told that you have collateral ligament injuries has to be correlated clinically, very, uh, that is very important, and be equipped for meniscal repairs and cartilage damage. 
at the same time you have to consider age and activity you don't need to do an all the patients acl and mcl reconstruction or a repair so this is a 69 years old female patients we know that this patient may not have any rotatory activities acl with the mcl tear even though they have a complete mcl uh, femoral attachment tear this patient was treated conservatively we can see that six weeks time they have a good stability on the medial side that they can walk without any support so you have to consider age and activity level of the patient before you go ahead for a surgery so what graft to choose this is a sports person club level football player developed an acl tear this patient had a feeling away uh, giving away this patient had an mri you can see that in substance acl tear along with medial and lateral meniscal tear so you can see there is a complete acl tear you can see the lateral meniscal tear over there so these patients after addressing the both medial and lateral meniscus repair you can see that most of the situations we may need to address the meniscus repairs too in this case we chose to do a patella tendon bone graft because of the uh, you know that by bony to bony incorporation of the patella tendon graft has got a better results in the sports persons high athletes or contact sports person we tend to do a ptb graft that resulting in a faster healing quick uh, uh, they can go back quickly to the sports at the same time the chance of failure is a bit lesser than the hamstring graft so in this case we are used to the ptb graft so this is another patients in the non sports patients generally we use a hamstring graft you see that this case 20 years old female patient had a twisting injury 8 months before she had a pain and giving way for the last 8 months she was treated conservatively no improvement then she came for this so all the female patients especially in the, their second or third decade you have to carefully ex examine for hyperlaxity so the generalized ligament laxity are the one of the uh, important clinical finding which you had to do when you are doing an acl reconstruction because that has to be addressed when you are doing an acl reconstruction this patient got a acl tear and also you see the, the root tear the medial meniscus root tear is not common with the acl the lateral meniscus root tear is very common sometimes when you have an, a chronic acl insufficiency they can have a repeated instability resulting in the root tear so this patient underwent acl reconstruction along with the root repair to stabilize your uh, medial meniscus we can see that is the medial meniscus uh, root repair and also this patient we did a, a anterolateral ligament denodesis considering the fact that this patient had a hyperlaxity generalized ligament laxity so that adds an additional lateral support for these patients to uh, uh, for this uh, acl insufficiency so this patient had a acl root repair and the all so any explosive pivot shift positive patients or hyperlaxity patient we should consider in doing an all reconstruction or denodesis i think this is our last case it's a 31 years old female presented the pain and instability for 15 years she was uh, <clears throat> ongoing with that for 15 years but she had progressed more pain and instability for the last 5 years so she came back for surgery so alignment x-ray in all the chronic acl is very very important it not only gives the deformity it also gives you the weight bearing alignment x-ray that any arthritic changes have been taking place even though mild varus in the opposite side but you see the affected side has got around 10.8 degree of the varus complete absence of the acl so this patient because very young patient is a 30 years 28 years 30 years old patients we cannot leave it like that so we had to do an acl reconstruction along with the high tibial osteotomy so that resulting in relieving the pain from the medial compartment at the same time it gives stability for these patients and you can see the alignment we had changed from 10 degrees of uh, varus to the almost 2.3 degrees of valgus to shifting the weight from the medial side to the center of the joint to conclude all in acute cases or acl tear with instabilities requires acl reconstruction however if the patient has got only pain you have to be very very careful but instability with the pain then carefully assess the meniscus and cartilage damage and should be addressed along with the acl reconstruction in chronic acl tears the pain could be due to root tears or an osteoarthritis so they had to carefully look for the root tears or if the patient has got a varus or oh changes osteotomy has to be considered in these cases all the high level athletes and contact sports we try to do a patella tendon bone grafts otherwise in low demand patients we do a hamstring graft thank you very much thank you dr sundarajan over to dr clement and uh, dr sinuwasan sir there is a good series of illustrative cases and uh, the most important development in acl surgery would be an individualized acl reconstruction that is your subcategorizing 
the ACL injuries into many categories and also subclassifying the patients into many demand situations. Uh, sir, what are the, your indications for doing ALL reconstruction? It is preoperative, or sometimes you test the ACL stability after surgery. And you add an extra articular procedure. So preoperatively, I mean, naturally, as, he, as I said, if the patient has got a generalized ligament laxity in the female patients, generally we tend to get. Then we always pre-plan for an ALL, a ligament tenodosis or a reconstruction. Actually, the pivot shift, usually you do an intraoperatively, I mean, sorry, in the theater, because we cannot do in, but, but many cases, chronic cases, we'll be able to elicit the pivot shift test. So if you can elicit the pivot shift preoperatively, then we consider ALL, or even in the theater after anesthesia, if you can, the pivot shift is positive, explosive pivot shift positive, then we can add that ALL uh, uh, tenodosis or reconstruction. Sir, are there any situations where the MRI has shown ACL tear, but you advise conservative treatment. What are the clinical uh, grounds that you will not do a surgery when the MRI says there is ACL tear? Now, how do you examine the patient? Yeah, I think that there are the, uh, as I said, so then decide not to do yeah. ACL surgery. So always I put uh, you. You see, you know, you see on a young patient with active sports person, it's a post uh, sports injury. You know that this patient definitely has got an instability because of the ACL. Any non-sports person comes to you with the ACL tear, with the instability. There are two important clinical findings which I want to elicit. One is the marked quadriceps wasting. Other thing is the petlar instability. Because there are some situations where I had come across where patient comes with an ACL tear in MRI. But if you carefully put a leading question, examine the patient, that patient may, may be having a recurrent petlar instability. It's not very uncommon. So these two things which I want first clinically rule out, the quadriceps mark quadriceps weakness because these patients will have a they may also say instability if you ask carefully they will say that i have instability that is like falling forward that it is because of the quadriceps weakness not because of the rotatory instability so these patients always i tell them do a quadriceps strengthening you will not you know you don't need an acl reconstruction that's how that is the clinical aspect but when you see in other activity levels no non-sports person as i showed in one case even with the acl mcl in a uh, older patients with less physiologically, their uh, older age, with less activity people, I tell them uh, you can try conservative management, even the first time instability if you had at the time. If you have a recurrent instability, then we can do an ACL reconstruction. Clement, unmute. What is the timing of surgery? Do you do acute uh, ACL reconstruction? Now that a lot of papers are saying that if you do within a week, you can avoid the cortisol wasting. Uh, yes. As your practice change, when do you do your ACL reconstruction? The first week or third week? Uh, Clement, uh, my practice has not changed from the last 20 years. So uh, I do an acute ACL reconstruction even 15 years, 20 years before. But my my uh, uh, points are that patient has to knee has to be supple. It should be quiet, no warmth. And I want that patient to get full range of movements. So any active sports person or young patients also, if they have an ACL tear, even they have, they have instability, but if they don't have a much swelling or if they have a full range of movements, I tend to do them even though I had done some few cases in the first week. So the days are not important. So the important factor is here that knee has to be quiet and the movements has to be full. So that is the criteria. Dr. Sundarajan? Yes, Srinivasan. I have one question. In an elderly patient with uh, ACL with uh, root tear, would you routinely repair the root tear even if the cartilage changes are noted or with arthritic changes? Or So the elderly patients to have an ACL with the medial meniscus the root tear is very, very rare. You know? Rare, yeah, yeah. So elderly patients, as I said, the IVC only active TFL. If the elderly patient, if they're a sports person active only, I treat ACL itself. So we know that the root tear, medial meniscus root tear, to develop on the first occasion, it's very rare. We know that lateral meniscus root tear is very common Come. along with that acute ACL. But the patients, because of the chronic instability, then tend to have that root tear, medial meniscus root tear. So that is the common scenario. So anybody comes, that, that situation is very, very uh, rare in my practice. Acute ACL in a old age with the root tear, it's very rare. Unless in the younger, in the younger age, they left off with that ACL tear, then they develop recurrent instability. 
then they tend to develop the root tear then they develop osteoarthritis of course i see very few patients in these situations where i have done few cases where acl with the root repair with the osteotomy so they are all you. young patient they will be all usually in the 40s or 50s where they might have had an acl 15 20 years before they might have left it then they had a recurrent instability then the root tear they went for a varus deformity with the oa then we combine all the three okay thank you thank, thank you clement and thank you uh, sinwasan as well as uh, dr sundar rajan uh, now you, i request uh, mrs sundar rajan to honor you on our be off Uh, sir, sorry, sir. I am in Bangalore, sir. I had come for my son PG okay. exam. Uh, already, I told my wife that to do it at home. So I so already okay. had it. Okay, excellent, <laughs> excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. We will we will move on to the next uh, in the agenda. Uh, we have our uh, most important uh, uh, third late Dr. D. Subrayan's oration. It is going to be given by none other than uh, Dr. D. Dr. Go, uh, David Rajan. Uh, on uh, meniscal repair by journey before uh, we will uh, honor uh, dr david rajan i would like to say a few words about uh, dr david rajan dr david rajan is the chairman and uh, managing director of ortho one orthopedic specialty center coimbatore he is one of the pioneers of arthroscopy in india he has vast experience in arthroscopic surgery of the knee and shoulder he is considered as the father of arthroscopic surgery in this part of the country ortho one is running a fellowship program in arthroscopic sports medicine and arthroplasty to his credit ortho one has trained several arthroscopic surgeons all over india i am happy to share here that our co chairman dr clement joseph is one of his uh, uh, disciples he has operated on many sports personalities and vips he is responsible for the return to pre injury level in their activities he is a skillful surgeon with god given healing hands he is compassionate to all his patients he takes keen interest in training and imparting his skill and knowledge to young surgeons he is a doctor for excellence and a great human being He has been a past president of Indian Ortho Arthroscopy Society, past president of Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association, committee member and deputy chairman of the Education Committee of uh, ISACOS. ISACOS is uh, International Society of uh, Arthroscopy, Knee Surgery, and Orthopedic Sports Medicine. He is a passionate about uh, repair of meniscus. He is probably the first one to repair meniscus in India, and. Uh, we are very happy that uh, uh, he has chosen this topic for the oration he has conducted the first exclusive exclusive shoulder surgery meeting in india in the year 1995 at coimbatore he is not only a great academician but an active sportsman who continues to take part in various sports even now in uh, tnoa he used to take part in the veteran Ball, ball, badminton, or as on a shuttle badminton tournament, and he used to be always the winner. And uh, without uh, much delay, I would like to introduce Dr. David Rajan to the August gathering. I request uh, Dr. Abdul Salam to honor on our behalf. Abdul Salam is uh, one of our postgraduates from uh, Roy Peter Hospital. He was kind enough to represent us in Coimbatore. This is the medallion and the memento. Salam. You can also show your face and you can stand next to David Rajan sir. Thank, thank you, sir. thank you, Salam, for doing the honors. Thank you, David thank Rajan you. sir, for thank accepting you. our invitation. The floor thank is yours, sir. Yeah, thanks, Ramesh. I didn't know that uh, even virtually you can do all this uh, banda. <laughs> <laughs> When a person like uh, uh, David Rajan is giving the oration, we have to honor you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Very, very grateful for choosing me as uh, the orator for uh, the very important uh, event. Um, 
can I have the slides? I'm very grateful to Dr. Ramesh Babu and Subrahim family uh, for this uh, honor given to me. Thank you very much. Sir, sir. I would like to say a few words about uh, Dr. Subrahim. Uh, although I have not met him, the small square is not coming. Although I have not met him, I used to hear about him from my guru doctor, TKS. The thing is, Shanmu Sundaram and uh, Dr. Subrahim are classmates, if I remember correctly. Is that correct, uh, Ramesh? Yes, sir, you yes, are right. Sir. Yeah, so he used to talk very highly about him. And he belongs to that uh, caliber of people belonging to the TKS batch. And when uh, Ramesh came into, came back to India, then he said, my, my good friend, Dr. Sibara and son, Ramesh has come and he's doing excellent work and all that. So I do have some personal communication through Dr. Uh, Dr. TKS. Now I would like to say a few words about uh, Dr. Sibara born in 26 and uh, demised on uh, 2019 born to Mrs. Rajan and uh, Mr. Barisami of Alangur Vilipuram district. Good schooling at Alangur and Trikoilu, BSc at Kachapa College, BBS at Government Stanley, Chennai, married to Mrs. Parimula on 22nd December 1953. Uh, he has uh, three daughters so now that we all know Ramesh, we've seen them all. Happy family of grandchildren and great grandchildren. He really had a blessed life. A family physician for 65 years at Rajan Nasinam Tiruvannamalai. The first uh, MBPS private practitioner of Tiruvannamalai district. First introduced X-rays and private setup in Tiruvannamalai district. Charter president of IMA branch Tiruvannamalai. The Bandra Award was given to him in 1991. Lifetime Achievement Award was given to him by India, India Medical University in Chennai in 2012. Eminent Doctor Award for Tamil Nadu Medical Council was given to him in 2015. I'm sure he was, he was, he was a very proud father of Ramesh Babu. He's doing excellent orthopedic work in. Um, Chennai, he was an excellent teacher, Ramesh. So my short brief talk is about the Menstis Repair, my journey. It was prepared by uh, Preetam Fellow. Uh, and I'm sure you're surprised to see this. Um, hey, Preetam, how can I see my picture? Sir, it's coming on the picture. Preetam, how can I see It's not coming. Okay, it's, it's, a, <clears throat> it's a reconstruction picture I'm putting here. Even the last talk, there was some debate on, there was some talk on uh, ASAP construction, whether I do it or not do it. ASAP construction has to be done, it has to be done in order to save the meniscus, not to save the ACL. But ACL construction, whatever age group, it has to be done to save the meniscus. I have heard, I have gone through a lot of debates on whether I will do, and uh, or Bombay colleagues saying, you know, I will not do, I will not touch the patient for several years and all that. You know, ACL reconstruction is being done for the sake of meniscus preservation. That is the bottom line. So meniscus has to be prepared. So you see a meniscus complex tear, um, and you see nine months post, you can already see the uh, partly collapse, you know, subchondral edema taking place. And then the patient comes with pain. So ACL uh, reconstruction done for the meniscus, and wherever the meniscus tear is there, you don't do meniscectomy, you try to preserve the meniscus. And Hague Rose spoke <clears throat> as early as 1916, that ACL injury is the beginning of the end of the knee. What he actually meant was ACL injury, which led to meniscus tear, is the beginning of the end of the knee. So it is the meniscus injury, uh, which is the beginning of the end of the knee. Not really the ACL. So to save the meniscus, you have to save the, you have to reconstruct the ACL, and at all costs, you must repair the meniscus. 
This is a, this is a classical picture by Stephen Augustine and Westwater. Uh, and as early as 82, when they established and told us that uh, uh, meniscus has got a blood supply in the outer uh, one third uh, or two thirds for the lateral meniscus and one third for medial meniscus. And this is a basis on which we repaired the meniscus. At that time, we repaired the meniscus only in the peripheral care. We said the record red white, but the white white way excise the meniscus. So it is not so now. There will be a lot of change in the meniscus repair. This is a intra op picture of the lateral meniscus posterior horn. You can see that uh, there is a lot of uh, punctate bleeding in the torn end of the meniscus, not necessarily in the red red area or red white area, but even on the white area. So in, I have seen a few cases where we advise surgery for the lateral meniscus tear, what is the meniscus tear? No, it's not, it's not. The meniscus tear and the advice surgery for the patient. The patient goes around everywhere and comes back after one month or two months. By then, the lateral meniscus is healing nicely, attempting healing nicely, whether it is uh, retired or white or whatever, it is uh, healing nicely. So, um, the posterior half of the meniscus is healing, healing very well on its own, uh, as against anterior. Uh, one third or two thirds. Anyway, the common area where the meniscus tears is posterior half, and not necessarily the anterior half. So what I'm trying to say is, uh, we see them having good blood supply in the posterior half of the meniscus, especially on the lateral meniscus. So uh, we can go all out to the right meniscus. The, this is how I started in early. 90s and late 80s when I was doing open ACL reconstruction after seeing Ken uh, Haven doing all this uh, open repair. Oh, you see, it's sitting on the line this way. Yes. You put the chair there. So the open meniscus repair is what uh, we started with. And, uh, uh, and uh, this is and later, we went on for arthroscopy assisted uh, meniscus repair. And we used to use simple meniscus repair, not extensive one. This is an example of uh, inside out meniscus repair of the okay, this is uh, sorry, this is all inside meniscus repair with the posterior one there. Such simple meniscus pairs uh, were chosen initially. And we also did outside in repair for meniscus using uh, meniscus uh, needles or uh, just spinal needles alone. And this is useful in anterior and a middle uh, one third. Even this kind of repair I was doing initially way back in the 90s and then it switched on to inside out repair by zone specific handler system and those safe incisions or you don't have to do safe incisions on the middle side but on the lateral side you better do safe incisions and what we do is a zone specific handler system of linotech which you see on the on the, on the left side and there are other similar equipments by Stryker and so many other companies also come out. But you use what is best. In our hands, this has been the road cause. We set out zone specific system of Renvetic. The later we switched to all inside because uh, all inside was available. And there was an Israeli company. Which, uh, uh, which provided us with uh, this kind of primitive uh, earlier first generation all inside the pad. It was just be done uh, made by PLGA and later on with Peak. Here the issue was uh, 
the head uh, was protruding outside, and that led to a lot of particular cartilage injury and cartilage erosion. So that was slowly given up until the modern on inside medical book packing where the teeth is sitting actually on the outside of the uh, meniscus. This is again really useful, but uh, the cost efficiency is not that very good. And um, if it is good for lateral meniscus, mostly one third, and maybe medial meniscus, mostly the one third. Remaining areas, you can always use uh, instead of meniscus uh, with that system. Uh, this is an example of healing. The ideal way by which you can find out is by doing arthroscopy in a patient who has already undergone uh, meniscus repair. Uh, this is from the book, and maybe since we are in the kind of here where we can't do scopy for patients post uh, this I've taken borrowed it from the book. You can see that the meniscus is healing very nicely in the Third uh, picture you see. Uh, then slowly uh, we started repairing um, bucket handle tears. Because earlier I used to excise the bucket handle tear, saying it's too large, it will not heal. And the patient complained, it may not be there. But we realized that uh, the associated radial tear is a very simple, small tear and uh, can be. Uh, Repaired. A lot of good results also have been published. So I do the meniscus repair. For bucket handle tears also. Sometimes you can go up to 12, 14 sutures. You have the pass sutures in the superior surface as well as in the inferior surface. We use sort the cord, one of those non absorbable materials. For the posterior on third, we use um, <clears throat> all inside if necessary. There also on the medial side, you can use uh, inside out, and only on the lateral side, all inside is mandatory. Proper post op protocol is very essential. The patient has to go very, has to be very compliant and to go non weight bearing for a very long time. It's six weeks now. Posterior upon the medial chair. This, uh, this is a picture I showed you earlier. Sandra then also showed in this talk. to use as many uh, ways as possible to repair such nerves. The yeah, transtibial repair is done over by all inside. And at the end of it all, the repair may not look brilliant, but it feels very well. Menstrual root repair being done only for the last 10 years or so. And earlier we used to excise it. I still remember a case that I did a long time back, a relative of an ophthalmologist. I didn't know what to do for a root repair. So I excised it and say this lady was complaining bitterly about it for a long time and eventually we had to do a total knee replacement. Since stitch and transtibial tunnel and switch. Not all meniscus can be repaired in total. Sometimes you have to excise as well as repair the meniscus. So you don't have to totally excise the meniscus, excise especially the Multiple bucket handle tears. You excise only the what put it the white white um, tear, 
and the many ministers they got a horizon horizon three ways turn and unstable to the pad again by inside out and of system so there is a why i'm showing you this is that um, uh, we need not always necessarily excise the entire complex pair of the manuscript you can excise partly and prepare the rest the complex tear also can be repaired as you see in this uh, clipping this a radial tear this uh, complex tear we uh, use the mini pass pass or scorpion and take six six stitch and stipule tunnel repair it. It may be suboptimal, but nevertheless it works and continues to work for some time for the young patients. According to the literature, you can repair it up to 58 years. And even beyond that, you can repair as long as one year is healthy to reasonable extent. Sometimes you, have a, you may have to do ancillary procedures like take the last year and we take centralization stitch whenever there is extrusion only then it will work sometimes you can even see uh, meniscus extruded without the uh, tear what happens when there is a root tear which is healed with stretching then you may have to take a centralization stitch to be a tunnel and repair it in a reduced manner you may find the atypical meniscus style like you find here on the left it's a radial tear which is extending into the red white area of the last minister earlier i used to excise it and then i started repairing it this is a very early um, slide several sutures Don't forget to do a bone marrow minting in such cases. So then, long term back. And this is a modern way of doing it. This is taught uh, uh, by, devised by my colleague of Santosh. We even published it. We call it. this is possible only with the help of uh, instead of uh, technique so even if it is a radial tear in the complex tear you don't have to excise it you can do better this has been published as a peacock crown for the technique in neural arthroscopy and joints surgery we also come up with a new scoring system for prediction of meniscus repair in traumatic meniscus tear it has been published in ESPA journal and it has been quoted extensively it is known as uh, factor 1 pump score we already come out to it we are ready with the modified uh, pump score which we have published very shortly um, how do we go about 
checking whether the uh, minister repair is killed or not. Um, you can see this double piece of hair, the button handle hair of the meniscus, repaired, and we routinely we tell them that we'd be doing a meniscus uh, follow up by MRI. So the MRI has been done after two years. You can see that uh, there is no evidence of any tear, there is no signal change at all over the MRI. The first year, you will continue to find the changes, and only at the end of two years, the same signal disappears. So, what basis are we doing this uh, repair of uh, such complex tears and daily tears? And there will be a lot of follow up study, 18 years follow up study of uh, various authors. Um, Mayo Clinic especially, and similarly the conclusions and uh, surgical techniques are outcome by minister of radial tests. Patient improvement with repairing of radial tests is regardless of technique. Long-term follow-up by Laprade group also proves that uh, this kind of minister tab feeds. Also the WOS, where complex and elastic menstrual tears, also they wrote several papers where the repair is occurs with even complex tears. So, therefore, so all out and repair the meniscus. There's no such thing as irreparable meniscus. Even if you have the excise part of the meniscus, repair the remaining meniscus, it does a lot of good to the patient. The way the, the compartment goes in for early osteoarthritis is invariably. Um, so, I hope uh, that showed you uh, some, uh, it takes you through some of my journey through the meniscus repair. Thank you very much in conclusion for giving me the chance to. Talk about the ministers. Thank you very much. Thanks to everyone. Thank you, sir. It was uh, excellent. I'm sure it was an eye opener to all the uh, orthopedic surgeons, especially to the uh, young and budding surgeons, sir. Thank you very much for sharing your uh, views on meniscal repair, which is a very important topic. If you have to save the joint, and uh, we have to take imp uh, important uh, uh, step to save the meniscus. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation in spite of your busy schedule. And we are honored by your presence. My, my and, pleasure. Uh, as you know, Thank as you for this. Asking. Yes, sir. Thanks. Thanks for not asking me to come all the way to Madras. <laughs> That is one advantage of COVID, sir. Yeah, that's right. That's why I accepted it also. <laughs> right, all the best. Thank you, sir. Thank you very all much. All the best for the remaining uh, deliberations. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, we are uh, moving on to the uh, next in the agenda. We have uh, about uh, seven minutes to have our inauguration of the function. And we take this opportunity to welcome Dr. Nadesan, who is the past president of uh, Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association. And uh, I also welcome Dr. Sundar Rajan from Udmalpet. Dr. Vanasegar, President uh, uh, Yalakti is there. We welcome you, Vanasegar. I think uh, you, it looks uh, you are in Kerala, am I right? Where are you, Vanasegar? Sir, we have Kallanai. Kallanai. Oh, very good, very good. Uh, welcome, Vanasegar. Welcome, Dr. Nadesan. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We also welcome our uh, Oasis uh, uh, President, Dr. Raghavadat. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think uh, Dr. Anin, Professor Anin has already joined. Welcome you, Dr. Anin. 
Thank you, Ramesh. Thank you. Thank you. We are just waiting for our uh, uh, president, uh, Indian Orthopedic Association, Dr. Siva Shankar, to join us. As soon as he joins, we will uh, get going with our inauguration, sir. And I should thank Dr. Billy John, Billy Paul Wilson, who has accepted to postpone the postpone his talk after the inauguration. Thank you, Dr. Billy. Oh, Billy Paul Wilson. Thank you, Dr. Billy Paul Wilson. You're welcome, sir. Yeah. Billy. Billy. Anin. Anin here. Hi, Anin. Yes. We were, we were there in the same college. <laughs> oh, excellent. Excellent. Welcome, Dr. Navredi Shankar. He is our uh, Madras Orthopedic Society president. Welcome, Navredi. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning. You can switch on, switch on your video. We can have your uh, lively face. Yes, yeah, sir. Definitely, sir. <laughs> Welcome, Dr. Shiva Shankar, President Indian Orthopedic Association. We are just waiting for you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, sir. Welcome. Good morning, sir. Good, Good morning, morning sir. Good morning, Arin. Welcome to Tamil Nadu and to our uh, hospital CME program. Thank you. The Zoom making us to come nearer. Yeah, it's making us come nearer and the world is so small now. Everything is in your room. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I think uh, all the dignities are here. We are uh, four minutes uh, before schedule, but still we will go ahead, sir. So a very good afternoon to one and all. On behalf of the staff and management at Spot Hospital, I, Dr. Siddharth Ramesh Babu, have great pleasure to inviting you all for the inaugural function of this virtual CME on arthroscopy, clinical and surgical correlation conducted as a part of our 17th anniversary celebrations under the auspices of Indian Orthopedic Association, OASIS, Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association and Madras Orthopedic Society. We shall now begin the function with an invocation. I request everybody to please stand up. Thank you very much. I kindly request all to be seated. Now, I finally call upon our uh, dear Dr. S. Ramesh Babu, Organizing Chairman, Director and Chief Orthopedic Surgeon of Spot Hospital to welcome the gathering. Thank you, Dr. Siddharth, for being the MC for this uh, inaugural function. Respected dignitaries, senior professors, colleagues, friends and delegates, a yeah, very good afternoon to one and all. On behalf of uh, staff and management of Spot Hospital, I have great pleasure in welcoming every one of you for this virtual CME on arthroscopic surgery. The theme is clinical and surgical correlation, which has been organized on the occasion of our 17th anniversary. I have great pleasure in welcoming Dr. B. Shivashanka, President, Indian Orthopedic Association, who has accepted to be the chief guest and to inaugurate this uh, CME in spite of his busy schedule. Even just before I was talking to him, he was in another uh, webinar 
I have to pull him towards our CME. Thank you, sir, for uh, accepting our invitation and uh, inaugurating the CME program. This shows your love and affection towards TNOA, Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association, especially towards me in particular. We are very grateful to you, sir, and feel extremely honored by your presence. I request, uh, hope you received our memento. And not at not at not at. Oh, sorry, sir. Solapur is away for a delivery system because it's not having an airport, so it comes little late. Oh, Don't sorry, worry. Sir. Yes, uh, no problem. It will please come. Please accept our uh, memento and a shawl. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I wholeheartedly welcome Dr. Raghavadath, President Oasis, for accepting to be the guest of honor and to felicitate us. Thank you for coming, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, and here is my shawl. And yes. the momento, sir. Nice. <laughs> and the momento is here too. Yes. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the great lengths that you have gone to to arrange this. And I received yesterday. Very kind of you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank sir. you very much. We are honored by your presence, sir. Thank you, sir. I sincerely welcome my good friend and president-elect of Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association, Dr. Banasegar, for being the guest of honor and to felicitate us. I request uh, our past president, Dr. Nadesan, to honor him with a shawl and our past president, Dr. Murli Dharan, to give him a memento, please. They are celebrating this CME on our behalf at Kalanai. <laughs> I think they are in the back seat of behind a car. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Nadesan. Thank you, Dr. Murli, for doing the honors. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Nadesan. Enjoy. <laughs> okay, okay. Lift it and show the memento. Ah, I tell my best wishes to Shiv Shankar. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I have uh, great pressure in welcoming our well-wisher, Dr. Navaladi Shankar, President, Madras Orthopedic Society, who will be presiding over this function. He always renders a helping hand in all our endeavors. I request uh, Navaladi Shankar to have the shawl and uh, memento. If madam is around, you can request uh, madam to do the honors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I just came down for an emergency. I received your shawl and memento. Okay. Also, great pleasure. And uh, on this occasion, I would like to say, wherever can... Dr. Ramesh Babu goes, he leaves the footprints of kindness wherever you go. <laughs> so, you really thank you. Uh, honor to have him uh, uh, in our society and then really appreciate him. Uh, on the 17th anniversary of the sport hospitals and on and on every year. I see he is so punctual and has been followed by his son Siddharth also is also in the same line. We really appreciate and wherever in the teaching, wherever the knowledge is there, I feel uh, we should follow the footsteps of Dr. Ramesh Babu. He is there to teach and any, every year some new topics. So we learn sir, every year from your new topics and we can learn from Thank you for inviting me sir. Welcome. I sincerely welcome Professor Dr. Anin Yan Kuti, Secretary General of Oasis, for accepting to be the guest of honor and to felicitate us. Madam is around, sir. Thank you, sir. I request Madam to honor you with the shawl. Uh, I, I, I didn't receive. receive. I didn't receive. Okay. I, yesterday I was out of station. <laughs> hope, hope you me. will get it on yeah. Monday, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you for accepting our invitation. I am honored and pleased to welcome Dr. David Rajan, the father of arthroscopy in this part of the country, who has just now delivered the late Dr. D. Subrayan's oration. I welcome the galaxy of expert orthopedic surgeons, arthroscopic surgeons, Dr. Bupesh Karthik of Osur, Dr. Billy Paul Wilson of Miot Hospital, Chennai, Dr. Clement Joseph of Sims Hospital, who also happens to be the co-chairman and in charge of today's scientific deliberations. I also welcome Dr. Kanniraj Marimuttu, 
of Narvi Hospitals, Vellur, Dr. Pajal Ganesh, Sandil Nathan by Nevu from Rajam Nursing Home, Thiruvannamalai, Dr. Ram Chidambaram, MGM Healthcare Centre, Dr. J. Srinivasan, Priya Hospital, Chennai, who has been associated with our hospital ever since its inception for the past 17 years. I also welcome Dr. K. N. Subramanian of Vale Hospital, Madurai, Dr. S. R. Sundar Rajan of Ganga Hospital, Coimbatore, and Yugal Varandani of Sims Hospital, Chennai. I welcome all the professors, assistant professors, postgraduates, practicing orthopedic surgeons, and orthopedic surgeons from various institutions throughout India to this virtual CME. I welcome Dr. Reddy's lab, Arthrax, for sponsoring this program. I also welcome the Ortho TV for their live streaming. I also welcome my family, friends, staff of hospital for this uh, CME. I welcome my colleagues, Dr. Krishnamurthy, Dr. Manigandan, who has also joined this program. I welcome one and all for this uh, CME. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your alluring welcome address. I now kindly request ever helpful Dr. Navaladi Shankar, President MOS, to preside over the function and deliver his presidential address. Good morning, good morning, everybody, respected teachers, my colleagues, and uh, to Professor Ramesh Babu and Siddharth Ramesh Babu, as uh, I was telling about the knowledge what Ramesh Babu shares, and along with the knowledge and also the footprints, what he leaves of kindness is really make us uh, to endure his uh, journey towards the teaching. And uh, I preside the 17th anniversary of the uh, spot hospitals. Every year, past 17 years, we have been attending his conference and has been really is up to date. He can get whatever is happening across the world. He makes sure that every of us learn what is the latest and he brings the topmost people in every specialty into this conference. And then he, he really makes us understand what's happening around the world and he gets us to do this thing. Thank you very much, sir. I have a hearty welcome for this, uh, all the speakers and uh, share their knowledge to gain us about this programs. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, the guest of honor, Dr. Raghav Dutt, President Oyasis is always interested in academics and encourages CMEs and various training activities. Uh, please, sir, uh, kindly felicitate. Sir, you are on mute. Uh, respected Professor Ramesh Babu, Professor Shiv Shankar, President IOA, our Secretary General, ever enthusiastic Professor Anin Puti, Clement Joseph, Dr. Shankar, and above all, Professor Raj Gopalan, whom I've been seeing him for over decades attending every conference, guiding the youngsters, guiding people, seniors like me. And I'm seeing him since morning and attentively listening to our conference. It is so important because during COVID, we all thought we'll be confined to our homes. And then these meetings came up, the webinars came up. And I'm so proud as the president of the Orthopedic Association of South Indian States that in South India, all of us are doing so many of these webinars. And I'm glad that OSS under leadership of Professor Anin as a Secretary General is now coordinating his effort in putting all these under the umbrella of OASIS. That is a proud moment for us. And these will enrich certainly people like me who have not done arthroscopic surgery for the last 30 years or more. And being a completely out and out spine surgeon, I've been listening to the, and seeing the videos and uh, understanding the nuances and the advances made in arthroscopic surgery. In fact, some of these webinars have enriched my knowledge about various subspecialties of orthopedics, which is extremely important, much as we practice in our own subspecialties and engrossed with our own work. To all of us, there is all, all of them, and whenever I go, wherever I go, they say one more webinar. Every webinar we pick up as seniors, a few points. 
which help us treat our patients better. Our nation, our patient, our country, we owe it to this country to continue on our ac academic path. We went like beggars to foreign countries about 30 years ago, learned and came back. Today, we should go to the standards where those guys will come to us and learn from us. This is a great country of Bharat. This is the land of wisdom. So our webinars will encourage our youngsters to learn from the seniors and also give a platform for youngsters whom I have seen today presenting their work. Please continue this good work, Professor Ramesh Babu. We have seen your enthusiasm as the, at, as, at the helm of affairs of Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association. It was unbelievable and your enthusiasm is infectious. We hope that your help and inputs will continue to be there to, I, mean, I have a bit of selfish reason for uh, my own as a, as a president of OASIS to request your continued guidance to take OASIS to the levels that we all dreamt of over the years. Thank you once again and a wonderful conference and God bless, stay safe, stay healthy. Youngsters, listen to these talks, have a good lunch, have a good cup of coffee by your side, relax and enjoy this meeting in the comfort of your homes. Take care. Thank you once again. Thank you very much, sir, for your inspiring and uplifting felicitation. Uh, the guest of honor, Dr. Vanashekar, President-elect, Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association, who has always been very friendly and supportive in all our academic and social activities. Sir, kindly do felicitate. Thank you. Uh, respected Chief Guest, Dr. Shivashankar, President of TAMAYOA, respected orator for today, Dr. David Rajan, my very good friend and a teacher, Guest of Honor, Dr. Raghav Dutt, President of OASIS, Dr. Navadi Shankar, President of MOAS, Organization Chairman, Dr. Ramesh Babu, Co Chairman, Dr. Clement, Organization Secretary, Dr. Siddhar, faculty members of this great CME, delegates and honor members of Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association. Sincere thanks to Dr. Ramesh Babu for inviting me to join this August gathering. My hearty congratulations to all consultants and staff of Spot Hospital for their 17th anniversary celebration and best wishes. Third, Dr. Subrayan oration by David Rajan is on meniscal repair. I am sure that he should have come across lacks of meniscal injuries and his experience will be the best guide for all of us. I feel fortunate to be associated with Dr. Ramesh Babu and uh, Dr. David Rajan for more than three decades. Their role in academic and other activities of Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association is remarkable. Thank you very much, sir. We have got an excellent, eminent, experienced team of faculty members, Upesh Karthi Kyagor, Yugal Varadani, Paul Wilson, Kaniraj Marimuthu, Prajwal Ganesh, and Srinivasan. I also personally like to congratulate my friends, Dr. Clement Joseph, S.R. Sundarajan, Subramanian and Ram Chidambaram for their continuous, tireless academic works. Thanks and best wishes to all the faculty members. I'm sure these academic activities of Dr. Ramesh Babu and his team will continue forever. On behalf of Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Station, once again, I congratulate the whole team of Spot Hospital and my best wishes for the grand success of CME. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, the, guest, uh, uh, the guest of honor, uh, Professor Dr. Ani and Kuti, Secretary General, OASIS, who is very much interested in teaching and training the young postgraduates. We request you to felicitate, sir. Thank you. Uh, respected uh, President of Madras Orthopedic uh, Association, Navaladi Shankar, sir, who is presiding the function. Respected IOA President Shiva Shankar, sir. OASIS President Raghav Dutt, sir, Ramesh Babu, sir, seniors, and dear friends. I think uh, we have been fortunate to get this CME in the fold of OASIS because uh, as uh, Ramesh Babu, sir, wrote to me first, we were uh, very happy to see that because we are finding our ways through in the academics. Uh, OASIS this year have taken to the people, the members in a lot of academic programs. And we have done uh, seven to eight uh, webinars this uh, three, four months. And I thank uh, uh, Ramesh Babu, sir, for adding to that. And this all inspiration comes from our president, Raghavdath, sir. And nothing 
uh, he 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 has aimed very high because of my uh, ceiling. We have kept only this; otherwise, we have touched newer heights. Uh, but we are very happy, uh, and the uh, this uh, COVID situation has not stopped us from learning and. Through the webinars, and uh, Shivashankar sir is a pioneer. He is being doing every week a webinar in IM IOA, uh, so that we are all listening to lot of topics. But I think the juniors are uh, well gifted now because uh, I think earlier we never had this much of programs, and the all these uh, newer topics new uh, were not discussed earlier. So I think in a year's time, all the postgraduates would have heard all the topics of the books uh, in and the current concepts also from the experts itself. I think it's this is also a great opportunity, and I wish all the delegates a great success and Damesh Babu sir in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, the chief guest of the day, Dr. B. Shivashankar. President IOA is the most respected, friendly, as well as most learned and skillful orthopedic surgeon, especially in intramedullary nailing, who is fondly known as the nail man of India. We request you to inaugurate and deliver your inaugural address, sir. Thank you, Sita. Respected Dr. Ramesh Babu, sir, presiding officer of today's function. Navladi Shankar, sir, President of uh, Madras Orthopedic Association, OSS President Dr. Raghavadat, Secretary Anin Kutti, Vice President of TNOA Dr. Vanasekar, my teacher Dr. Raj Gopalan, and my friend Dr. Natesan, and other people who are now here. Good afternoon to one and all. I am really happy that. Dr. Ramesh Babu has been regularly organizing the teaching CME on the occasion of the anniversary. This is the 17th anniversary. I am told that uh, it's the 17th CME has organized and every time a new topic is being selected. And this, today uh, it's about the meniscal clinical, clinical indications and uh, arthroscopic surgeries is the topic. And I'm glad that there was a oration also by David Rajan on this topic just before uh, I joined this meeting. Just before this meeting, I was on a HTO webinar meeting. Friends, I was happy to listen to one of the speaker, Dr. Kishore Maheshwari, who has invented a plate, special locking plate for a, instead of a Coventry plate, Coventry staple requires a plaster to avoid the plaster he has designed. That's what I call it as Atmanirbhar, means self-sufficient, self-reliant. My theme for this year is Indian at heart, global incompetence, Atmanirbhar orthopedics. So we all should follow what is good for our own people. As Dr. Raghavadat was telling earlier, earlier we were going to Western world to learn something new and bring back. But now it's the reverse. People come to India. I know that... Like, 15 days back, I was on a webinar with Dr. Raj Sekharan. Last year, in spite of the COVID, they had 150 foreigners coming as fellows to that hospital. That indicates that rich knowledge we have got. Unfortunately, for various reasons, we don't have a structured plan to do the research. And our teachers and doctors are overworked and uh, they are not able to present at an international level. Otherwise, our work clinical material is almost the whole world, whatever has it, it, we have got it in India. So we should all promote that. And I'm glad that Ortho TV, because of this, we have got up, at present about 40,000 orthopedic surgeons from all over the globe. So each and every webinar, whatever is being conducted, uh, I do get messages from Pakistan, Oman, uh, Tanzania, Sudan, uh, so many places people do ask so many questions and they are learning from us. So this is a what was happening 20, 30 years back as reverse is happening and we are now the global capital thanks to COVID. So there is not only bad things about the COVID, but there is good things also has happened. We have so many new 
faculty who have come up, we have seen so many newer people who are never presented earlier. Now they are able to present their work and they, this uh, so many webinars has given a lot of opportunity. Now we have identified so many newer faculty for different subjects and uh, that's a really great positive thing which has happened. And I also take this opportunity to welcome you all for the physical IOACon. Friends, the 66th IOACon is being held at Goa from 21st of December to 25th of December. It's a very peak season. I know the organizing people have done a good bargain and the rooms are available between 5,000 to 25,000 depending upon which hotel you select. And you can register before 15th of September. That is on just another few days left and you will get great benefit out of the bargain our people have done. And it will be a great place to meet and interact. And we all know that now it is a, the Zoom meetings, webinars virtually is a, too much happening. And uh, we are eager to meet physically. So I request all of us, all of you to come and meet everyone physically. And I once again say this uh, CME of the Spot Hospital inaugurated and also after declaring this uh, CME open, I also wish the Spot Hospital all the very best for their future endeavors. And I thank Dr. Ramesh Babu for having me here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for your warm address. I now invite our beloved director, Mrs. Swati Siddharth, to render the vote of thanks. A very good afternoon to the dignitaries. It's my pride and pleasure to deliver this oath of thanks on the occasion of our 17th anniversary. On behalf of the staff and management of Spot Hospital, I would like to convey our modest, modest thanks to the Indian Orthopedic Association, OASIS, Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association, and Madras Orthopedic Society for letting us conduct the CME. Under that auspice, auspices, I also thank the Tamil Nadu Medical Council for recognizing our CME and sanctioning credit hours. First and foremost, I would like to sincerely thank IAO President Dr. B. Shivashankar, OASIS President Dr. Raghava Dutt, President-elect TNOA Dr. M. Vanasankar, President MOS Dr. Navaladi Shankar, Secretary General OASIS Pro Professor Dr. Anim N. Kuti, for making this inaugural function a grand success with their vibrant presence and active participation. Our heartfelt thanks to the renowned Dr. David P. Rajan of Ortho One Hospital, Coimbatore, for being the orator of third late Dr. D. Subrayan's oration. Our special thanks to the entire faculty who are the stalwarts in the field of arthroscopy, Dr. Bupesh Karthik, Dr. Billy Paul Wilson, Dr. Clement Joseph, J, Dr. Kaniraj Marimuthu, Dr. Prajwal Ganesh Sendilnathan, Dr. Ram Chidambaram, Dr. J. Srinivasan, Dr. K. N. Subra Subramaniam, Dr. S. R. Sundarajan, and Dr. Yugal Varanthani for making our CME special with your great presentations. Our special thanks to Dr. Clement Joseph J. for conceptualizing the CME program. I sincerely thank the senior members of our fraternity and delegates for their immense support for all our CMEs, CMEs whether it's physical or virtual. A special word of appreciation to the organizing team Dr. Siddharth Ramesh Babu for the smooth conduct of this inaugural session. A sincere gratitude and appreciation, Dr. Reddy's Laboratories, Arthrex for their sponsorship and Ortho TV Live for live streaming. Last but not the least, we would like to thank each and everyone who has helped us in making the CME a grand success. Thank you. Thank you very much, madam. Uh, now uh, we shall all stand up for the national anthem. Chamakana mana adi. 
भाग्य विधाता पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा द्राविड उत्कल बंगा भिंज हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उच्चल जलधि तरंगा तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाधा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे पालक भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे thank you very much sir thank you that is the end of the inaugural function we thank all the dignitaries for accepting our invitation and gracing the occasion thank you shivashankar sir thank you raghavadatt sir thank you thank sir thank you vanasegar thank you anil thank you novelty shankar thank you very much thank you sir thank you good we will day continue with our cme program now we will continue with the first session so uh, just a small announcement uh, to everybody so our uh, cme program has been accepted for mci credit hours so those who are attending can kindly send a whatsapp message to this number uh, 9176681413 please send your name your registration number to e your email address and mobile number to this number please thank you now uh, the next uh, lecture is by dr pilli paul wilson is the head of department arthroscopy knee, knee reconstruction and sports injury unit miot international chennai he is fellow fellowship trained in sport sports injuries of the knee and shoulder and knee arthroplasty he has held various positions as faculty in uh, the arthroscopic skills educational course indian arthroscopic arthroscopic society pune knee knee, knee course he also trained his uh, uh, dnb post graduates Uh, at uh, miot international he has been a faculty at uh, south yorkshire rotherham orthopedic simulation training course sheffield university and is a faculty at uh, rotherham uh, acumed upper limb fixation course since 2009 uh, sir i kindly request you to deliver your uh, talk on postlateral knee injuries Thank you, Siddharth, uh, for this kind introduction. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ramesh Babu, uh, for inviting me to this uh, your event, and uh, Dr. Clement for inviting me as well. Um, now, the postlateral corner injury was uh, considered to be the dark side of the knee for a long time due to its complex and variable anatomy, and uh, making it more perplexing and esoteric, uh, partly because of the varying nomenclature um, were applied to this region in the literature. so i would like to kind of demystify this corner for you so that you'll understand this better now the anatomy consists of various structures but to simplify it we'll kind of um, break it down into three primary structures which is the lateral or the fibular collateral ligament the popliteus tendon and the popliteal fibular ligament of course there are other smaller structures like the fibular fibular ligament the popliteal meniscal fibers the postlateral capsule which all play a role and your dynamic uh, structures like the itb and the biceps femoris now the biomechanical function of the postlateral corner is primarily to resist the dynamic and passive varus it also resists the increased uh, tibial external rotation and the hyperextension of the knee with its close relation to the anterior cruciate ligament and uh, the posterior cruciate ligament it supports as a secondary restraint for the antero posterior translation and also in the lateral meniscal instability let me start off with a small video this is one of my patients who was involved in one of his corporate uh, team building event he was never a sportsman the person who is wearing the white sleeveless vest just watch is rightly what happens 
And you can see that his knee goes into hyperextension and to various falls. And it's quite a painful injury. And he sustained um, an anterior cruciate, a posterior cruciate, and um, a post lateral corner injury. So let's come back to why we are here today. So the focus is primarily on the clinical examination. We are all kind of led by the MRI scans that the patients bring to our clinic, which often I find mislead us to the kind of uh, non-operative or operative intervention that we need to undergo. That there are four primary kind of examination that we have to be kind of focused on when we look at the postlateral corner. The first of which is the gait. So prior to starting the gait, we look at the stance. See the alignment of the coronal, the sagittal, and also a single weight bearing to see if there is any varus strain on that knee. Make the patient walk. Look at the patient from the front. Look at his gait pattern. Is there any varus thrust? Look at it from the behind as well. You get a lot of clues from that region. And look at this patient as he walks. You can see a varus thrust in his right knee. Now the varus stress test. So this is performed in full extension and at 30 degrees of flexion. Look for the opening. Often it's stable in full extension. At 30 degrees, normal people may have slight, slight laxity of grade one. Now this is a pathological knee where there is grade one laxity in full extension. And as he flex to about 30 degrees, you can see there is grade three opening. Now the external rotation requirement test, it looked at it from two planes, the sagittal as well as in the coronal plane. So lift the normal side by the big toe and you'll see that the knee either hyperextends by a few degrees and it moves in the same plane. We look at it from the coronal plane. You look at the proximal tibia, whether there is any external rotation. Here in the pathological side, you can see there is external rotation and hyperextension as compared to the other side. Now the dial test is performed with the patient in a prone position. You flex the knee to about 30 degrees and externally rotate the leg. Normally, a side-to-side -side difference should be less than 10 degrees. And this, repeat the same at 90 degrees. If there is any posterolateral corner injury or there is insufficiency, there will be an increased rotation at 30 degrees. And if associated with a posterior cruciate ligament, you get an external rotation at 90 degrees as well. So this is one such scenario where at 30 degrees, there is more than 10 degrees side-to-side -side difference and also at 90. Now in the second scenario, at 30 degrees, there is a side-to-side -side difference, but at 90, it's not. So probably this patient had an ACL injury along with a postlateral corner or an isolated postlateral corner, which is extremely rare. Now imaging is of significant value here. In an acute setting, look for these subtle signs like the arcuate sign, where you have the tip of the fibula that slightly avulse, where the popliteal fibula ligament is attached, or you can have a bit more Robust sign where you have a larger fragment that's lifted off, where you have your LCL, a popliteal fibula ligament attached with it. In the acute scenario, we can also look to see if there is a mid portion or soft tissue avulsion in MRI scans, because often on the x rays, you only see a flex sign, but clinical examination tells you that there's much more to it. In a chronic situation, it is more difficult. You have to rely predominantly on your clinical examination. The MRI scans can be misleading, but sometimes you do get pictures like this where in one scenario, you can see that the popliteus tendon is stuck to the soft tissues. And also there is a proximal LCL injury in the right image. In another scenario, you can see there's a chronic ACL injury and there is a mid portion injury of the LCL there. Stress views are of significance in a chronic sitting. So you look, do stress views on both the knees and look for a side-to-side -side difference. A less than 2.57 millimeter is normal. A grade two is 2.7 to four millimeter. And if it's more than four millimeter, there is definitely an LCL as well as a post-lateral corner injury. 
We have to assess this arthroscopically at, uh, as well. Your image on the left shows the popliteal tendon in the single um, triangle. And in the double arrow, you can see the popliteal fibula ligament. So this is how I perform my um, assessment. You go down the lateral gutter, follow the popliteus tendon into the popliteal hiatus, and you can follow it all the way down. And as you move into the lateral compartment, you can see that almost in full extension, you can see some opening. And as you flex the knee to a figure of four, there is a significant drive through sign there. You can go all the way to the post lateral compartment. This suggests that there is a significant post lateral corner injury. Now, what is our treatment objective? We can't treat and recreate every structure that uh, nature has provided us, but at least we have to pay attention to the top three, which is the lateral collateral ligament, the popliteal fibula ligament, and the popliteus, which we are converting from a dynamic to a static structure when we reconstruct. What are the treatment options? In an acute situation, if it's an avulsion injury, you can use bone anchors to reattach the soft tissues. Or if it's a bony avulsion, you have to include a tension band, which is more robust. With the soft tissue reattachment or repair, I always try to augment it because the repairs are not always robust. In a mid-substance tear, you repair and reconstruct. And in a chronic situation, you always reconstruct. My treatment algorithm is very simple. Based on the, the virus stress or the LCL injury, if it's a grade one, we can operate it. We can treat them non-operatively. If it's a grade two, isolate it. In a high demand patient or in an avulsion injury, you always do a primary repair. If it's not, you can treat it non-operatively again. When you have a grade two with a combined injury or a grade three with an ACL or a PCN involved, in an acute situation, which is less than three weeks, it's always better to do a primary repair and augment it. If it's a chronic more than three weeks, look at the alignment. If it's a varus malalignment, then an osteotomy is added as an additional procedure. And you'd often be surprised that the opening osteotomy alone can exclude a PLC reconstruction because the patient comes back and tells us the knee is more stable. If there is no malalignment, you can go straight for a PLC reconstruction. So these are some examples. So here you have a bony avulsion, which has been fixed with the tension band wire. When you do the tension band wiring, be aware of the Peroneal, uh, the common peroneal nerve that runs close to the neck, isolate it before you fix it. Otherwise you can injure it. Reconstruction techniques are plenty, but these are the top three that has been routinely used. If you have a primary varus, then you use a Larsen's technique. If there is a primary rotational instability, a modified Larsen. And if you have a combined varus and rotational with a severe injury, use a Lepra technique. I'll take you through a few cases now. So this is one where the primary injury was with the LCL. So just a simple Larsen's would do, which is a fibula-based reconstruction, you make a tunnel in the fibula proximally, and then you reroute those tendons uh, to the um, origin of the lateral femoral, uh, the uh, lateral collateral ligament. Now in a modified Larsen's, what do we do? So this is an arthroscopic view showing that there's significant opening. So here it is again a fibula based reconstruction. So you make a tunnel in the fibula, use a semitendinosus graft, and the various steps include creating the tunnel first from the anteroposterior to posteromedial, anterolateral to posteromedial. Then you find the landmarks for your LCL footprint as well as the popliteus, which is about 18.5 millimeters uh, anterior to it. And then you drill the corresponding holes and make sure that your Popliteus uh, structure is deeper to the LCL, which runs in a crisscross fashion. Now, post reconstruction, this is what your arthroscopic view should show. Now, this is an acute situation where the patient has had an ACL injury along with a postlateral corner injury. You can see the Lachman's test being performed there, and it's a grade two. And when you do a varus stress in full extension, about grade one to two, and the 30 degrees is about grade three. Again, the arthroscopic assessment shows that there is a mid-portion ACL tear. You can go all the way to the postlateral compartment, which suggests that, that uh, the postlateral corner is injured. The lateral mens is kind of floating there. In an acute situation, you're running against time. So you clear the hematoma as quickly as possible. 
and get on with your intraarticular reconstruction prior to moving into the extraarticular. In the when you do the exposure for the postlateral corner, you have to identify all the structures. Where it is avulsed from, is it a mid portion? Identify the LCL, which is a good landmark to reach the uh, lateral epicondyle and the footprint. Isolate the common peroneal nerve. And here you can see that the common peroneal is edematous. And in acute setting, the common peroneal nerve does move away with the biceps femoris. Now the various steps again include here, the tunnels are uh, done first for the fibula. Then you repair the lateral collateral ligament and the other structures with an anchor in the proximal fibula. Identify the landmarks in the distal femur for your popliteus and the uh, LCL. Place the nitinol wires. You tension the graft for th at full extension for the uh, lateral at uh, 30 degrees for the lateral collateral ligament and at 70 degrees with neutral rotation for your popliteus. So this is the end result that you see when you. If you do a primary repair, just make sure that you don't stress it too much because your repair can sometimes fail. And the Laprat's technique is used when you have severe lateral sided injury. This is uh, a, a quite uh, time consuming as well as you need uh, significant graft material. So this is a tibia and fibula based um, reconstruction where the graft is passed from anterior to posterior at the tibia and one limb is brought out as a popliteus and the other limb forms a popliteal fibular and comes back as a lateral uh, collateral ligament. And that's what I have done here. The rehabilitation is important. I keep them non-weight bearing for six weeks and you start on passive knee ROM zero to 90 degrees. And based on whether it's an ACL or a PCL based injury, you can do either a prone or supine. Then active range of movement is again based on the concomitant injuries and other procedures done. You can start low impact exercises at 12 weeks and aim for full strength by about six months. And to sum it up, do not ignore the postlateral corner, the importance of the anatomy and the biomechanical role, the timely diagnosis and surgical intervention to prevent a sustained instability or a cruciate reconstruction failure leading on to an accelerated OA. Thank you very much. And this is one of my patients. This is a four month follow-up, actually a six month follow-up and he's able to walk very well. Thank you. Over to Dr. Clement Joseph. Thanks, Billy, for a very clear demonstration. And there is a question actually by Dr. Ramesh Babu, sir. Can you elaborate more on the relevance of dial test at 30 degree and 90 degree angles? Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> so. The, the primary external rotation restrained at 30 degrees is your postlateral corner. So when you keep the patient prone and you externally rotate at 30 degrees and there is a 10 degree side to side difference, it means definitely there's a postlateral corner injury. When you bring the knee to about 90 degrees and if there is still presence of the external rotation, then you have alongside the postlateral corner injury, you have a piece I think we have lost uh, Billy Paul, sir, due to bad connection. Yeah, uh, uh, what Billy was trying to say is that 30 degree, the PLC is, is shown. Uh, you know, the, for a dial test to be positive, the difference uh, from the side to side thigh foot angle should be more than 10 degree. Up to 7 degree variation is accepted as normal. And uh, it can be done supine as well as in prone. If you're doing supine, one of your resistance should support the thigh, keeping both the knees together. Uh, and then you should perform the thigh foot angle measurement. Uh, any other questions, Siddharth, from the chat? Uh, from the uh, live chat, this was the only I'm one. Done, sir. Uh, sir, I do have a, another question. I mean, this is to all the faculty. So unexplained... Uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Billy has joined now. Dr. Billy, do you want to add anything to that? 
Um, sorry for that. So there was a power failure at home. Um, uh, uh, so, so it's basically it's um, uh, if you got a PCL and PLC, you have an external rotation seen at 90 as well as at 30 degrees. If it's an isolated PLC along with an ACL injury, you see it only at 30 and you don't see it at 90 degrees. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, my, uh, my other question is to all the faculties. If anyone can answer, it would be beneficial to me. So unexplained causes of knee pain after ruling out uh, the hip, the referred pain or radiating pain, uh, and uh, you're not having any conclusive findings in your uh, examination and in the MRI as well. Uh, what is your approach and uh, how do you uh, uh, counsel the patient? Uh, Siddharth? Yes, sir. Is there anybody offering anything? Otherwise, I'll contribute some. You know, one of the reasons of unexplained pain, as I told you, could be the petrofemoral causes. And of course, you have to rule out your neurology and other things. And I've seen patients uh, with pain, but whatever compression tests you do in the petal, grinding tests you do, taping, I mean, uh, it may be negative. Uh, some cases are relieved by taping. What I do is to confirm the intraarticular origin of uh, the pain. Sometimes I give a local installation into the joint and then reassess the patient. And some cases which I found uh, knee and leg pain have come from a foraminal uh, disc, uh, far lateral disc prolapse. And typically these patients have a lot more pain on lying down flat. So th that is one uh, unusual cause of uh, knee and leg pain, which I found out. And second common, uh, and another cause which you have to be aware of is a popliteal artery entrapment. And these pe people also have typically activity related knee pain and upper calf pain located mostly uh, posteriorly and very important thing uh, Siddharth you'll be seeing in few days I give a lot of injections to the postlateral aspect of knee the one of the un unexplained reasons uh, causes of knee pain is what I call is postlateral knee pain when you make the patient lie down and examine exactly in the posterior uh, crease of the knee just adjacent to the uh, fabella okay in the ar around the insertional hamstring you'll find a particular tender spot so we've been documenting myself and Yugal has been documenting all these injections. We have taken videos. And uh, this is one of the causes because we are always examining from the front. You palpate the joint line, it is normal. You palpate the patella is normal. But you take an effort to flip the patient, make them supine. And this is particular spot is one of the reasons for pain. So far, we are given some 15 injections into the spot there. It will be close to the common perineal nerve. In thin patients, you'll be able to feel it. But just inject that area with the local uh, steroid. Uh, I term it as some form of capsulitis or a hamstring tendonitis. I don't know what it is, basically. I've been looking up in the literature. I was able to find out only one case uh, report from uh, Andy Williams in UK. He notes this pain to come from uh, post-ACL reconstructed patients. And he treats them with injection to that part of the knee. So, so these are the common cases of unexplained knee pain. Sir, would you like to add anything, sir? I have not analyzed those cases. I totally agree with you. There are many people who complain of pain posteriorly. We may be looking anteriorly, but they will have pain posteriorly. And as you have correctly said, after ruling out uh, the referred pain, we have to rule out uh, any local causes. Uh, if there are uh, no more questions, uh, I like to uh, I thank uh, Dr. Srinivasan sir and Dr. Clement Joseph for uh, chairing the uh, first session. So we are going to move on to the second session. I request Dr. Bhupesh Karthik and Ram Chidambaram sir to uh, coordinate the next uh, session. So again, just the same, same announcement. Uh, if, you, uh, if you are attending, please send these details to this number. So uh, our first talk is by Dr. K. N. Subramaniam, sir. He is the clinical director at Vale Hospital and a senior consultant orthopedic surgeon at Vale Amal Medical College. 
uh, he has uh, uh, had many positions uh, bec member uh, shoulder and elbow society of india immediate past president tamil nadu arthroscopic society past secretary madras or uh, madurai orthopedic society uh, associate vice president of madurai district uh, football association he has numerous publications has been a faculty in ioa tnoa ias and many other learned societies he has conducted annual arthroscopy conference cons consecutively for 6 years he has written chapters on shoulder injuries and volleyball dis uh, volleyball and disorders of shoulder editor miniachi uh, over to you sir uh, for your talk on clinical and arthroscopic correlation in shoulder instability mm, sir is here Sir, you are on mute. Am I, am I audible now? Yes, sir. Okay, let me go to the share screen mode. Can you see the screen now? Sir, we can sir. see, sir. We can see, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramesh Babu, sir, for inviting me for this lecture. Um, your focus theme is very nice. I'm happy with that. Clinical and arthroscopic correlation, I always thought about it. Because when you do clinical examination, you should think about treatment also. So, there's an excellent theme that we have selected. And uh, my topic is I'm going to be on shoulder instability. So, let me start with this proverb. Eyes can't see if the mind can't think. So, when I do examination clinically, then I should be really thinking about what I will be seeing arthroscopically. So, if we have that mind in the, then automatically we will not miss any pathology also. So, keep thinking of pathology of the shoulder all the time when you are doing clinical assessment. That is the most important thing. I am not going to tell about routine clinical examination. I will tell only a few of those and I am going to tell about the things that we can miss out. That's what I am going to focus on in this one. So, in shoulder pathology that we are going to think about glenoid labral pathology. It can be anterior labrum, posterior labrum or superior labrum and there can be associated rotator cuff problem also. We always think about shoulder dislocation. There are things beyond shoulder dislocation also, which I want to highlight some of them today. So, this is a very basic slide for the PGs. Stability of the shoulder is determined by static stabilizer and dynamic stabilizer. So, when there is a dislocation, either of these or both structures will fail, which means either a glenohumeral ligament complex is failed or rotator cuff is failed, or both can also fail, depending on the age group. Somebody younger age group will have static stabilizer problem, old age, age group will have rotator cuff problem, or some of them will have both problem also. So, lateral pathology can be anterior labrum, posterior labrum, or it can be multidirectional, or the one that is occurring over the superior uh, lateral which is biceps attachment is called slap lesions. So, in the history is very important for me. Because age group is very important. Around the 20 to 30, usually they have instability problem. Around 40 to 60 is a cuff related problem. And more than 60 is arthritis, occupation and sport, what type of sport they are doing, history of prior injury, how many times they are dislocated in the past, history of any systemic inflammatory disease. And feels like dead arm while throwing is a very important clinical uh, history that tells me about some diagnosis. So, as we know, that we always go with look, feel, move and special tests. I'm not going to go about look, feel, move and all. I'll just go into the special test. So, special test that we are focusing on when you are thinking about uh, shoulder instability, the anterior apprehension test, which is where how you do it by keeping the shoulder up that and an external rotator, 90 degree, and try to do with extreme external rotation, the patient will develop pain anteriorly. And try to push the shoulder back in position, the pain will disappear. That's called relocation test. And you can do more external rotation and leave the shoulder back, you will have sudden pain. That's called release test. So, these are the three tests, anterior apprehension test, relocation test, and surprise test or release test. So, just see this video. So, this patient, I'm doing anterior apprehension test by doing upper section, now you're getting pain. Trying to push the shoulder back, the pain goes away. I can do more external rotation and leave the shoulder, the pain suddenly comes back. This is called release test. If all the three are positive, then the sensitivity and specificity is almost more than 90%. So we see this interesting paper, which has taken all the tests uh, in together, published in JACS in 2013, study from Netherlands. Here, apprehension relocation test has 50%. And release test together, all the three putting together, it gives more than 90% sensitivity. 
So investigation of choice will be X-ray and CT and MRI. And CT scan is the must if you don't have a good MRI because CT scan will tell about bony bank condition. So usually they throw with the big number of pictures. What you need to see in the MRI is uh, you have to look into this uh, axial cuts. So the one on the right side has got no lateral tear, as you can see over there. Fibrocartilage always looks black in MRI, which means low signal in MRI. If there is a tear, as you can see over there, there will be high signal coming over the fibrocartilage area, which means there is a tear. This is a kind of alpha type of lesion, anterior lateral tear, this one. Similarly, next thing I will look into here, face on view, end on face view. This is the MRI sagittal picture. The one on the right side, this has got a linear lateral tear. The left side is an intact lesion. There is no, there is no tear at all. So anterior inferior lateral tear, there is also a rim of bone also broken over this bony banker. So these are the two cuts that I am important to see on the sagittal view and axial view. This gives a much more information for me about how to deal with this. So in adolescent, the patient comes in adolescent age group, think about this lesion called alpha lesion, anterior labral periastasis sleeve aversion, which means this labrum actually has gone far behind the medial glenoid margin and it's got far dig over to the medial glenoid margin. This is typical anterior labral periosteal sleeve avulsion, which is common in the age group of around 15 to 21, adolescent age group. And if you don't have the thinking of that in your mind, you will miss it. Sometimes the MRI report may not be as accurate. If you, some, sometimes you can also miss the alpha lesion if you are only seeing from the posterior portal. You have to view this from the anterior portal, then only you will not miss it. So next, coming to the posterior instability, there are three tests for posterior instability, posterior load and shift test, jerk test, or posterior apprehension test. If you put all the three tests together, the sensitivity is much more higher. In neutral rotation, slight abduction, and load humeral head, in posterior direction, the patient will have pain. And in the jerk test, elbow 90 degree flexion, and shoulder internal rotation give posterior directed force. A jerk can be felt if there is a posterior inferior labral tear. And similarly, pain on posterior directed force with the elbow in internal rotation uh, is 90 degree, the pain will be there in the posterior aspirate shoulder as a posterior apprehension test. A typical finding that you see in the arthroscopy is this is a posterior inferior part of the labrum, is around uh, 7 o'clock or about 8 o'clock, posterior labrum is ruptured. These patients do not present with instability. A lot of the time they will present with pain only. So somebody coming with an electric shock, they might have a proper dislocation. These are the players, volleyball players, basketball players, who come with the GIRD type of symptom and they get posterior inferior labral tear. They will not have dislocation, they will only have pain. And you think about posterior inferior labral tear, the tear will be around 9 o'clock or 8 o'clock position typically. And somebody coming with dislocation, also having severe pain or having overhand stress positive. Overhand stress is something where you try to keep the arm in 90 degree flexion and do adduction about 15 degree and do pronation and do force against resistance, they will have pain. Once you supinate, the pain will disappear. So along with anterior apprehension test, so the patient also has got overhand stress positive. And it means that you are not just dealing with anterior labral tear. It might be the tear that is extending towards the superior labral also. As this patient is a under sports player who has got anterior dislocation, but he also has got overhand stress positive. So in pronation, he is having pain, and in supination, the pain disappears. So that is a typical of patient who is having a slap pile lesion. This is slap pile lesion, where you can see that superior labrum is ruptured over there. Not only superior labrum is ruptured, there is also anterior labrum rupture also. There is a reason for dislocation, and there is a reason for biceps pain also. So this you can identify clinically itself. And you have to address both pathology together. If you only address anterior labrum pathology, then the patient will end up with pain post-operatively. So remember, you have to be keen on clinical examination to identify whether you are not missing these kind of lesions. The next you see this lady. This lady has got pain. This is called crank test. Where you abduct the arm 90 to 120, elbow secure elbow in one hand, actually load it and do rotation. And they have pain. And if they have pain, then they are having superior labral tear. This 45-year-old lady is not having shoulder dislocation, but she's having pain in the shoulder joint on doing rotation movements. The MRI shows a partial cup there, but when you go inside, you see this is the biceps attachment. The biceps is peeled off from that area. So they are having not only the rotator cuff problem, they are also having a biceps pathology. So if you see the rotator cuff is also ruptured over there. So rotator cuff tear along with the biceps pathology, 
they can present with a mixture of finding they will have a crank test positive or a vobrin test positive along with the impingement positive also so remember to do all these tests clinically itself so that you will not miss them arthroscopically but this is one we did biceps anatomy and did in this patient also had a posterior superior lateral tear also so these are things which you unless you think about you will not you will miss it so this patient had a fall yes, while so so going of going of the ladder abhi iske haath se madad le kar le he has got a drop on test positive along with anterior appendicular test positive he also has got drop on test positive so abhi jaake jaake le jao He is not only having a shoulder Achha. anterior labral tear, he may be having problem with rotator cuff also. Achha. It is unusual type, but if you miss it clinically, you will not find it also. So have a, have a look at this uh, arthroscopic picture. He has got a labral tear, anterior labral rupture. It is uh, due to anterior shoulder dislocation. But not only that, I have done the labral repair, but he also has got a rotator cuff tear also. That's why he is having the loss of abduction. He is having anterior appendicular positive and also drop on this positive. So typically they are having anterior labral tear, the scuff tear. So I had to repair both to get the uh, uh, good outcome of the patient. So pain the dominating feature than instability. For example, some of the patients come with anterior dislocation. One or only two or three times they dislocated, but they complain a lot of pain. They are having a lot of pain, and it means they are having some condyle damage. As you can see, this patient. has got a big chondral damage anterior chondral damage is there the chondrum has totally peeled off and the whole labrum is not that bad is desiccated labrum but there is a big chondral damage they have more pain than instability so somebody is complaining of excessive pain than instability then you should think not just a labral pathal there may be a chondral damage or there can there can be a bony banker also so this is something it's a take home message so somebody has mid range instability So you may you may come across patient coming with dislocation at 60 degree abduction itself. They don't dislocate at this position. They will dislocate even at 60 degree itself, which means they are having a big bony lesion, either a bony banker or the tear may be extending beyond six o'clock. So if you have that eye in the mind that uh, that this patient is dislocating at mid range itself, like 60 degree abduction itself, then it means that they are having a big bony lesion or there may be that the tear is extending beyond six o'clock. That is mid range instability. Always look for multi-directional laxity. Check for lateral dislocation in all the patients who are coming with the shoulder dislocation. And uh, if they are having lax shoulder, then the shoulder arthroscopy may be easy, but the outcome may not be as good because their tissues are not normal. And uh, look at this patient who has got multi-directional laxity. He is a habitual dislocator. Never ever operate on this patient. He only needs rehab. He can dislocate by himself. His sulcus sign is positive. Never ever operate on this patient. Only do rehab. So you are going to have a doom of failure if you, if you go and operate on this patient. This is something is a take home. This one. Never operate on patient who is having multi-directional instability. Number of dislocation is that important? For example, you come across patient coming with two dislocation. Some some of them come across a thirty dislocation. We have done an interesting observation. We already published this article in uh, Journal of Orthopedics. Where arthroscopic nomenclature of capsular labral appearance in anterior shoulder dislocation is done along with Prajol, who was my fellow before. And here, what we have done is we have studied on, uh, for a duration of 18 months. We have observed patients coming with primary traumatic dislocation. We excluded all the patients who are ligamentously lax, multi-directional instability, and bony banker more than 10 percent, associated slap lesion, and we classified labrum appearance like normal labrum, desiccated labrum, or shredded labrum. and capsule as normal or deformed capsule and we found out those who are in less number of dislocation will have a near normal appearance of labrum and capsule those who are having like five dislocation damaged capsule and normal labrum and those who are having like 10 dislocation they will have damaged labrum and capsule is either normal or maybe deformed also and those who are having very high number of more than 15 or more than 20 dislocation they will have labrum morphology becomes very much altered and capsule can be either normal or deformed So this through our study we we did on 108 patients where a lot of them were males and age group was less than 20 year old and the 21 to 40 year old and right shoulder was 63 percent and left shoulder was 37 percent and we did statistical analysis and we found out uh, this uh, inference of our study is uh, there is an association between the number of dislocation and how the capsule and labrum appears. The inference of the study is that if we have more number of dislocation, there is going to be more chance of labral morphology alteration. And now the patients where the surgery was done at the first dislocation had capsular damage. Though the number was small, 
So if somebody gets operated at the early time itself, like second dislocation or third dislocation itself, the capsule will be almost normal and the labrum will not have very altered morphology. Capsular damage is common after five dislocations invariably. More the dislocation, there is going to be alteration of labral morphology and also the capsule. So the possibility of repairing anatomically may become impossible because you have lost the labral anatomy and the capsular anatomy. So that's something which is a take home message. The more the number of dislocation, there will be severe damage to the labrum and capsule. So interestingly, we have to ask how many number of dislocation has happened to the patient. And uh, if there are more dislocation, then assume that labor is not going to be normal also. So take home message, these are the few take home ones which I put together for this uh, particular interesting theme, which is a clinical arthroscopic correlation. Adolescent age means think of valve dilation. Somebody is having mid-range instability, think about a big bony banker or a tear extending beyond a, a inferior uh, capsule, like uh, even beyond six o'clock position. If somebody is having pain more than instability, think about condyle damage and bony banker and do test for slap lesion, rotator cuff pathology to identify associated lesions like slap lesion or a partial cuff tear. Posterior labral tear doesn't always present with dislocation. They may have presenting with pain posteriorly and they can present with a dead arm while throwing, the, throwing a ball. And do laxity test in all. Certain laxity means that will be capacious. And multidirectional laxity don't operate on this patient. To summarize, age, history, special tests can almost pinpoint the diagnosis. If your eyes are open, definitely you will find out the diagnosis in clinical, clinical examination itself. Variations in labral appearance and associated injuries can be thought of from the history and clinical examination itself. MRA and CT will add up for your diagnosis. They are not the one to diagnose. They are only to add up what your findings clinically. Arthroscopy will be the final answer for you. So again, I want to find, finish, finish off with this proverb. Eyes can't see the mind can't think. Keep thinking of pathologies in the soul when you are doing clinical examination. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Um, Dr. Bhupesh? Sir, yes, sir. You want to interact? I think Prajwal has got a question. Sir, uh, post uh, bank arts repair, I mean, I got a patient from Dan elsewhere. Uh, three months post bank arts repair, uh, he says the he feels the arm is uh, uh, drooping, but uh, no history of uh, dislocation after surgery. Is it uh, good to proceed with uh, RJ or uh, wait and uh, do physio? Mr. Only three months is a very early time to come to a decision. Because, uh, I mean, uh, if somebody is having drooping, mean drooping is a different symptom. The sense drooping can occur due to not only due to labral problems, maybe due to muscle dyskinesia also. Somebody is having deltoid weakness or anyone having nerve pathologies like brachial plexus problem, they can have drooping. So we need to make sure that we are not missing that kind of thing. So maybe do a nerve conduction test also to assess we are not missing any nerve problems. And then are they ligamentous relaxed? If they are ligamentous relaxed, then uh, they can have a slightly drooping problem also. And the other thing to think about in the mind is uh, during the surgery, I don't know who was the index surgeon, what was the finding? Whether the tear was extending beyond 6 o'clock. If the tear was extending beyond 6 o'clock, uh, then I have the address at that time. And then was there any presence of bony lesion also? There is no bony lesion, then there is no reason for doing a lethargy at all. Because if there is no bony lesion... Sure. They have not done the remplissage. They have just, uh, the bony lesion is visible on his first MRI, but uh, they have not done it. Okay, so bony lesion, if it is, uh, then we have to, if there is a bony, we have to quantify it. Is how big is it? Is it something uh, which can be addressed like less than 10% lesion means, obviously you can manage with the uh, soft tissue repair itself. If there is beyond that and it has been missed, then probably you should give a warning to the patient Then he might need a lethargy at a later stage. If it is like more than 20% lesion, then you should give a warning to the patient now itself. Uh, we have no, a question. Uh, uh, can I add, uh, Siddharth, one second? Yes, sir, please. Sir. Uh, no, Dr. Prajwal, this is a scenario where you have to do some imaging. You know, a repeat MRI will tell us the position of anchors, and if there is bone loss, it can be quantified like uh, how Dr. Uh, K.N. has said. So we have to know uh, also what is happening inside the shoulder because three months post-operative with little bit of pain and the patient is already apprehensive, you might not be able to get a lot of clinical detail. So this is a place where there is a role for MRI to assess what is happening. Sometimes uh, uh, drooping most probably will be 
as uh, mentioned because of uh, delta daytony and with proper rehab it will become better is there any uh, any technique that uh, the patient wants to remove the screw 1.8 mm anchors they have put no we cannot remove the 1.8 mm anchors what anchor is that is it metal anchor or metal anchors metal anchors metal anchor very difficult to take i mean uh, i mean we have to explain to the patient counsel the patient that they don't doesn't need removing and if the metal is crowding out for example is causing control damage then we should think about removing it removing it, i have done removal of screws uh, few times but you have to go till around and make the hole bigger and then take the implant out or you can actually try to use this what anchor has been used try to find the same holding device and try to insert it through that and try to unlock it it is possible not possible is not very easy not possible in all situation but i have done like that also it is possible in occasional these are the only ways you can remove it but doing a metal work removal is actually is will cause a lot of control damage also remember uh, that doctor dr prajwal this is the <laughs> this is the most important reason why i said you should do imaging uh, keeping what you are saying in mind because sometimes proud anchors can also cause little bit of pain and the patient can droop because of pain Uh, that is why i mentioned that imaging is necessary uh, the other uh, tip is if you are not able to remove it sometimes you can uh, with a uh, uh, all you can tap it inside and push it uh, subcondrally in worst case scenario because it cannot be left proud so we have to think of ways to salvage the scenario thank you sir thank you sir uh, we have a question uh, what is the difference between kim test and jerk test for posterior instability kim test is uh, more for a posterior inferior labral type of lesion okay and the posterior instability is what we are discussing here is like a jerk test or something that is more for a posterior inferior type of lesion so there is a slight difference between uh, uh, what we are assessing for okay sir uh, yeah, uh, just one question i do have uh, regarding first dislocators so uh, i have seen and prajul also tells me that i should evaluate uh, first dislocators as well uh, but uh, i have been trained that uh, generally we uh, reduce the first dislocation and just uh, for 3 weeks keep them in the immobilizer and uh, see how they are doing uh, what is your thought process uh, regarding that sir uh, the, this is first time dislocator is yes, you have to identify what age group these patients are they are younger age group like 20 year old and there somebody who is coming around 50 year old there is a big difference between okay 20 year old you need to give special attention to them because uh, you might have to explain and counsel to the patient about chance of recurrence of dislocation a chance of recurrence around 80 to 90% when they have a, uh, when around that age group and if they are like that i would actually counsel the patient for doing further investigation like mri or ct scan whichever is your choice okay and uh, ct is more important than uh, doing mri to see whether uh, is there any bone lesion so if there is a bone lesion then you have to address the same time itself huh? um, and a lot of the times you don't need to immobilize at all the immobilization is like 3 weeks just for pain relief for comfort sake only it has not so any difference whether you immobilize or not it is just i put arm sling for 2 or 3 weeks but you can counsel the patient and some of the patients do accept for surgery then you go on proceed okay because they are coming in the 80% category where there is recurrence of dislocation and you will definitely find a pathology inside unless they are a ligamentously lax individual if they are first time dislocated traumatic dislocation they will definitely find a pathology inside like a banker lesion along with the hillsack lesion or there will be definitely there will be a pathology inside you can go and address sir and uh, the real scenario i am talking about practical scenario most of the patients don't accept for surgery in first time dislocation so you tell them counsel them and uh, uh, tell all the outcomes and all and you go operate to the next time they come for second dislocation if they are accepting for surgery in a younger age group i will proceed with that Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, Bupe, sir, uh, I don't think there are any other questions. Uh, can I add one thing uh, to what Dr. K N has said just now, Dr. Kaniraj here? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, there was one uh, interesting uh, paper by uh, Sugaya, in which he has said at four to six weeks, the first time dislocator, you see them clinically at four to six weeks after the dislocation, you do an apprehension. If the apprehension is positive. then that is a definitive indication for further evaluation 
that indicates that there is a persisting structural abnormality that makes the patient uh, more prone for developing further uh, episodes of instability. If at four to six weeks you do a clinical examination and the patient does not have an apprehension positive, then maybe you can wait, just do a rehab and then uh, you need not uh, investigate him further. In an young patient, uh, definitely at 20 year old, you will definitely do investigate and then see. If it is somewhere around 25, 30, and then uh, you are like thinking whether there is going to be a dislocation or not. I think clinical uh, examination at four to six weeks based on apprehension, I think we can go ahead whether to investigate him with an MRI or not. I think uh, I agree with you because around the four to six weeks time, if it is going to heal, for example, it might have healed. That's why the, the rationale behind doing that apprehension test is uh, if they are healing, then probably apprehension should have become negative. Yes. If it's not healing, then uh, or if it is healing, usually they will heal, but heal in the wrong position. Yes. Uh, also, then what we have observed during arthroscopy is they do not heal anatomically. They heal at a uh, mal, mal, mal union where it occurs in the medial aspect of the glenoid like that. So then they will develop anterior operation positive. So I agree with what you are saying. Okay, so if there are no more uh, questions, so uh, K and Subramanian sir, thank you very much. Uh, is there anyone available to uh, honor you with the shawl and memento, sir? Thank you. Um, I mean, uh, <laughs> I got it. Thank you. I mean, thank you for giving the memento. It came three days ago itself. Sorry, it's not with me right now. Right now in my hand. Okay, it's at, it's at home. <laughs> sure, sir. At your home, please uh, ask someone to uh, honor you on our behalf as well, sir. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Uh, sir, we did not uh, do uh, honor uh, Billy Paul. Uh, Billy Paul, sir, are you available? I'm there. Thank you. I got my shawl ready as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, sir, for uh, for attending, our, for uh, being a faculty at our program. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Professor. Your CME doesn't look like virtual. It looks like real CME. <laughs> Inauguration with national anthem was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, sir, we're going to move on to the next uh, uh, part of our agenda. So, uh, it, yeah, so with a lot of pride and privilege, I am introducing uh, Dr. Bupesh Karthik, sir, who has been uh, my mentor uh, at uh, uh, Ramachandra when I was doing my post-graduation. He also taught me a lot and uh, scolded me a lot a little uh, scolded me a little so uh, 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 so it's a, a lot of privilege for me to introduce you sir sir is the executive director and consultant orthopedic surgeon at sbs hospital hosur so uh, he has various positions uh, he has been an organizing secretary at uh, 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 tamil nadu orthopedic arthroscopy society for, for from jan 2021 reviewer at indian journal of orthopedics Managing Committee Member of Shoulder and Elbow Society of India, Tamil Nadu Chapter, Ex-Governing Council Member of Indian Arthroscopy Society 2019-2021, to Course <coughs> Coordinator for Indian Arthroscopy Society, Accredited Kadava Course, Convener Arthroscopy Registry for Indian Arthroscopy Society. He has performed a number of live surgical demonstrations and delivered lectures in various state and national conferences. He's also delivered uh, lectures and demo surgeries at uh, Croxley Park, Watford, United Kingdom. Bupe, sir, I invite you to uh, uh, give your talk on clinical and radiology-based discussion making in rotator cuff. Um, thank you uh, so much, uh, Siddharth, for the kind uh, introduction. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, my teacher, uh, Professor Ramesh Babu, uh, Siddharth, and uh, uh, Dr. Clement Joseph for inviting me here and uh, uh, SRB sir uh, uh, is a great teacher and I'm honored to be here in a CME and this I think it is the second uh, spot hospital uh, CME was on shoulder if I remember and uh, that was uh, the one of the CME which uh, uh, kind of nudged me to uh, you know take shoulder as a specialty and uh, uh, try and learn more shoulder thank you for that uh, Ramesh Babu sir Siddharth, am I audible? Can I continue? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Yeah. So this talk is on uh, clinical and radiology-based decision-making in rotator cuff tears. 
I have color coded the three symptoms of rotator cuff pathology. You will have pain, there is a loss of strength, and sometimes there is a stiffness. So, if you take this scenario, case one is a middle aged man. He has a painful arc. When the shoulder is coming down, he will pass for a second with pain and then come down. These patients will usually have an impingement sign positive or an empty can sign positive. There is minimal loss of strength and absolutely no stiffness. So, this clinical scenario might fit in into one of these three radiological scenarios. The first is just a supraspine tendinitis. The second is called a pasta lesion, which means there is part, partial articular surface supraspinatus tendon avulsion. And you can see here that there is an articular surface tear, but bursal side there is continuation. And the opposite of that is the bursal side tear, where there is a bursal side hyperintensity, but articular side is continuous. It will fall, this scenario, clinical scenario will fall into one of the three. And if it is supraspine tendinitis, all that is required is uh, conservative management and maybe a hydrocortisone injection in the subacromial uh, region under ultrasound guidance, preferably. If all that fails, very rarely, patient will end up having a subacromial decompression done by arthroscopic technique. And uh, you will go and remove the uh, pointing acromion and remove the spurs so that there is enough space in the subacromial region for him to be normal. The second radiological scenario in clinical scenario one is the partial articular sided supraspinatus tendon avulsion. These usually happen in young patients uh, and they are usually post-traumatic. Because this is on the articular side, you do a glenohumeral arthroscopy, identify the lesion, put a proline stitch, and then go back into the uh, bursal side, do a tear completion, and you can repair using uh, fiber wire. You can do a medial repair and a lateral repair or a single lateral row repair in the small lesions. And usually they have a robust repair and they do well if tear completion and good repair is done. This is a lateral row anchor going in. And this is the treatment for pasta lesion when conservative treatment fails. The third scenario radiologically is the bursal sided tear. Again, when conservative management fails, you usually go in directly into the bursal side after doing a quick uh, uh, evaluation, of course, identify the tear and do a side to side repair or a tear completion and repair. We go to scenario two clinically, and you can see that this patient doesn't have much pain. There is mild pain, but there is a drop arm positive. He has no control over his arm. There is severe loss of strength, but passive movement is full and actively it is restricted. And these are your typical full thickness supraspinatus tears. These can be moderate size uh, to large sizes. And the treatment for this is either a single row arthroscopic repair or a double row arthroscopic repair. When we do single row, we prepare the greater tuberosity, that is the tear of the supraspinatus. You release the tendon adequately so that there is tension-free reduction, which is very important for any tendon repair. And you put in your anchors in the footprint, take two sutures through the tendon, through this retrograde passing device in a mattress fashion. And you take one more suture in between these two mattress sutures, medial to these, first tie the two medial sutures in the mattress fashion and then the simple suture behind it. So two anchors are made and then this is how a single row repair looks like. And when a double row repair is done for these cases, you first place a medial row anchor. This is an all going into the footprint very close to the articular surface. And then these are vented anchors, bioabsorbable and peak are available. So you put in a medial anchor and then take mattress bites with a retrograde passing device or a device of your choice through the supraspinatus tendon, make few medial knots and then take all these knots to the lateral aspect of the humeral head this is the lateral aspect of the humeral head. Clear the bursal tissue there and then 
plays a lateral row not less anchor in the lateral aspect this acts as the double row transosseous equivalent repair and these are very stable repairs biomechanically and patients usually do well with good rehab the third scenario is a little elderly lady these are usually post traumatic but then they wait on it for some time and because of pain they develop stiffness as you can see there is severe loss of passive external rotation and these patients have severe pain due to severe pain assessment of strength is diff difficult but the hallmark here is passive external rotation with the arm of by the side of the body is restricted and this is cuff tear with secondary adhesive capsulitis i will not uh, go in detail about this because dr kaniraj will be talking the treatment options are to treat the adhesive capsulitis conservatively followed by rotator cuff repair or directly go in and do an arthroscopic capsular release with the rotator cuff repair the fourth scenario is patients like this he has both passive and active movements full there is mild to moderate pain minimal loss of strength but if you see this uh, mri there is a very big rotator cuff tear with loss of uh, muscle mass also so this is a compensated shoulder and decision making in these scenarios become difficult so talking about decision making first we have to classify these tears so that we can plan uh, treatment options we have seen a number of classification systems in our textbooks and uh, the most commonly followed classification is the cofield classification based on the size of the tear but we all know that we are all different 1 cm tear for the first lady is not same as the 1 cm tear for the second uh, for the last lady here so in mri patty's classification became very popular it is based on the cuff retraction in the frontal plane if the stump of the supraspinatus is at the bony insertion at stage 1 if the stump is at the level of the humeral head at stage 2 and if it is retracted beyond the glenoid at stage 3 the same classification little modified is an uh, arthroscopic uh, technique when you arthroscopically visualize uh, the stump in the footprint it is kim classification type a if it is between the footprint and the equator of the humeral head it is type b if it is between the center of the head and the glenoid it is type c and if it is beyond the glenoid retracted medially it is type d this classification is very useful and this is kim type a this is a small footprint tear exposing only the footprint and most of the tendon is intact this is kim type a kim type b is this it is retracted beyond the footprint but stays medial to the center of the head and this is kim's type b tears kim's type 3 is this it is retracted beyond the center of the humeral head but it stays lateral to the glenoid so this is kim's type c tear and this is kim's type d tear where the supraspinatus is retracted with lot of fat infiltration and is stuck behind the glenoid so these are kim type d now why kim's classification is important for me is because it reflects the repairability of the tear and it is similar to patty's classification when you have kim's type a and b the retear rate is only 8% in type c it is around 15% and type d it is around 60% although we know that retear is the major complication we can explain to the patient about the functional benefit based on this another paper also shows the importance of the musculotendinous junction in relation to the humeral head if it is lateral to the face of glenoid usually the healing is good but if it is retracted behind the healing is poor now we have talked more about tendon retraction and quality the tendon retraction and quality are very important factors to predict the repairability of tear if you take a cuff tear in the acute tear usually the tendon is of good quality and the elasticity of tendon is preserved and with proper release you can have and achieve a tension free repair but in chronic cuff tears the tendon is poor in quality it is inelastic and usually it does not have enough free tension for it to be repaired and this gives a problem 
this is an acute tear. You can see a lot of edema, hyperintensity uh, in this image with surrounding soft tissue edema. And, but in chronic tears, you will see a very bland appearance with not much of muscle edema. Fatty infiltration is another poor prognostic factor. This negative prognostic factor was first described by Gutlier in CT scans, and then it was incorporated into MRI. We have to see the sagittal cuts, and when you see the scapular Y view, and the supraspinatus fossa is seen, you will grade this uh, Gutlier's classification. Zero is when there is normal muscle, one is when there are few fatty streaks, two is when muscle is greater than fat, three is when both are equal, and four is when fat is more than muscle as seen here. It is now bought into the MRI staging. Zero and one became mild, two became moderate, grade three and grade four became severe fatty infiltration. Now, the single important uh, sign in this is the zenities or the tangent sign, a line draw, uh, drawn touching the superior border of the coracoid and the uh, scapular sp uh, sp spine here. And if your supraspinatus muscle bulk is above the line, then it is a good prognostic factor. But as shown here, if it is below the line, then it is a poor prognostic factor. The same thing in terms of area is the scapular occupation ra uh, ratio or the Tomaso sign. It is important to recognize the difference between loss of muscle bulk and true fatty infiltration because muscle atrophy has the potential to be reversed, but fatty infiltration is difficult to reverse. It is important to also see the same structure in three dimensions because the tendon, uh, the degree of tendon retraction can be overestimated as muscle atrophy if the coronal sections are not seen. For example, here, the sagittal section, you can see that the line joining the coracoid and the superior border of the scapula spine, the supraspinatus is just touching it, which is a poor prognostic factor. But this is an acute tear. You can see a lot of muscle edema around. And in the subject, in the coronal, you can see good supraspinatus muscle bulk here. So this tendon is retracted. Usually these tendons are elastic and can be pulled back. And it is a good prognostic uh, uh, surgery. Isolated infraspinatus fatty infiltration is a negative prognostic factor. And uh, our Stephen Burkhardt has uh, told that fatty infiltration has been traditionally overrated. And even in fatty infiltration with grade three or four, uh, when a repair is done, patients do well. And uh, fatty infiltration three and four should not be a contraindication for arthroscopic protector cuff repair. Acromion type, we know the Biglan is three types, but there are various types of acromion which are not, uh, which are not uh, uh, been classified. But whenever you have a spur and if it is causing problems to the rotator cuff, a subacromial decompression and an acromioplasty will be of use. The acromiohumeral distance is another important prognostic factor. It can, it can be seen in the X-ray or by ultrasound or by MRI. The higher the acromiohumeral distance, the better the outcome of that particular surgery. The long head of biceps is another important structure to look at. The subscapularis and the long head of biceps are like a couple. Whenever there is a subscapularis tear, usually the long head of biceps subluxates. And if you see a subluxated long head of biceps like this, it has to be tackled by arthroscopy. So when to operate? We have seen a lot of prognostic factors. We have seen radiology. And uh, I would like to quote a series of uh, Landmark article by the single author, Kim Yamaguchi. In 2001, he evaluated 58 patients with unilateral shoulder pain who had bilateral full thickness tears. Now, when he continued to see these patients, the asymptomatic uh, 40, uh, of the 45 people, 23 became symptomatic in the asymptomatic side at 2.8 years. And of these 23, nine people had tear progression. So symptoms can develop previously asymptomatic tear, and there was a risk of tear progression over time. He continued the same study, and in 2006, he produced this result of 588 unilateral shoulder pain patients with ultrasound uh, bilateral. Uh, uh, ultrasound was done in both shoulders, and he found that 177 patients of the 588 had bilateral tear, with one side being asymptomatic. And when they became symptomatic, he's, he he scored the uh, symptomatic and asymptomatic side 
and found that there is a 30% increase in size of tear in symptomatic shoulders. He continued the study. In 2010, he came up with a larger series of bilateral shoulder involvement. Uh, 195 patients with unilateral shoulder pain who had bilateral cuff tears. He, he concluded that pain development in asymptomatic tear is associated with increase in tear size as shown in his previous studies. And the larger tears are more likely to develop pain in short term. So is there a role of prophylactic treatment? To answer that question, I would like to quote this uh, landmark article by Eji Atoy. He classified patients with rotator cuff tears as responders and non-responders. Patients with a lower impingement sign, with an increased active external rotation angle, with an intact uh, intrascap, uh, intramuscular supraspinatus test tendon in MRI, and less supraspinatus test muscle uh, atrophy were called as responders. When all these four were present, 92% of the patients did well with conservative management. But when all these four were absent, only 5.2% of patients did well with conservative management. And this article will help us to decide when to operate and when not to operate. So the take home is that Kim's classification reflects the repairability. We have to be able to differentiate acute and chronic tears because both have different repairability factors. Cuff may appear falsely atrophic in sagittal images due to retraction of muscle belly. And you have to look at them in coronal and axial oblique images to estimate the degree of retraction to properly assess atrophy. Asymptomatic tears become symptomatic in follow-up, as shown by Ken Yamaguchi. Early repair in young patients are good prognostic factors. And in spite of possible retears, massive cuff tears must be repaired for functional benefit of patients, as shown by Stephen Burkhardt. Thank you. Thank you, Karthik. Sir, thank you, sir. Excellent. Uh, can we request your uh, uh, wife to honor you with a shawl? Yeah. Or the around? Sir, uh, they are just around, sir. But what I will do is I will assume that you are honoring me, sir. It is a <laughs> bigger uh, thing. So, thank you, sir. And okay. Uh, okay, thank you very much. And I got your uh, memento. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Bupesh. Your yes, talk was uh, uh, very explanatory. I Thank just you, want, I, I would like to request Dr. Ram to add any comments on that. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Ramesh Babu. Am I, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, audible. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Thank you, uh, Bhupesh. It was a fantastic uh, talk uh, with you, excellent quoting of literature. Uh, what is your take on uh, PRP injection for partial rotator cuff tear? Sir, uh, I, have seen, I have seen a big uh, increase in the pandemic period of PRP injection right in and out of the shoulder. I think a couple of patients I have with uh, infection as well. So what is your take on that? What, is, what would be your advice? PRP is the second pandemic now, I think, sir. So <laughs> I'm waiting for results so I can uh, very happily, uh, based on the results, uh, give it to my patients. My experience with PRP is very minimal for uh, 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 partial cuff tears, but uh, I'm waiting for uh, results and inputs from uh, seniors who have tried it. And only then, because uh, in my practice, uh, as we are all followers of Professor SRB, patient safety is going to be paramount. So I'll wait for results and then uh, venture into it, sir. I'm not venturing into it right now, sir. Okay, good. Any, any questions in the uh, chat box, Clement? Uh, nothing in the chat box, sir. Uh, I do have a question. Does your approach change in uh, low demand elderly patients other than what you have already mentioned? Uh, does your approach change in any way? Low demand? Elderly group, like 75, 80. Uh, definitely the decision has to be tailor-made. Um, if pain is uh, not a very important factor, then these can be treated well. But uh, what is important, and uh, this part I have failed to mention, uh, when you are treating them conservatively, conservative treatment is not uh, benign neglect. You have to very aggressively rehab them. The anterior deltoid education program is something which is very important to treat these patients conservatively, which will take, uh, you know, uh, which will kind of slow down the progress of these into a symptomatic test. So it is very important to uh, treat, uh, treat them conservatively with good rehab and not just uh, allow them to 
become symptomatic over time. So patients with low demand, you can treat them symptomatically with good rehab. Okay. I think there is another, another, another point which has to be uh, made clear is this, you know, massive uh, uh, irreparable cough tear is a, is a surgical diagnosis. After you have done enough mobilization, if you're unable to bring them back to the footprint, then only we can call it as irreparable. It is not a radiological diagnosis. If somebody says, you know, irreparable cough tear, it's, it's not possible. They can only document a massive cough tear. And the repairability depends on many factors which have been illustrated by uh, Bhupesh. Yes, uh, Dr. Ramesh Babu? Uh, Dr. Clement, and uh, if... Uh... Uh, Rom, if you accept, can we ask uh, Kanilaj to have uh, his talk before yours because for continuity purpose? Uh, yes, please. No problem. Kanilaj, are you there? Uh, yes, sir. I'm there. I think uh, we will finish your uh, talk on stiff shoulder because okay. uh, we have, we'll finish all the shoulder talks first. Yeah, uh, so uh, Dr. Kaniraj, uh, uh, thank you very much for being a faculty member. Uh, so uh, it is because of uh, working under you for a while that I also got interested that I must, even though I'm uh, primarily trained in arthroplasty, I must uh, know a little bit of arthroscopy as well. So uh, sir has been, uh, 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 has done his uh, MBBS from Madras Medical College, MS from uh, Jaipur, senior residency at Ames, New Delhi. So he has been trained uh, in a fellowship in uh, hip, knee and shoulder surgery in Melbourne, shoulder surgery fellowship in France, traveling fellowship in Netherlands. He has numerous publications in international orthopedic journals and several chapters in textbooks, including a chapter on revision hip uh, replacement in textbook of orthopedics by Indian Orthopedic Association. He was awarded the All India Best Resident Award for the year 2008 from Bombay Orthopedic Society. He also had the first prize for research paper in the role of bisphosphonates in the management of giant cell tumor at Delhi Orthopedic Association in 2011. I hand over the floor to you for your talk on stiff shoulder. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Siddharth. Just... Uh... I'm with the host now to share the presentation. I think you can share the presentation even if you're not the host, sir. Okay. Yes, is my screen visible? It is visible, sir. Yeah, okay. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, Professor Ramesh Babu, sir, Dr. Clement, sir, and uh, Siddharth for uh, inviting me to the Spot Hospital CME. It's indeed a great honor to be uh, talking in the Spot Hospital CME. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, stiff shoulder. Stiff shoulder, as we all know, is a quite a common entity. Painful stiff shoulder makes up one third of the general orthopedic practice and almost all of us see it on a day-to-day -day basis. It's known by several different names because it's so common. Everybody has their own algorithms, their own uh, perceptions about how we diagnose and manage them. And then uh, to talk about us, I think is really a difficult job because we all know everything about it. I'm just going to add on to what we already know. So there were several names that are used to describe stiff shoulder, stiff shoulder, frozen shoulder, adhesive capsulitis, periarthritis, post-traumatic stiffness, and duplex disease. So there was no uniformity in the way we communicate about what we are discussing and uh, how to go about it. So finally, uh, the ISACOS Upper Extremity Committee decided that we should sit down and sort this issue out. They sat down in Amsterdam and then they defined it with a single line. So stiff shoulder, any shoulder that presents with restricted range of motion is called a stiff shoulder. That's the definition. So further, they classified stiff shoulder into two types. One is a primary or idiopathic type and the secondary uh, stiff shoulders. So the primary idiopathic stiff shoulder, this is what we call as frozen shoulder. Here, when you do not have a known etiology, then it is called as a primary idiopathic stiff shoulder or frozen shoulder. There is no trauma. There is no specific shoulder disorder. but it can be associated with a variety of condition. These conditions are present in patients with this condition, but they are not definitely causative factors for this. For example, diabetes, thyroid disorders, smoking, uh, dyslipidemia. All these are more prevalent in patients developing this idiopathic thing, but they are not directly causative. So all these conditions are still included as primary stiff shoulder. The other is a secondary stiff shoulder where we have a definitive history of trauma or we have a diagnosis of a shoulder pathology that leads on to develop the secondary stiffness. 
it could be a cuff tear it could be a tendinitis calcific tendinitis it could be arthritis or it could be uh, post surgery or post trauma any one of these conditions can cause a secondary stiff shoulder further they classified the causes of secondary stiff shoulder into four types one intraarticular causes like synovitis or loose bodies that is causing stiffness other capsular causes like the capsular uh, contracture developing after a soft tissue trauma or any other uh, trauma extra articular causes like a skin contracture muscle tightness and neurological causes so this is a classification for the secondary uh, stiff shoulder the pathology we all know there is a hyperplastic inflammation of protecting the synovium as well as the capsule so it is mediated by a variety of inflammatory mediators like tgf alpha uh, tnf alpha and then the synovium as well as the capsule shows increase in vascularity increase in inflammatory reaction new vessels are formed myofibroblast deposit and then the capsule becomes really thick it starts adhering to itself and to the surrounding structures the most prominent thing is the inferior capsular uh, fold which is normally fatalis and redundant this becomes adherent and it becomes tight and then the capsule becomes tethered onto the humeral head as a result of which the overall volume of the joint is reduced and then the fluid present within the joint is also reduced this is all the pathology that we know about the frozen shoulder what's happening there and then we all know three clinical stages nevesia et al in fact described the four stages by looking at the sh shoulder joints uh, during different phases of arthroscopy the stage 1 which is called as a pre adhesive stage where the patient presents with pain particularly at night clinical examination you do not find any specific point and usually it is diagnosed as some non specific myalgia or some neck pain or anything in these cases arthroscopy shows fibrinous inflammatory synovitis but there is no adhesion formation there is a mild phase or sometimes severe pain in this phase the second phase is acute adhesive synovitis there is synoviitis as well as there is adhesions forming adhesion first to form in the inferior capsular fold the pain is more prominent and then the motion loss is mild this coincides more with the freezing phase that we normally talk about in the clinical stage third is a mesuragen stage where there is less synovitis and more fibrosis as a result the pain is reducing and then the motion becomes more and more obliterated so motion is significantly restricted in this stage fourth is the chronic stage where the adhesions are matured here what happens is all the structures are stuck to one another the joint volume is very significantly reduced so this is the stage 4 so if you look at both these in comparison the normal clinical stages we see the freezing frozen and thaw stage and this is the nevesia stage 1 2 and 3 so pain predominant pain and stiffness and then there is a stiffness predominant so if we see the clinical presentation it is more common in women 40 to 60 years of age dominant non dominant arm is affected more common in people in sedentary jobs rather than in manual workers so whenever the shoulder is less mobile or it is not being mo uh, moved for some reason we develop frozen shoulder that we all know the most important thing several studies have documented this whenever a patient presents with uh, stiffness uh, without any trauma or without any surgery the most important thing for us to do is to rule out a diabetes or a pre diabetic condition because 60 to 70% of this patient when we investigate they have diabetes or pre diabetes so it is very essential to treat that as well diabetes also makes the prognosis worse in that the patients do not respond very well to conservative management they have suboptimal results even with surgical management so diabetes is like uh, in a very uh, very closely related with adhesive capsulitis so whenever we have a patients with restricted movement it is very essential to rule out diabetes in them so coming to the clinical examination as we all know we need to uh, compare both the shoulders always more so in case of a adhesive capsulitis or a frozen shoulder or a stiff shoulder for two reasons one whenever you are doing an examination particularly for the range of motion we should ask the patient to do the same uh, same movement in both the shoulders this will help in two way one most of the time the patients when you ask them to uh, abduct the arm they will be abducting it to a certain extent and then they will start leaning their trunk towards other side to give an impression that the shoulder is actually moving to eliminate that when we ask them to move both the arms at the same time that eliminates the shift in the trunk so the trunk remains in the center and then we are able to look at the movement the second thing is for example in external rotation the there is no normal range for external rotation some people might have 30 degree some people might have 90 degree so when we are doing the both the shoulder movement at the same time we know for sure if there is a significant uh, difference in the movement between the two shoulders and then when we do a clinical examination in a stiff shoulder there need not be any findings it's there you do not find any specific point of tenderness 
sometimes there can be tenderness along the long head of biceps previously it was said that there is always the bicipital tendinitis that is producing the tenderness but what we have realized now is because the synovium of the glenohumeral joint is continuous with the long head of biceps there can be as a manifestation of the synovitis with the, the joint we will have uh, synovitis of the long head of biceps as well the early and the most consistent finding that we can see in a patient with a stiff shoulder is restriction of the external rotation with the arm by the side of the body when the patient is asked to do an external rotation if that external rotation is restricted then it clearly points to a diagnosis of stiff shoulder this is the most consistent and often the early sign in a patient developing a uh, stiff shoulder sometimes when we see patients with young patients particularly with a coracohumeral contracture what happens is their arm remains in just in front of their body they are not even able to do uh, 5 to 10 degrees of external rotation this is called as an internal rotation contracture because normally we will be in an anatomical position we will be able to keep the arm in 10 degrees of external rotation at least if the arm is pointed towards the front of the body or towards the inner side of the body that indicates contracture of the coracohumeral ligament resulting in internal rotation contracture so in a clinical examination it is very very important to rule out other conditions the most important thing being the cervical spine whether we need to rule out if it is a referred pain from the cervical spine or not second thing is the rotator cuff tear because most of the time even without trauma degenerative rotator cuff tear could be there and the patient could develop secondary frozen shoulder because of the cuff tear so clinically we need to evaluate but what happens is most of the time the patients are in severe pain evaluating the cuff integrity or the cuff's power becomes a little bit tricky so there are certain ways that being suggested so for example making the patient bend at the hip at 90 degree and then doing a, a muscle a power testing i generally don't do that my uh, i will discuss about what i do at the end but it is very essential to document whether there is a cup weakness or not and then by comparing with both the sides because in diabetic patient most of the patients will have some amount of cup weakness whether there is a tear or not on both the sides so it is very essential to compare whether there is a cup weakness on both the sides or if it is on one side indicative of a tear or not the other thing is impingement impingement is also very difficult to differentiate when there is significant amount of pain because even 90 degrees of abduction or 70 degree of abduction when it is painful it is very difficult to do a test for impingement and find uh, differentiated so what happens is most of these time when a patient a diabetic patient comes with movement restriction as well as pain it becomes really difficult clinically to make a differentiation between impingement and a rotator cuff tear and even there are a lot of journals in rheumatology that go on to describe this as a rather as a simple term as a diabetic shoulder without trying to differentiate initially so should we treat the frozen shoulder at all because we have been traditionally told that it's a self limiting disorder and the movements return in the thawing stage but what studies have clearly indicated is that in patients with idiopathic frozen shoulder the symptoms may resolve by 2 2 years but we cannot individualize the prognosis for a particular patient there is no prognostic factor by which we can say this patient is going to do better without surgery or he is going to need anything and in most of the patient when we do an objective testing there is significant restriction of movements that are there though they are able to cope up with their function there is significant restriction of movement and there is no necessity for allowing the patient to suffer through pain for 2 years so we should be actively treating uh, frozen shoulders or stiffness rather than just being uh, give a, neglecting them saying it will resolve so if we look at the treatment it depends upon the clinical phase as we all know we can give in the phase 1 and phase 2 where there is a pain predominance nsids are helpful nsids help the patient sleep better give them good pain relief enable them to do their exercises better oral corticosteroid therapy has been uh, advocated and several studies show that it could be as effective as an intraarticular injection because it reduces the overall inflammation gives pain relief and the patients are able to do better exercises forms the key role whatever treatment we are going to do exercises form the key uh, management in the treatment of frozen shoulder the other things are intraarticular injections and manipulation when the patient presents in stiffness stage where the stiffness is predominant and pain is less in those cases we need to release the capsule either by doing a manipulation or by a arthroscopic capsular release so if we look at the shoulder injection there are several different ways in which people give injection and several different sites they give in general for a frozen shoulder giving an injection into the glenohumeral joint should produce sufficient therapeutic response because it is going to reduce the inflammation and then thereby it will give a good relief subacromial injection is also commonly given with the aim that you reduce the inflammation in the subacromial space thereby you allow the free movement the other thing that has been happening for the last few years is the rotator interval injection 
So this was initially described in 2013. What they do is under ultrasound guidance, the coracohumeral ligament is identified from the lateral end of the coracohumeral ligament uh, with a longer needle. An injection is given all along the coracohumeral ligament into the rotator interval. So if we see here, this is the this is the rotator interval, and then this is the coracohumeral ligament. So the main pathology here in the frozen shoulder is the tightness and contracture of the rotator interval with the uh, superior glenohumeral and coracohumeral ligament. So basically, they are giving an injection here in this area along the coracohumeral ligament, and that produces relief. So this is not a single article, but there have been a series of articles, even a randomized control trial, which says that single injection into the rotator interval gives better results in terms of pain as well as ROM uh, improvement as when compared to the intra-articular or a subacromial uh, injection. Personally, I have not been giving a rotator interval injection. I prefer to give only into the glenohumeral joint, but this is one thing that is uh, new in the literature, where giving an injection into the rotator interval has been shown to produce good uh, outcomes in patients with uh, frozen shoulder. The shoulder injection, whenever we talk about shoulder injection, because most of the patients with the stiffness are diabetic, we have some concerns, particularly with regard to their glycemic control. If you look at this, this is a study which looked at uh, it's a, what happens when you give intra-articular steroids, not restricted to shoulder, but shoulder, knee, anywhere. What it said is when patients have good glycemic control, when you give them steroids, there can be a transient increase in the sugar levels for a few days, but it does not affect the long-term glycemic control. The same thing when they looked specifically at diabetic patients receiving injections into the shoulder joint, whenever the injection was delivered into the capsule, into the joint, it did not affect the sugar levels uh, after the injection. So in a relatively good controlled glycemic controlled patient, if you are going to deliver the steroid into the joint, it is not going to affect the glycemic control. So injection can be given without uh, worries about the glycemic level. And then it is always patients always ask, sir, is it only going to be an analgesic effect? It's only going to be a short term effect. What studies have shown that as we know the basic pathology is increase in vascular hyperphasia, there is increase in myofibroblast, that's what is causing the contracture and thickening. When you give the steroid, biopsies have shown, the study which has looked at the uh, biopsy of the capsule after giving the steroid injection, what they said is after giving the steroid injection, the vascular hyperplasia, the fibrous reaction, the fibroblast, everything is reduced. So in fact, this study supports the concept that when you give a steroid injection, at the right time, particularly when there is synovitis in stage two or stage three of the Nivesia classification, when there is synovitis and then the adhesions are forming, it can really act as a disease modifying therapy when you give a steroid into the capsule. So the treatment, when we are not talking about the exercise therapy, it mainly the exercises need to be a gentle progressive stretching. It need not be very aggressive. The, the exercises should not produce pain to the patient. What personally I suggest is whenever a patient, I see a patient clinically, where there is pain and stiffness, whether the cuff is like four plus or something, what I advise them is to do some stretching exercises for the shoulder. And I found it very helpful that giving some form of moist or warm fermentation before the exercises, this increases the blood flow uh, and then it makes the tissues relatively soft. The patients do not feel pain. So giving a warm fermentation before exercises really helps in helping reduce the pain as well as increasing the flexibility. So after the exercises, if there is a discomfort, I suggest patient to take ice fermentation. And usually in addition to the stretching exercise, I always include scapular exercises because if there is a component of uh, impingement or if there is a component of tendinitis, these scapular exercises are going to help these patients. So whenever I treat a patient with a painful stiff shoulder, after a clinical diagnosis of uh, uh, stiff shoulder, what I do is I start them on stretching exercises and uh, some scapular exercises. And then I always advise them not to be very aggressive and not to increase the pain by doing the exercises because it is going to be counterproductive rather than helping the patient. Manipulation under anesthesia is a very common procedure. It has been documented by several studies to produce good outcome. There has been a discussion about what is the right time to do a manipulation under anesthesia. Several studies have looked at it and what they have said is the ideal time to do a manipulation would be around six to nine months from the onset of symptoms. Because if you do too early, when there is the inflammatory phase, sometimes both the capsular release as well as manipulation, if you do it too early, there might be a recurrence of the pain and stiffness because the adhesions are still forming, the, yeah, the shoulder is still acute, and then we go and do a procedure, there can be a recurrence and then there can be more pain. So the ideal time is six to nine months from the uh, onset of 
uh, symptoms. And then audible and palpable release of aggression is a good prognostic sign, but we need to ensure that the audible and palpable release is only of the soft tissue aggressions and not of the bone. And then what is a safe technique to do a manipulation? I'll come to that in a minute. So the most important point while doing a manipulation is to reduce the lever arm. That is, we need to hold the humerus as close to the shoulder joint as possible so that you do not create a long lever arm, thereby we fracture the humerus. So if you look at what is the best way to do a manipulation, each author or each center has their own ways of doing the manipulation. So if you look at the Campbell that says about the acronym FEAR, so to do the flexion first and then extension, then to abduct the shoulder, then adduct the shoulder and finally to do the rotation. If you look at there are other described techniques like doing a flexion first and then doing an external rotation. Basically, when you do a forward flexion or elevation of the arm, what it does is it tries to stretch and tear the inferior axillary, uh, inferior axillary capsular uh, pouch. So that is done first and then they do an external rotation and adduction then you do an abduction. So there are several different ways of doing. The other one is saying like do an external rotation first so that the glenoid is cleared from the undersurface of the acromion and then do. And then there is another method called as a Codman's uh, paradox. So these are several different techniques by which you can do a manipulation. And then though there has always been a fear of a fracture or injury to more soft tissues, if you look at the literature very critically, the percentage of reported bony injury following a manipulation is very, very low. In fact, I have never uh, heard anybody personally saying that they have fractured a, a humerus or fractured a glenoid doing a manipulation. So I often think when done in a gentle way, uh, it is quite uncommon to see a fracture of the humerus. So this is something uh, of intrigue, which is called as a Cartman paradox. Here, for example, uh, if you see the first, first image, the thumbs are pointing forwards. And then when you ask the patient to lift the arm up, still the thumbs are pointing backward. But at the same time, when you ask the arm to bring sideways and then down, if you see the thumb, which are pointing initially uh, in the front, it has gone back. to. The... So here you are doing two axial movements and then there has been an apparent rotation without actually rotating the shoulder. So this is what is described as a Codman paradox. And then this authors have described uh, use doing a manipulation in the same way. First, they stabilize the scapula with one hand, with the other hand, they are holding the humerus close to the shoulder, and then the arm is elevated. Here, the arm is in external rotation. Then they bring the arm into adduction, still maintaining the external rotation. Then you uh, take the arm across cross-body adduction, and then you bring the arm into internal rotation. By doing this, they feel the torsional forces are reduced, and then you are able to achieve a ROM without uh, doing rotatory movement at the humerus. So, arthroscopic capsular release is a more controlled release of adhesion. It gives a predictable return of movement. Still, there has been debate about whether we should do a limited anterior capsular release and then complete it with a manipulation under anesthesia, whether to do the manipulation before the doing a capsular release or to do it after doing the capsular release, whether to do a limited capsular release or a 360 degree circumferential release as uh, uh, described by Lafosse. So if you see whether to do the manipulation before or after a capsular release, if you are going to do a manipulation before the capsular release, the entire joint is going to be very bloody and the visualization is going to be really difficult. But at the same time, if you plan to do the manipulation at the end, if there has been a lot of fluid within the joint, the tissues might feel tight and then the uh, flexibility to do the manipulation is very limited. So if you look at the arthroscopic capsular release, it is not the surgery that is to be taken in the beginning because when somebody starts uh, uh, doing shoulder arthroscopy, they might be seeing a lot of frozen shoulder and they should not jump and start doing capsular release for them because it is not easy. The overall joint volume is reduced. The capsule is tight. It might be difficult in the beginning to do a capsular release. It's a difficult surgery. So the posterior portal, uh, the point to be noted is we need to make it a little bit higher so that you do not go uh, into the space between the glenoid and the humeral coid. You get space, you go a little bit higher. Second, if it is a little bit tight, you can just move the arm a little forward flexion so that it opens up a little bit and then you can go. And then it is very important to release the rotator interval and then the superior glenohumeral and corpohumeral ligament in it. We can alternatively use a, a punch or a radio frequency ablator to release it. And then some people advise uh, excising a bit of uh, capsule of two to four millimeter with a punch so that it doesn't uh, go for adhesions again. So the other thing is post-traumatic stiffness. Post-traumatic stiffness, the important thing is to notice whether we should know only whether it was an initial trauma was only a soft tissue injury that lead to a capsular contracture 
or if it was an undiagnosed fibrosity fracture that has led to the stiffness or if it was a post dislocation in all these cases what is essential is in most of the time the patient would have had an initial injury and then they would have had some sort of conservative uh, treatment and then they come uh, with stiffness most of these patients respond well to exercises and then they respond well the other thing with regard to dislocation is in an elderly patient more than 40 comes with a dislocation it is advisable that we don't immobilize them for too long as the age increases i think the duration of the immobilization to be reduced for example if somebody comes with a 60 year old with a dislocation no other injury then i would start mobilization within 3 or 4 days as soon as the pain subsides when there is a cuff tear when there is a trauma and then the patient comes to us after 4 to 6 weeks of trauma and there is a cuff tear and then there is a stiffness my initial line of management would be initially to start with some stretching exercises and to regain whatever uh, movement is possible and then to take them up for cuff tear uh, cuff repair the alternatively as dr bupesh was mentioning we can take them up directly this is more useful when there is a significant amount of stiffness when there is a global stiffness where all the movements are restricted significantly you can directly take them for a capsular release and cuff repair at the same time and then post surgery it is quite common in the initial phases when somebody is doing a subacromial decompression and then they are putting the scope in and taking multiple times or they are violating multiple tissue planes then subacromial decompression can lead to stiffness and then after cuff repairs also it's quite common to see stiffness normally what happens is cuff repair uh, if there is no improvement or there is no progressive improvement in range of motion 9 months after the procedure then i think it's a time to intervene so that we can restore the movement by doing an intervention so before i conclude this is one important study that was done in uh, uk nhs that is the uk frost it's a multi centric study which looked at three uh, different treatment modalities for frozen shoulder that's an early structured physiotherapy uh, manipulation under anesthesia and arthroscopic capsular release what it said that is none of them are clinically superior to other all of them produce clinically equal effects arthroscopic capsular release has more risk than manipulation under anesthesia and manipulation under anesthesia was the most cost effective treatment of the three in the management of uh, frozen shoulder so personally if you if you ask me what i do when i get a patient with painful stiff shoulder what i do is initially i put them on exercises as i told you and if there is severe pain that is restricting them from doing the exercises the pain is so severe that they are not be able to do the exercises then i will advise them a course of physiotherapy or injection into the joint so the purpose of this is to reduce the pain so that they are able to do the exercises if the pain is reduced but still they have severe restriction in the moment then i would consider them for manipulation under anesthesia or capsular release when i have an mri and then it shows there is a possibility of other structural problem then i would strongly advise for an arthroscopic capsular release or else manipulation and capsular release gives good results for patients with stiffness thank you thank you kaniraj please request you, your sir. family to honor you uh, sir i am the <laughs> officer okay so ram yes any comments uh, yes uh, good good topic uh, dr kaniraj thank you sir uh, any questions from the chat or from the rest of the faculty dr prajwal has a question yes prajwal go ahead it was a very good talk uh, talk uh, enlightening about the stiff shoulder i would just like, like to add some points not all painful stiff shoulders are frozen shoulders you should uh, think about septic arthritis of the shoulder i have a paper presented so how uh, the incidence of septic arthritis is increasing nowadays because of uh, more number of steroid injections more number of uh, surgeries around the shoulder and what happens is the patient presents to you like painful stiff shoulder but finally if you don't investigate you end up uh, treating wrongly i uh, usually don't administer any injection even though it is uh, acute calcific tendinitis i don't inject i directly uh, counsel for barbitage or uh, Uh, i directly counsel for some other procedures so But let us let us stay to a uh, topic which is frozen uh, stiff shoulder prajwal yeah, but yeah. thank you for highlighting the point because i have just raised the question last time uh, there is a recent trend increase in uh, injection in the shoulder as well as as i have seen two uh, patients at the moment waiting with subacute infection following shoulder arthroscopic procedure 
So I think when after the arthroscopic procedure, if the patient is having stiffness, I think one reason to suspect is sepsis. And we are not talking about primary septic arthritis, but low-grade secondary infection following some sort of injection or arthroscopic intervention. And that is a point to be illustrated. Okay. Always we have to uh, do a uh, routine blood check for all, uh, all uh, periarthritis to rule out infections, CRP, ESR. That would be uh, good for uh, the beginners. But, but uh, I think we should stay away from the diagnosis of periarthritis. It's not even yeah. mentioning. Because the literature, that's, scientific literature, no more uses the term. The mis misnomer was there for many centuries ago where, you know, where there was no uh, specialized knowledge about the shoulder existed. I think the common uh, nomenclature after Isakos, Isakos meeting is called as a primary frozen shoulder or secondary frozen uh, shoulder uh, to depict only those which are uh, in as per your uh, definition classification. Yes, Billy. Uh, 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 a question to you. So uh, yeah. when I was first training in UK, I used to notice my consultants inject steroid injections at the end of the arthroscopic capsular release. Uh, so the question is both to Ram as well as uh, Kanraj is that, uh, is it a good practice? Because you don't want one steroid can cause secondary infections, uh, wound healing issues. And also do you, is it a good practice to inject steroid to prevent uh, post release inflammation? Yes, can you uh, I do inject the shoulders at the end of uh, capsular release. Particularly so when I have noted uh, synovitis significantly inside it. So that happens most of the time in my practice. After a capsular release, I do uh, inject steroid as well as uh, ropivacin into the joints. I inject only into the joint. I, at the end of the closure of the portals, I do that. I haven't, fortunately, haven't seen any infection um, post to scopy that is attributable to uh, uh, the steroid injection. So I do continue to use steroid injection post capsular release. Okay. Uh, my personal um, uh, practice is not to use steroid either before or after. So if you do a successful capsular release and you have sufficient painkillers as a continuing block, etc., you should be able to mobilize them. Uh, there is no added advantage in my personal experience. Okay. Uh, if there is no other question, can I uh, share my presentation, Professor uh, I just have one question. Sir, uh, Kaniraj, sir, what is your method of manipulation, sir? Yes. So that's a, uh, the point I forgot to mention. See, for me, I believe that the rotation should be done last. So what I do is I do the forward flexion uh, or elevation in the front as the first thing because that will uh, stretch and tear the inferior axillary pole that has become tight. Then I do the abduction. So only when I get both these movements, that is the forward flexion as well as abduction, then I do rotation. Because if the capsule is tightly adherent, and then if I do rotation before, I do believe there could be a chance of fracture because of increased uh, rotational torque on the humerus. Uh, but there have been several different authors saying that first they do the external rotation and otherwise. But personally, I do forward flexion, abduction, only when I have a good release and improvement in range of motion, then I do external rotation and internal rotation. I do the rotation in two ways. One, I do them with uh, 90 degrees of abduction. I do external and internal rotation. After that, I adduct and then I do internal rotation again so that they are able to reach their back. That's how I do it. Uh, thank you, sir. Just one final comment. Uh, so uh, my father has uh, had the bitter experience of uh, causing a fracture with uh, MUA. And so he has uh, rightly guided me whenever I uh, do the MUA throughout to prevent uh, any fractures. So uh, can I, I think the point is, point is you could always uh, manipulate the flexion and abduction, but be careful about the rotation. Rotation is not easy to restore by MUA alone. That's the key. Uh, Ram Chinamaram, sir. Bupesh here. Mas Bupesh. Uh, sir, also I'd like to add, uh, post arthroscopic release, uh, there is no big problem in doing MUA. Because you have already released uh, the very oh, tight that's, structures. Yeah, that's, when you are doing primary MUA, you have to be very, very careful. Yes. Rotation first, rotation last and all that is not very important post arthroscopic release. Because uh, even after arthroscopic release, you check for movements and do minimal uh, mobilization. Yeah. It is not a big problem post arthroscopy, but primary you have to be worried. Very careful. Yeah. yeah. Uh, two or different ball games. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.
Yeah, um, we're going towards the fag end of uh, the CME program. So just quickly, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Ram Chidamram, sir, consultant shoulder and upper limb specialist at RCOS Clinic, uh, Alvar Pet, director department of shoulder, elbow, hand uh, and sports injuries, uh, MGM Healthcare Chennai. He's done yeah, his yeah. Uh, education at uh, Trivandrum Medical College, Kerala, FRCS uh, in surgery and FRCS trauma and ortho from UK. Fellowship trained in shoulder, elbow, wrist and hand from the UK, US and Hong Kong. Formerly consultant uh, shoulder and upper limb surgeon at the UK at NHS. Uh, exclusive shoulder and uh, upper limb specialist practice for the past uh, uh, 20 years. He's been the president sh uh, shoulder and elbow society of India. Uh, 2017 to 20, 2021, uh, and, an, and he is an elected member of British uh, Shoulder and Elbow Society and the AOS. Thank you, sir. I invite you to deliver your talk on stiff elbow. Thank you. Okay, can I share my presentation? Okay. Can you? Okay. Just see. Yes, sir. It is visible. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, first, first of all, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Ramesh Babu, Siddharth, and uh, Clement for the kind invitation uh, to this uh, meeting. So I'm going to talk about uh, stiff elbow, uh, which is a complex uh, presentation topic. Uh, so it's my affiliation. Uh, I run my specialty clinic at Oliver Paid and then affiliated to MGM Healthcare, looking after the shoulder, elbow, hand, and sports injuries department. So what are the common causes of uh, stiff elbow? Number one is post-traumatic. Number two, inflammatory arthritis. Then comes the osteoarthritis and other causes. The post-traumatic is the common cause. The thorough assessment is very important. <clears throat> the detailed history, history of previous surgery. Is there any pain? Is it flexion extension plane or pronosupination plane, which is causing the problem? Hand dominance and also demand on the elbow. For example, for a normal day-to-day -day activities, it is enough if you have 100 degrees of flexion extension and 100 degree arc of forearm rotation. But that is not sufficient for an overhead sports player because he needs full extension. So it's all uh, different for a uh, different uh, patient scenario. Examination, you should look at warmth and tenderness, scar and soft tissue condition. It is not only looking at the uh, joint bone, but the soft tissue is very important in uh, elbow. Uh, either it is stiffness of elbow joint or forearm joint. When you examine, is there a soft tissue block that means it is more of capsular contraction. You could get over with uh, physiotherapy or arthroscopic surgery compared to bony block. That makes a difference. Neurovascular involvement, especially look for ulnar nerve involvement prior to interference. And X-ray CT scan is a must. So how severe is that? This is the classification for elbow stiffness uh, based on the arc of flexion the patient has. Mild, moderate, severe, very severe. But it is only a quantitative. It doesn't tell you the quality of the stiffness. So Mori classification 1990, intrinsic and extrinsic, based on whether the pathology is in the joint or outside. It. But you see often the problem, there is an interarticular fracture or fracture dislocation. It is involving both intrinsic as well as extrinsic factors. So it is to understand the pathology, but not to guide the treatment. Sean Wood is called 2003, uh, classified into simple stiffness, complex stiffness gives a rough guideline about what sort of patient you are dealing with. A patient with mild to moderate degree of contracture, no prior surgery, no metal work in, no HO, and the bone and joint anatomy uh, grossly preserved is simple stiffness. Whereas a complex stiffness is the opposite, that the patient had prior surgery with a lot of metal work, et cetera. But again, we are going to talk about one Isakos classification proposed by Greg Payne. Uh, is a stiff classification. It is called stiff, stiffness types and influencing factors. Basically, on the basis of prevalent type of stiffness, it could be either soft tissue contracture or arthritis or heterotopic ossification, malunion, nonunion of the joint or chronic subluxation. Based on the uh, treatment and prognosis influencing factors, the patient might have a lot of symptoms, hardware, ligament calcification, that means the collateral contracture, a skin contracture, a joint pain and a loose body. So this is can affect the treatment as well as the prognosis of the condition. Based on this, he, uh, they proposed the uh, algorithm for uh, treatment rather to as a guide. And these are your treatment options based on that uh, physiotherapy or serial splinting uh, medications. You can use it in the acute setting. 
Then you come to three procedures. Number one, orthoscopic release. Number two, open release. Number three, salvage procedures. So how we treat based on this classification and what to do, what not to do, we will go through a case series, case examples. It is better to learn through that. I will not show any literature slide in this, in this talk at all. So case one, a 25 year old IT professional, a road traffic accident seven years ago. He was diagnosed as lateral condyle fracture. He had surgery, details not known to us. He presenting with a stiff elbow, and predominant problem is lack of extension. That is the degree of flexion. That's the degree of extension. It's a significant block. Degree 60 to 110 degrees. The forearm rotation, pronation, supination, pronation is around 40 degrees each. No neurovascular deficit. So that is his uh, x-rays and CT scan, which show there is some lateral condyle malunion, some articular uh, extra osteophyte formation, early, very early arthritis, but mostly soft tissue impingement as well as combination by bony impingement. If you look at that, soft tissue contraction mainly, hardware, prayer, surgery is there, and articular pain is there. Based on this, uh, we go with the release uh, column procedure. It could be done either orthoscopic or open, and I prefer to do orthoscopic. So again, elbow orthoscopy is complex because of the proximity of the nerves to the elbow joint. Uh, here we show the marking. Uh, the olecranon ulnar nerve is all marked. Basic portals and accessory portals have been marked prior. It's very important to mark these portals prior to surgery because once you get some uh, saline in, it's very be difficult to mark the elbow. Uh, I use the 4mm scope. Occasionally, I use the 2.7 scope in uh, access inaccessible area like postulatory compartment. But we have to use systematically all four compartment, which is anteromedial, anterolateral compartment, posterior compartment, and also post lateral compartment, which is very important to go uh, as well. So all these four compartments should be systematically analyzed. This shows the uh, brief video clip of the orthoscopy. You see the joint insufflation prior to keep the capsule distended away from the joint as well as the nerves are protected. Proximal superomedial portal is made. I could see the water gushing out of the uh, portal. Then you introduce the uh, trochoran cannula. With this, you start uh, looking at the antero uh, lateral compartment, Needle outside in technique I use, stab incision, and the portals are made. Once you are enter, enter, you just get the shaver to work your way in first, then go to the uh, thermal probe to clear the capsule and do a capsulectomy and bony burr at the end. So this is the access you have, but when you go, this is the coronoid articulating with the uh, trochlea I have cleared the coronoid tip osteophyte as well as the uh, top layer osteophyte and capsulectomy. But when we want to do work on the radial head, we need to be but retracted uh, the capsule. So what we do is to put in a needle, a proximal accessory uh, anterolateral portal guided by outside in technique and introduce a, a trocar and you would be lifting the anterior capsule like this. It's very important to avoid the injury to the uh, branches of radial nerve. And this is the Howarth retractor, which is used to retract the anterior capsule while I am working on the anterior compartment doing the decompression and resection of osteophyte as well as capsulectomy. Once we finish that, I go to the posterior compartment. Through that, I finally check the posterolateral compartment. So the posterior compartment, olecranon uh, fossa is cleared of all the soft tissue until you reach the olecranon fossa as well as the olecranon tip osteophyte. So once you see that, you clear the olecranon fossa, remove the olecranon floor osteophyte. See, this is the range of movement he had at the beginning of that posterior tightness. As you release the olecranon tip, soft tissue first, bone next, clear the olecranon fossa, recreate it. In the past, we used to do a fenestration procedure. We don't no longer do that. So once you do that, you uh, clear the bony impingement. And finally, do a checking of the range of movement. As you see here, you see the clearance of the entire olecranon fossa, and also the movement is restored to full extension without any impingement or block. And once I'm satisfied with that, I go with the uh, immediate mobilization as comfort allows, starting the next day post-operative. Uh, cryo compression therapy for 24 hours, keep the elbow elevated, first active and then assisted passive movement. This is him, the patient doing 
extension flexion of the uh, elbow on day one postoperative. And that is him at uh, two months fo follow up, re retaining full extension. Here, as you see, the full flexion is not restored because of the condylar mole unit. And he has restored full supination pronation movement. So moving on to the next case, a 15-year-old uh, right-handed gentleman national under-16 under squash player uh, had a history of fall, continued to play, progressive pain, limited movement. You see that extension is blocked and frequent blocking of the right elbow, he couldn't play. So he came with that scenario. This is his X-ray and MRI scan showing loose bodies, uh, uh, posterior uh, inflammation, uh, swelling, uh, effusion, etc. Uh, he, this is uh, classified as a valgus extension overload of elbow. This has been classically described in baseball pitchers, javelin throwers, uh, tennis players, and uh, squash players. If you look at that, the repetitive microtrauma uh, put excessive shear force on the posteromedial compartment, which lead to uh, radiocapitular uh, compression, and finally to posterior extension uh, overload causing osteophyte. And these osteophytes can break off, uh, creating multiple loose bodies, and in the end, it can lead to attenuation of medial collateral ligament. This is a spectrum of injury starting from the medial, going around, ending in the posterior compartment. So here, uh, as per the classification, it is predominantly soft tissue with mild orthopedic pattern with multiple loose bodies and articular pain. So resorted to the best treatment is by orthoscopic, where we do a posteromedial joint decompression with excision of the offending osteophyte and the synovium, removal of loose or loose bodies, and osteochondral lesion building if there is any. So that is him after removal of all the multiple loose bodies, uh, restored the full extension of the elbow uh, perioperative. And one has to be careful in retrieving the loose bodies. This is the commonest indication in elbow arthroscopy worldwide. So that is him after two months follow-up, as you see, he's got complete extension possible and full flexion, full extension. And he's back to uh, playing sports and it, it is uh, playing for under 19 national championship nowadays. So moving on to the next case, uh, a 58 year old man, right-handed, uh, had a past injury to elbow, had stiff elbow. Now recent increase in pain and click. As you see the X-ray, he has got a previous injury and arthritic changes. And that is the range of movement he has. As you see here now, he has got multiple loose bodies, arthritic, but not severe. The articular congruity is maintained. So what we performed for him is osteocapsular arthroplasty. The same uh, technique where we did arthroscopy, uh, removal of a synovium and uh, capsulectomy and trimming of the all the uh, uh, matching osteophyte, regain the movement. If necessary, you need to release the collateral ligament. This is him after arthroscopic OCA. So this is the possibility. These are all the possible ways where arthroscopy can help uh, a stiff elbow. Let us see the few more cases. A 65-year-old lady, again, uh, right-handed, had a fall, treated elsewhere with plaster, and she came to me, completely stiff elbow, can't move. You could see a, a supracondylar fracture, but you already see an existing arthritis, and there is only jog of movement. So she, she comes under this classification, severe arthritis, stiffness. And the best way for her age is a primary total elbow arthroplasty, and she can uh, do full range of movement study from day two postoperative. Look at this patient, a young man, uh, post burns contracture, uh, coming with a stiff elbow, only jog of movement in the elbow. And there is significant contracture of the elbow, uh, the soft tissue in the front and the back and the side. So that is this X-ray showing extensive hypertopic uh, ossification. HO is a different ball game. Uh, so this is uh, HO, there is a separate uh, uh, classification for that. And also, additionally, this gentleman has got, got skin contracture. That makes you uh, difficult to achieve a uh, full range of movement. So the treatment is always open. So the principles are posterior approach, complete resection of the bridging and heterotopic bone, release both collateral ligaments and end mass repair. Otherwise, it would be difficult to uh, achieve movement from a very stiff uh, or uh, severe stiffness to retaining movement. You have to release the collateral ligament. Post-op endomethacin for six weeks when they do HO operations and early full mobilization with appropriate pain control. That is, is the uh, X-ray uh, clinical picture per operative to show the posterior Campbell approach. And that is came up one month later, is able to have a relatively pain-free range of movement. As you see, we cannot achieve full extension because of the anterior skin soft tissue contracture, but he is able to get on with his activities like uh, was washing or eating, 
comfortably with the range of movement he has, he's happy with that. So you have to remember, if there is a soft tissue contracture, you might not be able to restore the full extent of movement back to the elbow. Unless you do a plastic surgery, flap cover, etc. But that can, again, uh, minimize the outcome. So uh, again, I uh, lost the patient, 32-year-old lady, a right-handed, history of injury eight months ago. She had some native treatment, bandaging, et cetera, presenting with a stiff elbow. She can't bend more than 45 degrees as a bony block. If you look at the X-ray and CT scan, she has this, okay? A neglected, malunited, fractured, capital. So when there is a mechanical block, uh, to the joint, that means there is uh, articular incongruity. You carefully analyze the uh, scan uh, for the extent of injury. Sometimes it could be capitulum, sometimes it could be also involving the trochlea. So here it's a mall union, non union category, and it is an articular incongruity. The only treatment is to get it right first. So this is uh, her after osteotomy, correction of the capitulum and fixation with headless screws. Uh, that is showing the range of movement the patient has. Uh, immediate on table, and that is her follow-up uh, uh, clinical picture, as well as the uh, CT scan to confirm the healing of the uh, capitulum fragment. I lost the case, a 29-year-old uh, gentleman, post-injury, one year, uh, native treatment. He had uh, extensive uh, atrotopic ossification, uh, as you see, bridging the elbow all around. Uh, I did nothing for him because I think the nature has ankylosed uh, his elbow in a functional position, which we should not uh, disturb. Uh, so to summarize uh, the guidelines, a stiff elbow with the congruent joint, we could possibly consider arthroscopic uh, release. A stiff elbow with the congruent joint, but with soft tissue problem, nerve injury, or a mature hatotopic ossification, it is safe to consider open joint release. Stiff elbow with the incongruent joint, we are heading towards the salvage procedure. And stiff elbow with heterotopic bone, uh, open surgery when the heterotopic ossification is mature, uh, which you have to confirm with the two progressive X-rays. So to summarize, stiff elbow can be post-traumatic commonly or due to arthritic. In selected patients only, you have to base this selection based on your clinical examination, X-ray, and the patient's demand on the elbow Arthroscopic surgery could be considered and that give excellent results in experience to hands. Uh, and you should take uh, precautions to avoid nerve injury. Open surgery has a role, especially in the presence of poor soft tissue conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Ram. Excellent, excellent talk. Thank you, sir. And uh, you have given a very good uh, uh, way of approaching a stiff elbow. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Pleasure. Any questions from the faculty? I think uh, no. Yeah, Bill, Billy, please. Yes, Billy. Uh, Ram, that was an excellent case series that you presented there. Uh, my question to you is, with the Burns patient, uh, did yes. you have any concerns at all about wound healing? Um, uh, uh, because there's so much of contracture, long-standing yes. contracture. Yeah, that's what I told. In a burns or contracture, skin contraction with elbow stiffness, uh, the, the, you will not be able to achieve a full extension as well as full flexion. So you have to go based on where you have the least supple skin. That means if the posterior compartment is free, I could go arthroscopic posteriorly. I would prefer to do arthroscopic in case of post-contracture uh, uh, patients because arthroscopic it gives the least disruption to the uh, healing of the elbow. Uh, second, if you want to go open, you should only go open where there is supple skin, like on either side, or column approach or a posterior approach. And it is better to avoid uh, going anywhere near the anterior contracted skin. If you want to go, then it should be with the plastic surgery flap cover. But the problem with the flap cover is that they put the flap, they would immobilize your elbow. So again, the patient will develop atrotopic calcification with the extra flap. So it is not uh, advisable. Thank you. Is there any range of okay. limitations where you choose arthroscopy or open? Yes, Clement. Is there any limit on uh, your fixed section deformity where you would choose arthroscopy or open? Uh, it is uh, uh, actually uh, the only concern is that uh, it, it might be, uh, uh, it, that is actually in my practice, no. 
because he can do even for uh, severe stiffness. But there are two things to consider. Number one is the collateral ligaments. And number two is the ulnar nerve. When we are dealing with the severe stiffness, where there is a very a small range of movement, and you are going to achieve a lot of movement, these two will be in problem. So an arthroscopic uh, uh, surgery could be possible, provided you have to do a small incision to move the, release the ulnar nerve, and then follow it by arthroscopy. And also you could do a collateral release from inside, arthroscopically, so that is not an issue. But if you are dealing with the very severe stiffness associated with some soft tissue contracture as well, if you, you, the surgeon would be better off doing it open because you could address uh, these two uh, problem in a safer way with the approach uh, open. But the ulnar nerve has to be addressed. That is the key principle. In open approach, do you do a chevron osteotomy or do you do a sliver of polyclonal? It depends on the case scenario. Um, but um, my preference would be to do a, a soft tissue approach without damaging the olecranon. <laughs> as you know, I, I'm an arthroplasty surgeon as well. So I'll keep the olecranon for a future total elbow arthroplasty. <laughs> so respect the triceps. Paratricepital approach is my favorite. Here we, our trauma colleagues, uh, they have developed a procedure. Probably must be aware of it where uh, we take uh, incision down to the upper third of forearm. And we raise a broad triceps, olecranon, and uh, a periosteal sleeve. So the ole olecranon is just a sliver of bone taken off yes. this one, yes. which can be fixed. Uh, it allows very early moment, and we also avoid uh, doing a chevron osteotomy. And of course, as you said, uh, this is a 360 degree release, all collateral surgery has to be uh, released. Thanks for an excellent uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Rom, uh, can you request? Uh, yes, sir. Oh, you are Selfie. having the memento with you? Yeah. Selfish and also. All, Selfish you can, all me. <laughs> you can uh, go and relax in yes, the virtual, virtual background which you are having. Absolutely, sir. Virtual. <laughs> Everything virtual, so background is also virtual. <laughs> but uh, you have the... Thank you for this uh, lovely memento as well as the shop. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. We are moving on to the uh, last talk. Over to Dr. Siddharth to introduce Dr. Yugal. So since this is the last talk, I'm just uh, one more time just reminding everybody that uh, to please send a WhatsApp message to this above number for your MCI credit hours. So, uh, so my, uh, it's my privilege to introduce the next uh, speaker, Dr. Yugal Varandani, who finished his MBBS from Trichy Government Medical College in 2011. It is DNB from Kovai Medical uh, Center, uh, Coimbatore. He's done his arthroblasty fellowship in Pune and uh, Chennai. He's also done an arth arthroscopy fellowship under Dr. Clemenser at uh, Sims, Chennai. So now he's currently working as an associate consultant in the Department of Arthroscopy and Sport Medicine at Sims Hospital, Chennai. Over to you, sir, for your topic on foot and ankle arthroscopy, illustrative cases. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Siddha, for a kind introduction. First of all, I want to congratulate uh, Professor S. Ramesh Babu, sir, Dr. Siddharth Babu, and the whole family of Spot Hospital for the 17th anniversary. I want to thank the organizing committee, Dr. Pro uh, Professor Ramesh Babu, sir, Siddharth Babu, sir, and Clement Joseph, sir, to give me the opportunity to speak on this forum. So today I'm going to speak on foot and ankle arthroscopy. Basically, this uh, my talk will be focused on the basics of the foot and ankle arthroscopy along with the some case illustrations. So I am going to speak on the indications for foot and ankle arthroscopy, the setup, positioning and tra traction devices used for uh, foot and ankle arthroscopy, few surgical tips, and 21 point arthroscopic examination, followed by the case illustrations. So basically, foot and ankle arthroscopy is comprised of ankle scopy, hind foot, subtalar scopy, and tendon and small joint scopy. In ankle scopy, 
we, uh, it is indicated in osteochondral lesions, synovial biopsy to remove the loose bodies, PVNS, and bony as well as soft tissue impingement. It is also indicated in chronic lateral ankle instability. In hind foot scopy, it is indicated in FHL decompression for steda process excision, Haglund's deformity, and TA rupture. Subtalar, it is used for the fusion of the subtalar joint for synovectomy or the intraarticular pathologies. Foot and ankle arthroscopy can be done with the help of a normal 4mm scope. We can use 2.4mm scope also and 70 degree scope if possible. Apart from the normal inst general instruments of the no, scopy, we can use the small instruments for the better results. Anterior ankle arthroscopy is basically done in the supine position with a bolster under the knee and the foot along with the ankle, it should be out of the table. It can also be done with the help of a lithotomy leg holder. Posterior ankle arthroscopy is done in prone position with a affected leg. It should be out of the table almost up to the level of the mid calf and it should be at the level above the normal leg so that we can assess it easily. There are many traction and distraction devices available for the ankle, foot and ankle scopy, but we can use the bandage roll along with the cotton and we can make it one in the OT OR room itself. Coming to the portals, so anterior ankle arthroscopy, basically we come across three portals, antromedial, which is medial to the tibialis anterior tendon, and we should be careful about the saphenous now, anterolateral, it is lateral to the peroneus tertius, and we should be careful not to injure the superficial peroneal nerve. Entrocentral, medial to EDC and lateral to EHL, and the dorsalis pedis artery is at the risk here. Coming to the posterior portals, again, posteromedial, which is medial to Achilles tendon, and posterior tibial artery is at risk. Posterolateral, which is medial to peroneal tendons and lateral to Achilles sural nerve is at risk. Trans Achilles, it is through the Achilles tendon, so we should be careful not to injure the Achilles or the FHL tender. So this is certain uh, tips. We should palpate the superficial peroneal nerve. It is the only nerve which we can sometimes even see. The anterolateral portal is marked. Now we are marking the lateral malleolus. Mark the medial malleolus. The intermalleolar line is drawn. Here we are marking the peroneus tertius tendon. Medially, the tibialis anterior tendon. These markings are very helpful in uh, entering the joint and do the surgery without any injury. Normal saline is instilled into the joint and we check for the backflow. Now the skin incision is made with the help of 11 blade. We should not go deep and then expand the incision with the help of hemostat artery forceps. Enter the joint with the help of a trocar sheath. Under the guidance, we can make the posterolateral instrument portal. And then again, expand the skin incision. Enter the arthroscopic shaver for the debridement and then palpation with the help of the probes for the intraarticular fractures. This is a schematic 21-point uh, arthroscopic examination, which gives us the complete evaluation of the anterior as well as the posterior ankle. So depending on the pathology, we should go through this. Anterior arthroscopy is indicated in case of ankle arthritis, loose bodies, ligament tears, LROCDs, and synovitis. And we can do the ankle arthrodesis also with the help of anterior arthroscopy. Posterior arthroscopy is indicated in trigonal process resection, and posterior ligament injuries. Broadly, the patient with ankle pain, they be divided into the anterior ankle pain or the posterior ankle pain. So anterior ankle pain, the most common thing is the anterior ankle impingement, which is of two types, bony and soft tissue. Bony will be mostly located in the anteromedial segment and the soft tissue in the anterolateral segment. So my first case is a frozen ankle who is, uh, who is a 30 years old gentleman who underwent brostrom repair, peroneal grooplasty, and retinacular reconstruction for peroneal tendon subluxation three years back. Now the patient presented with chronic low-grade pain, stiffness, which was affecting his daily activities, but the subluxations was relieved. This was the previous procedures which he underwent. So the present MRI showed there was an anterolateral scar tissue 
and we planned for the arthroscopic arthrolysis so here we are viewing from the antromedial portal and we can see there is a dense fibrous and scar tissue located over the anterolateral gutter so we are excising it with the help of the punches and the shaver there we can see the meniscoid lesion which is a mass of hyaluronized tissue and <clears throat> lateral gutter is cleared with the help of a shaver and the hook probes this is the anterior tab talotibial ligament which was intact distal tibial margin was cleared at the anteromedial border now the portals are switched and now we are viewing from the anterolateral portal so the medial gutter the anteromedial scar tissue it was debrided with the help of shaver and the rf probe the medial gutter clearance was done here we can see the medial malleolus and sometimes the tissue gets impinged between the tibiotalar joint also so that also we need to check and we have to clear it so this is the 5 days post op he is able to do plantar and dorsiflexion as comparable to the normal site 2 weeks post op he is able to weight bear 50% with the help of the crutches this is my second case who presented with a ankle pain anti ankle pain and on investigation it was found to be anteromedial impingement which is due to the bony spur so the anterolateral structures the anterolateral gutter was cleared of the soft tissues now the portal was switched over and here we can see there is a bony spur at the anteromedial margin which was removed with the help of shaver the curettes the margins were cleared with the help of the burr and here we can see there is a smooth margins over there third case for anti ankle impingement which is very common is the osteochondral lesions of the talus so which is common due to trauma or ankle sprains and the patient usually uh, presents with a deep pain in the ankle so depending upon the size if the lesion is less than 1 square cm we can go ahead with the microfracture if the lesions are larger we have options of aci bmac or oats 75% of the ocds are present anteriorly so we can go for the anti ankle arthroscopy 25% posterior so we should go with the hind foot arthroscopy we should always rule out instability any heel varus or valgus before going for the ocd repair ct is helpful to locate and to see whether the, is there any cyst formation over there if we do the ct in plantar flexion it gives a lot of information about the accessibility to the ocd so here is a 32 year old pediatrician who normally is a athlete so he jogs in treadmill and he starts having pain over the ankle and mri showed there was a anteromedial ocd of the talus so we planned for the arthroscopic ocd repair so the soft tissues all around the ocd the osteochondral defect it was debrided with the help of arthroscopic shaver the chondral flap of the ocd it was cleared with the help of a shaver and the loose ends at the ocd it was cleared with the help of curet since and the margins were stabilized with the help of a rf since the uh, defect was larger in size so we planned for two stage procedure first we thought of doing microfracture which was done with the help of a chondral pick and at the same time we took a cartilage biopsy from the knee for the osteo autologous chondrocyte implantation for the ocd talus after 6 weeks so sorry 
So this, after six weeks, we did the cartilage repair using the autologous chondrocyte implantation. Single stage BMAC cartilage repair for OCD tellers can be done in case of small defects. Coming to the posterior ankle pain, which is mainly due to posterior impingement or Achilles tendinopathy. Posterior impingement could be due to os trigonum, FHL tenosynovitis, or maybe due to some scar tissue. Achilles tendinopathy presents in three ways. It could be non-insertional, insertional calcific tendinopathy, or retrocalcaneal and calcaneal bursitis. So this is the positioning for the posterior ankle arthroscopy. We should, so the posterolateral portal will be the viewing portal for us. And while making it, we should make sure that it is directing towards the great toe or the first web space while entering it. So she's a 30 years old lady who had a history of trauma and she presented with pain over the posterior ankle and locking episodes. She had an injury of uh, twisting injury where she got a fracture of the posterior part of the talus, which was treated conservatively. But after six months, she presented with pain. So we MRI showed there were multiple loose bodies and there was a non-union of the fracture part. So we went for the scopy. Here we can see there is a loose body. It's near the FHL tendon. The FHL tendon is surrounded by the scar tissues. So the FHL decompression was done using the shaver. And all the loose bodies were removed using the shaver, the burr. Portals were changed. And here we can see the posterior intermalleolar ligament. This is the non-united fracture part. So the soft tissues were dissected. Scar tissue was removed and loose bodies were removed. The gutters were cleared of the soft tissues. And here we can see a smooth movement of the FHL tendon. My second case is a 74 years gentleman who had a history of slip and fall at Terrace. Following, in, uh, following which he had pain over the left ankle and difficulty in walking. On examination, he had tenderness at the posterior aspect of ankle. There was a palpable gap at the tendo achilles, and Thompson's test was positive. There was no plantar flexion on the affected site. MRI showed there was a TA rupture 3.5 centimeter proximal to the calcaneal insertion site with four centimeter gap, and the tendon was degenerated and there was an impaction fracture at the medial tibiotella joint. So we planned for the arthroscopic FHL transfer plus percutaneous TA repair. This patient, the skin condition was not very good for the open repair, so we planned for this thing. So Thompson's test was positive. The tendo achilles was marked. Medial malleolus and lateral malleolus were marked and the intermalleolar line was drawn. Postromedial portal was marked. Under the guidance of arthroscopy, the postromedial portal we entered. Diagnostic scopy showed there was impacted fracture, but it was intact. It was not loose. Medial gutter scarring was cleared. Posterior intermalleolar ligament, the soft tissues around it were cleared. The help of shaver. Medial gutter clearance was done. FHL was identified. There were a lot of adhesions around the FHL which were cleared with the help of shaver and the RF ablator. Now using the retriever, FHL tendon was retracted proximally, hold it with a grasper, and distally it is cut with arthroscopic scissor and punch. Now with the help of a grasper, FHL tendon was retrieved outside through the postromedial portal. Using two fiber wire stitch, we have taken the whip stitches through one end of the FHL. Now the posterior superior edge of the calcaneum was identified and the FHL tunnel site was cleared of soft tissues. Central portal was made, tunnel site identified and bead pin was drilled. 
that FHL tendon sizing was done and it was found to be 5.5 ml. So 6 mm tunnel was drilled up to the depth of 20 millimeter. Bead pin was drilled out through the tunnel. And then two ethibond, number two ethibond suture was passed. Ethibond suture and two fiber taker, uh, fiber wire taken out from the postromedial portal and the two fiber wire was loaded into the two ethibond shuttle suture. Now the nitinol guide wire was inserted into the tunnel and the fiber wire along with the TA, the FHL tendon, it was retrieved into the tunnel and it was inserted and fixed with 720 bio screw in the tunnel. The screw position and the impingement was checked under arthroscopy and as well as CR. And percutaneous repair was done using the spinal needles, fiber wires and the SD wire loops. This is the post-op x-ray. This is the three months follow-up. Patient walking comfortably. Comparable movements with the normal side. And he is able to do the lift off with the help of ankle. My case three is a 34 year old doctor who is a jogger and he presented with the painful knee, painful ankle, sorry. And examination, the investigation showed he had a steria process, which was removed arthroscopically with the help of burr, osteotomes, and the shaver. This is the pre op x-ray which is showing steria process and you can see in the post-op x-ray it was excised. Hagland's bump it is also one of the indication in foot and ankle arthroscopy so it is basically a prominent posterior superior tuberosity. Normally we plan endoscopic calcaneoplasty for this the portals are little different, so we should feel the uh, palpate the tip of the fibula. The portal is placed 1.5 to 2 centimeter below the tip of fibula. And during calcaneoplasty, we should always use the intraop CM to make sure the position of the burr as well as a shaver. 55 years old gentleman presented with a posterior ankle pain, Hagland's bump, and it was planned for the endoscopic calcaneoplasty. So using the shaver, all the soft tissues around that Hagland bumps was debrided. Using RF, all the scar tissue, the soft tissues were excised. Using burr, the Hagland bump excision was done. Using osteotome, the rough margins were cleared. And here we can see after the excision of the Hagland bump, the smooth margins. So this is the pre-op x-ray, which shows there's a Hagland bump and it is post-op. Coming to the final case, this is a chronic lateral ankle instability where arthroscopy is a diagnostic tool as well as it can be used for debridement. So after confirming it with some clinical test and the MRI, we found that uh, patient had an ATFL tear there are certain procedures which can be done for this patient, Brostrom, Brostrom Gold procedure or Brostrom Gold plus internal bracing. Since the patient is uh, uh, coming on to the study, the, we have seen the results of the Brostrom procedure plus internal bracing as well as Gold procedure. It is much better as compared to the ATFL independent repair or the Brostrom repair. Internal brace is a bridging concept which is using braided suture tape and not less bone anchors to reinforce the ligament strength, which gives us immediate protection and the patient can go for early mobilization and weight bearing. So he, this uh, 20 years old gentleman who presented with a chronic ankle a lateral ankle instability and he want to, uh, he's an athlete, he basically plays football. So he wants to go back to his uh, activities much sooner. So we planned for the internal brace along with the Brostrom Gold procedure. So the soft tissues, the anterolateral, they were debrided. 
And here we can see there is an ATFL tear that is absent. So we planned for the open brostrum procedure, curvilinear skin incision along the lateral malleolus. The soft tissue dissection was done using scissors. The deep dissection was done. The tight band of tissues over the torn ATFL was split. Here we can see there is a torn ATFL ligament. The lateral malleolus was exposed. Curating was done with the help of a curates of the fibular tip. Clearing the soft tissues over the fibular tip using nebula. Torn ATFL identified using the Arthrex system. K wire pass was passed into talus for medial fixation under CM guidance. This is a 1.9 double loaded suture anchor for into fibula for ATFL repair. The sutures through this anchor, they are used for the ATFL repair. Now this 4.75 mm tunnel, extra articularly it is drilled for the swell lock for the, into the teller fixation on the teller uh, side. 4.75 mm swell lock was inserted. Now 3.5 mm tunnel was drawn into the fibula. Fiber tape is loaded into the 3.5 mm swell lock. Marked up to the laser mark two centimeter, which should go inside the fibular tunnel for the internal bracing. Now swell lock is loaded with fiber tape is inserted into the lateral fibular tunnel for the internal bracing. And the swell lock sutures left out are used to reinforce the ATFL repair. After doing this, in the inferior extensor retinoculum was sutured over the repaired ATFL, that is the gold procedure. So the advantage being is early mobilization, early weight bearing for this internal bracing concept. So to conclude, MRI, many uh, most of the times in case of foot and ankle thing, it is inconclusive or sometimes it might overdiagnose. So clinical evaluation is must for the proper treatment. Arthroscopic surgeries are minimally invasive, so it leads to faster recovery. When we do the foot and ankle arthroscopy, so all aspects of the ankle and hind foot can be easily assessed and it can be properly addressed. Thanks for the attention, sir. Thank you, Dr. Yugal, for the excellent presentation. Thank you, sir. Are there any questions? Are there any questions in the chat box? I think uh, your talk was so explanatory, there were no doubts. Dr. Clement, now okay. I request you to uh, say a few words about the, I mean, Billy, uh -huh. you, can, you got uh -huh. the shawl and the memento? Yes, sir. Okay. You want to, uh, it, you want to have it now or uh, it is in the hospital? No, sir, it's with me, sir. I'll have it, sir. Okay, please have it. Yeah. We are very grateful to all of you. Thank you, sir. Clement, we were closing remarks, please. Yes, sir. So, at the outset, I thank Professor Ramesh Officer, uh, Siddharth, and the family of Spot Hospital for uh, hiring me as a course uh, organizer. And um, it has been a um, uh, very informative CME so far, I would say. Uh, both aspects were well covered, the importance of clinical uh, examination and also the correlation of uh, clinical examination with your arthroscopic findings. And uh, I should congratulate all the speakers, uh, Dr. Prajwal uh, Ganesh uh, for highlighting the importance of clinical examination and Srinivasan Sundarajan sir and Billy Paul Wilson. And uh, I should also thank on behalf of the organizing committee, Dr. David Rajan sir, for his uh, uh, excellent oration on meniscal repair and continuing uh, to the next session Dr. Kane Subramaniam, Bupesh Karthik, Ram Kaniraj, uh, Yugal, all of the talks were informative. I'm sure that this uh, talks will be revisited by people who come to Ortho TV and will be much more helpful for uh, uh, younger surgeons to 
take up uh, this one. Uh, once again, with this, I, on beh behalf of the sport organizing team, I thank all the faculty for their contribution to this. Meet. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank and you, special Prabhupada. words to Dr. Uh, Siddharth, uh, Siddharth, the organizing secretary. I, uh, we all like, love him very much in Sims, even after he left. Uh, Dr. Vijay Bose and the Suri sir, a lot of people will talk still about Siddharth. But the moment you say, it's a very, uh, you know, lovely chap. This is a comment I hear. I, I am sure that uh, you are part of uh, our team and Sims as well. And once again, I'm glad to have you back. And congrats for all your sincere efforts. Um, and you are also, I'm so much uh, impressed with your humility and sincerity. Uh, congratulations for your efforts in making this conference a success, Siddharth. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Clement. I would like to sincerely thank all the faculty members. I think uh, you have put in a lot of efforts in showing all your cases and uh, the entire uh, CME was very, very informative. I also learned a lot and uh, being a general orthopedic surgeon, uh, I could uh, see the various advances in orthoscopic surgery whether it is knee or shoulder or elbow or foot and ankle, I think the scopy has gone all the way and we have to improve our skills. It is a good and a great eye-opener for all the, all the younger orthopedic surgeons. I am sure the CME would have stimulated the younger orthopedic surgeons to take up orthoscopy as one of the specialities of their interest. And uh, I sincerely thank all the faculty members. I also thank all the uh, presidents of the various associations who, who willingly come, came forward to uh, do conduct this program under their auspices. Uh, and uh, on a Sunday, I think uh, I should thank uh, every one of you for being with us. And uh, uh, I also thank uh, the fac I mean the delegates, I think still, 11. On a Sunday at 3 o'clock, 11, people are still watching. And I thank uh, every one of you for this. And uh, thanks to the Ortho TV as well as Orthrex for sponsoring the program. Dr. Reddy's Labs for again sponsoring this uh, event. And I once again thank uh, each and every one of you. Dr. Clement especially who has uh, uh, finalized the scientific program as well as uh, spoken to all the faculty members on our, on our behalf. Thank you, everyone. I thank uh, Dr. Siddharth for uh, helping me in organizing this uh, uh, program. Thank you very much. Thank you, one and all. There will not be any uh, national anthem. I formally conclude the program and we can have uh, uh, any chats, no problem. Okay, informal chat. Thank you, Sinuas. Sinuasan has been with us ever since our hospital inception. And he has been uh, helping us and doing a lot of uh, uh, orthoscopic surgeries uh, in our hospital. Thank you, Sinuas. And Prajwal is a budding uh, orthoscopic surgeon of Tirvan Normal uh, And he is doing wonderful, wonderfully well. And I'm sure uh, Dr. K and Subramanian should be very happy about uh, uh, training him. Bupesh, I think. Uh, you Hello, are sir. On the no, no, sir. <laughs> Just came for lunch, sir. Okay, okay. Very nice. Sir. Very nice. Thank you, Bupesh. Very, very yeah. informative and nice uh, topic, sir. The yeah. idea of correlating clinical radiography and arthroscopy. It was uh, conceptualized like... by Clement. Uh -huh. We have to thank him. Uh, Clement, sir, the star. Topic. Anyway. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Clement, sir. Thank you. Bupesh, well done, Bupesh. Sir, I, I was you. talking to Siddharth. I was, I was asking Siddharth whether uh, SRB, sir, is strict with you. No, no, no. When I became orthopedic, sir, he became lenient. That is the only <laughs> regret we have, sir. <laughs> he has not seen uh, your uh, strict and uh, how punctually morning 6.45 you will come and uh, sir will be collecting the blood test for all the patients, even though he's an assistant professor. Before PG's, uh, sir, will be there. Then I was surprised, sir. You, uh, Siddharth told me, sir, he's lenient with me. <laughs> you you can't sir, be strict with you. our children, you know. I told you. You have to just uh, accept how they are. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Okay, sir. 
I am happy to see you still energetic, sir. I mean, you have so many spheres of activity. You are very busy with Rotary Club. This one, I don't know how many organizations you are busy with, sir. And still, we are a bit overwhelmed with one, one sort of activities. Like, you are doing Scopy, we become tired at the end of the day. You are still amazed by your energy and hard work, sir. Yeah, I don't do any work. <laughs> that is the secret. I don't do any work. I delegate. So, you did all the work, as you know. <laughs> nothing, nothing, sir. Uh, Anyway, thank you very much. It was nice thank having you, you all. It's an occasion to meet everyone. Thank you, sir. Hope next uh, meet will be physical one, sir. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, sir. You, sir. Thank, you, sir. thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. We will end the meeting. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Sir. All of you have a wonderful Sunday.
of a class on on last Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Thank you.